2,200 years ago Aristotle concluded that, more than anything else, men and women seek happiness. While happiness itself is sought for its own sake, every other goal, health, beauty, money, or power, is valued only because we expect that it will make us happy. Much has changed since Aristotle's time. Our understanding of the worlds of stars and of atoms has expanded beyond belief. The gods of the Greeks were like helpless children compared to humankind today and the powers we now wield. And yet on this most important issue very little has changed in the intervening scenes. We do not understand what happiness is any better than Aristotle did, and as for learning how to attain that blessed condition, one could argue that we have made no progress at all. Despite the fact that we are now healthier and grow to be older, despite the fact that even the least affluent among us are surrounded by material luxuries undreamed of even a few decades ago, there were few bathrooms. In the palace of the Sun King, chairs were rare even in the richest medieval houses, and no Roman emperor could turn on a TV set when he was bored, and regardless of all the stupendous scientific knowledge we can earn at will, people often end up feeling that their lives have been wasted, that instead of being filled with happiness their years were spent in anxiety and boredom. 1. Is this because it is the destiny of mankind to remain unfulfilled, each person always wanting more than he or she can have? Or is the pervasive malaise that often source even our most precious moments the result of our seeking happiness in the wrong places? The intent of this book is to use some of the tools of modern psychology to explore this very ancient question: when do people feel most happy? If we can begin to find an answer to it, perhaps we shall eventually be able to order life so that happiness will play a larger part in it. 25 years before I began to write these lines, I made a discovery that took all the intervening time for me to realize I had made. To call it a discovery is perhaps misleading, for people have been aware of it since the dawn of time. Yet the word is appropriate, because even though my finding itself was well known, it had not been described or theoretically explained by the relevant branch of scholarship, which in this case happens to be psychology. So I spent the next quarter century investigating this elusive phenomenon. What I discovered was that happiness is not something that happens. It is not the result of good fortune or random chance. It is not something that money can buy or power command. It does not depend on outside events, but rather on how we interpret them. Happiness, in fact, is a condition that must be prepared or cultivated and defended privately by each person. People who learn to control the experience would be able to determine the quality of their lives, which is as close as any of us can come to being happy. Yet we cannot reach happiness by consciously searching for it. Ask yourself whether you are happy, said J.S. Mill, and you cease to be so. It is by being fully involved with every detail of our lives, whether good or bad, that we find happiness not by trying to look directly. Victor Frankl, the Austrian psychologist, summarized beautifully in the preface to his book Man's Search for Meaning, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you are going to miss it. For success, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a course greater than oneself. So how can we reach this elusive goal that cannot be attained by a direct route? My studies of the past quarter century have convinced me that there is a way. It is a circuitous path that begins with achieving control over the contents of our consciousness. Our perceptions about our lives are the outcome of many forces that shape experience, each having an impact on whether we feel good or bad. Most of these forces are outside our control. There is not much we can do about our looks, our temperament, or our constitution. We, to flow, cannot decide, at least so far, how tall we will grow, how smart we will get. We can choose neither parents nor time of birth, and it is not in your power or mind to decide whether there will be a war or a depression. The instructions contained in our genes, 
the pull of gravity, the pollen in the air, the historical period into which we are born, these and innumerable other conditions determine what we see, how we feel, what we do. It is not surprising that we should believe that our fate is primarily ordained by outside agencies. Yet we have all experienced times when, instead of being buffeted by anonymous forces, we do feel in control of our actions, masters of our own fate. On the rare occasion that happens, we feel a sense of exhilaration, a deep sense of enjoyment that is long cherished and that becomes a landmark in memory for what life should be like. This is what we mean by optimal experience. It's what the sailor holding. A tight course feels when the wind whips through her hair, when the boat lunges through the waves like a colt, sails, hull, wind, and sea homing a harmony that vibrates in the sailor's veins. It is what a painter feels when the colors on the canvas begin to set up a magnetic tension with each other, and a new thing, a living form, takes shape in front of the astonished creator. Or it is the feeling a father has when his child for the first time responds to his smile. Such events do not occur only when the external conditions are favorable, however, people who have survived concentration camps or who have lived through near-fatal physical dangers often recall, in the midst of their ordeal they experience extraordinarily rich epiphanies in response to such simple events as hearing the song of a bird in the forest, completing a hard task, or sharing a crust of bread with a friend. Contrary to what we usually believe, moments like these, the best moments in our lives, are not a passive, receptive, relaxing times, although such experiences can also be enjoyable, if we have worked hard to attain them. The best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. Optimal experience is thus something that we make happen. For a child, it could be placing with trembling fingers the last block on a tower she has built, higher than any she has built so far. For a swimmer, it could be trying to beat his own record. For a violinist, mastering an intricate musical passage. For each person there are thousands of opportunities, challenges to expand ourselves. Such experiences are not necessarily pleasant at the time they occur. The swimmer's muscles might have ached during his most memorable race, his lungs might have felt like exploding, and he might have been dizzy with fatigue, yet these could have been the best moments. Mehali Csik Zent Mehali 3 Of his life Getting control of life is never easy, and sometimes it can be infinitely painful. But in the long run optimal experiences add up to a sense of mastery, or perhaps better, a sense of participation in determining the content of life, that comes as close to what is usually meant by happiness as anything else we can conceivably imagine. In the course of my studies I tried to understand as exactly as possible how people felt when they most enjoyed themselves, and why. My first studies involved a few hundred, experts, artists, athletes, musicians, chess masters, and surgeons, in other words, people who seemed to spend their time in precisely those activities they preferred. From their accounts of what it felt like to do what they were doing, I developed a theory of optimal experience based on the concept of flow, the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter, the experi. Ends itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost, for the sheer sake of doing it. With the help of this theoretical model my research team at the University of Chicago and, afterward, colleagues around the world interviewed thousands of individuals from many different walks of life. These studies suggested that optimal experiences were described in the same way by men and women, by young people and old, regardless of cultural difference. The flow experience was not just a peculiarity of affluent, industrialized elites. It was reported in essentially the same words by old women from Korea, by adults in Thailand and India, by teenagers in Tokyo, by Navajo shepherds, by farmers in the Alps, and by workers on the assembly line in Chicago. In the beginning our data consisted of interviews and questionnaires. 
To achieve greater precision, we developed with time a new method for measuring the quality of subjective experience. This technique, called the experienced sampling method, involves asking people to wear an electronic paging device for a week and to write down how they feel and what they are thinking about whenever the pager the pager is activated by a radio transmitter about eight times each day at random intervals at the end of the week each respondent provides what amounts to a running record a written film clip of his or her life made up of selections from its representative moments by now over a hundred thousand such cross sections of experience have been collected from different parts of the world the conclusions of this volume are based on that body of data. The study I began at the University of Chicago has now spread worldwide. Researchers in Canada, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Australia have taken up its investigation. At present the most extensive collection of data outside of Chicago is at the Institute of Psychology of For Flow. The medical school, the University of Milan, Italy. The concept of flow has been found useful by psychologists who study happiness, life satisfaction, and intrinsic motivation, by sociologists who see in it the opposite of anomie and alienation, by anthropologists who are interested in the phenomena of collective effervescence and rituals. Some have extended the implications of flow to attempts to understand the evolution of mankind, others to illuminate religious experience. But flow is not just an academic subject. Only a few years after it was first published, the theory began to be applied to a variety of practical issues. Whenever the goal is to improve the quality of life, the flow theory can point the way. It has inspired the creation of experimental school curricula, the training of business executives, the design of leisure products and services. Flow is being used to generate ideas and practices in clinical psycho. Therapy, the rehabilitation of juvenile delinquents, the organization of activities in old people's homes, the design of museum exhibits, and occupational therapy with the handicapped. All this has happened within a dozen years after the first articles on flow appeared in scholarly journals, and the indications are that the impact of the theory is going to be even stronger in the years to come. Overview Although many articles and books on flow have been written for the specialist, this is the first time that the research on optimal experience is being presented to the general reader and its implications for individual lives discussed. But what follows is not going to the how-to book. There are literally thousands of such volumes in print or on the remainder shelves of bookstores, explaining how to get rich, powerful, loved, or slim. Like cookbooks, they tell you how to accomplish a specific, limited goal on which few people actually follow through. Yet even if their advice were to work, what would be the result afterward in the unlikely event that one did turn into a slim, well-loved, powerful millionaire? Usually what happens is that the person finds himself back at square one, with a new list of wishes, just as dissatisfied as before. What would really satisfy people is not getting slim or rich, but feeling good about their lives. In the quest for happiness, partial solutions don't work. However well-intentioned, books cannot give recipes for how to be happy because optimal experience depends on the ability to control what happens in consciousness moment by moment, each person has to achieve it on the basis of his own individual efforts and creativity. What a book can do, however, and what this one will try to accomplish. Mehali CS extent Mehali 5 is to present examples of how life can be made more enjoyable, ordered in the framework of a theory for readers to reflect upon and from which they may then draw their own conclusions. Rather than present a list of do's and don'ts, this book intends to be a voyage through the realms of the mind, charted with the tools of science. Like all adventures worth having it will not be an easy one. Without some intellectual effort, a commitment to reflect and think hard about your own experience, 
you will not gain much from what follows. Flo will examine the process of achieving happiness through control over one's inner life. We shall begin by considering how consciousness works, and how it is controlled, chapter 2, because only we understand the way subjective states are shaped can we master them. Everything we experience, joy or pain, interest or boredom, is represented in the mind as information. If we are able to control this information, we can decide what our lives will be like. The optimal state of inner experience is one in which there is order in consciousness. This happens when psychic energy, or attention, is invested in realistic goals, and when skills match the opportunity for action. The pursuit of a goal brings order in awareness because a person must concentrate attention on the task at hand and momentarily forget everything else. These periods of struggling to overcome challenges are what people find to be the most enjoyable times of their lives. Chapter 3 A person who has achieved control over the psychic energy and has invested it in consciously chosen goals cannot help but grow into a more complex being. By stretching skills, by reaching toward higher challenges, such a person becomes an increasingly extraordinary individual. To understand why some things we do are more enjoyable than others, we shall review the conditions of the flow experience. Chapter 4 Flow is The way people describe their state of mind when consciousness is harmon. Nicely ordered, and they want to pursue whatever they are doing for its own sake. In reviewing some of the activities that consistently produce flow, such as sports, games, art, and hobbies, it becomes easier to understand what makes people happy. But one cannot rely solely on games and art to improve the quality of life. To achieve control over what happens in the mind, one can draw upon an almost infinite range of opportunities for enjoyment, for instance, through the use of physical and sensory skills ranging from athletics to music to yoga, chapter 5, or through the development of symbolic skills such as poetry, philosophy, or mathematics, chapter 6. Most people spend the largest part of their lives working and interacting with others, especially with members of their families. There. 6. Flow for it is crucial that one learn to transform jobs into flow producing activities, chapter 7, and to think of ways of making relations with parents, spouses, children, and friends more enjoyable, chapter 8. Many lives are disrupted by tragic accidents, and even the most fortunate are subjected to stresses of various kinds. Yet such loss do not necessarily diminish happiness. It is how people respond to stress that determines whether they will profit from misfortune or be miserable. Chapter 9 describes ways in which people manage to enjoy life despite adversity. And, finally, the last step will be to describe how people manage to join all experience into a meaningful pattern. Chapter 10. When that is accomplished, and a person feels in control of life and feels that it makes sense, there is nothing left to desire. The fact that one is not slim, rich, or powerful no longer matters. The tide of rising expectations is stilled, unfulfilled needs. No longer trouble the mind. Even the most humdrum experiences become enjoyable. Thus flow explore what is involved in reaching these aims. How is consciousness controlled? How is it ordered so as to make experience enjoyable? How is complexity achieved? And, last, how can meaning be created? The way to achieve these goals is relatively easy in theory, yet quite difficult in practice. The rules themselves are clear enough, and within everyone's reach. But many forces, both within ourselves and in the environment, stand in the way. It is a little like trying to lose weight, everyone knows what it takes, everyone wants to do it, yet it is next to impossible for so many. The stakes here are higher, however. It is not just a matter of losing a few extra pounds. It is a matter of losing the chance to have a life earth living. Before describing how the optimal flow experience can be attained, 
it is necessary to review briefly some of the obstacles to fulfillment implicit in the human condition in the old stories before living happily ever after the hero had to confront fiery dragons and wicked warlocks in the course of a quest this metaphor applies to the exploration of the psyche as well I shall argue that the primary reason it is so difficult to achieve happiness centers on the fact that, contrary to the myths mankind has developed to reassure itself, the universe was not created to answer our needs. Frustration is deeply woven into the fabric of life. And whenever some of our needs are temporarily met, we immediately start wishing for more. This chronic dissatisfaction is the second obstacle that stands in the way of contentment. To deal with these obstacles, every culture develops with time protective devices, religions, philosophies, arts, and comforts, that Mehali CS extent Mehali 7 Help shield us from chaos. They help us believe that we are in control of what is happening and give reasons for being satisfied with our lot. But these shields are effective only for a while. After a few centuries, sometimes after only a few decades, a religion or belief wears out and no longer provides the spiritual sustenance it once did. When people try to achieve happiness on their own, without the support of a faith, they usually seek to maximize pleasures that are either biologic ally programmed in their genes or are out as attractive by the society in which they live. Wealth, power, and sex become the chief goals that give direction to their strivings. But the quality of life cannot be improved this way. Only direct control of experience, the ability to derive moment by moment enjoyment from everything we do, can overcome the obstacles to fulfillment. The Roots of Discontent The foremost reason that happiness is so hard to achieve is that the universe is not designed with the comfort of human beings in mind. It is almost immeasurably huge, and most of it is hostilely empty and cold. It is the setting for great violence, as when occasionally the star explodes, turning to ashes everything within billions of miles. The rare planet whose gravity field would not crush our bones is probably swimming in lethal gases. Even planet Earth, which can be so idyllic and picturesque, is not to be taken for granted. To survive on it men and women have had to struggle for millions of years against ice, fire, floods, wild animals and invisible microorganisms that appear out of nowhere to snuff us out. It seems that every time a pressing danger is avoided, a new and more sophisticated threat appears on the horizon. No sooner do we invent a new substance than its byproducts start poisoning the environment. Throughout history, weapons that were designed to provide security have turned around and threatened to destroy their makers. As some diseases are curbed, new ones become virulent, and if, for a while, mortality is reduced, then population starts to haunt us. The four grim horsemen of the apocalypse are never very far away. The earth may be our only home, but it is a home full of booby traps waiting to go off at any moment. It is not that the universe is random in an abstract mathematical sense. The motions of the stars. The transformations of energy that occur in it might be predicted and explained well enough. But natural processes do not take human desires into account. They are deaf and blind. A flow to our needs, as they are random in contrast with the order we attempt to establish through our goals. A meteorite on a collision course with New York City might be obeying all the laws of the universe, but it would still damn nuisance. The virus that attacks the cells of a Mozart is only doing what comes naturally, even though it inflicts a grave loss on humankind. The universe is not hostile, nor yet is it friendly, in the words of J. H. Holmes. It is simply indifferent. Chaos is one of the oldest concepts in myth and religion. It is rather foreign to the physical and biological sciences, because in terms of their laws the events in the cosmos are perfectly reasonable. For instance, chaos theory, in the sciences attempts to describe regularities in what appears be utterly random. But chaos has a different meaning in psychology and the other human sciences, 
because if human goals and desires are taken as the starting point, there is irreconcilable disorder in the cosmos. There is not much that we as individuals can do to change the way the universe runs. In a lifetime we exert little influence over the forces that interfere with our well-being. It is important to do as much as we can to prevent nuclear war, to abolish social injustice, to eradicate hunger, disease. But it is prudent not to expect that efforts to change external conditions will immediately improve the quality of our lives. As J.S. Mill wrote, no great improvements in the lot of mankind are possible, until a great change takes place in the fundamental constitution of their modes of thought. How we feel about ourselves, the joy we get from living, ultimately depend directly on how the mind filters and interprets everyday experiences. Whether we are happy depends on inner harmony, not on the controls we are able to exert over the great forces of the universe. Certainly we should keep learning how to master the external environment, because our physical survival may depend on it. But such mastery is not going to add one jot to how good we as individuals feel, or reduce the chaos of the world as we experience it. To do that we must learn to achieve mastery over consciousness itself. Each of us has a picture, however vague, of what we would like to AC accomplish before we die. How close we get to attaining this goal becomes the measure for the quality of our lives. If it remains beyond reach, we grow resentful or resigned, if it is at least in part achieved, we experience a sense of happiness and satisfaction. For the majority of people on this earth, life goals are simple, to survive, to leave children who will in turn survive, and, if possible, to do so with a certain amount of comfort and dignity. In Favelas, Mehali Csx Zent Mehali Na Spreading around South American cities, in the drought-stricken regions of Africa, among the millions of Asians who have to solve the problem of hunger day after day, there is not much else to hope for. But as soon as these basic problems of survival are solved, merely having enough food and a comfortable shelter is no longer sufficient to make people content. New needs are felt, new desires arise. With affluence and power come escalating expectations, and as our level of wealth comforts keeps increasing, the sense of well-being we hope to achieve keeps ring ing into the distance. When Cyrus the Great had 10,000 cooks prepare new dishes for his table, the rest of Persia had enough to eat. These days every household in the first world has access to the recipes of the most diverse lands and can duplicate the feasts of past emperors. But does this make us more satisfied? This paradox of rising expectations suggests that improving the quality of life might be an insurmountable task. In fact, there is no inherent problem in our desire to escalate our goals, as long as we enjoy the struggle along the way. The problem arises when people are so fixated on what they want to achieve that they cease to derive pleasure from the present. When that happens, they forfeit their chance of contentment. Though the evidence suggests that most people are caught up on this frustrating treadmill of rising expectations, many individuals have found ways to escape it. These are people who, regardless of their material conditions, have been able to improve the quality of their lives, who are satisfied, who have a way of making those around them also a bit more happy. Such individuals lead vigorous lusts are open to a variety of experiences, keep on learning until the day they die, and have strong ties and commitments to other people and to the environment in which they live. They enjoy whatever they do, even if tedious or difficult, they are hardly ever bored, and they can take in stride anything that comes their way. Perhaps. Their greatest strength is that they are in control of their lives. We shall see later how they have managed to reach this state. But before we do so, we need to review some of the devices that have developed over time as protection against the threat of chaos, and the reasons why such external defenses often do not work. The Shields of Culture Over the course of human evolution, 
as each group of people became gradually aware of the enormity of its isolation in the cosmos and of the tenth law. The precariousness of its hold on survival, it developed myths and beliefs to transform the random, crushing forces of the universe into manageable, or at least understandable, patterns. One of the major functions of every culture has been to shield its members from chaos, to reassure them of their importance and ultimate success. The Eskimo, the hunter of the Amazon basin, the Chinese, the Navajo, the Australian Aborigine, the New Yorker, all have taken for granted that they live at the center of the universe, and that they have a special dispensation that puts them on the fast track to the future. Without such trust in exclusive privileges, it would be difficult to face the odds of existence. This is as it should be. But there are times when the feeling that one has found safety in the bosom of a friendly cosmos becomes dangerous. An unrealistic trust in the shields, in the cultural myths, can lead to equally extreme disillusion when they fail. This tends to happen whenever a culture has had a run of good luck and for a while seems in need to have found a way of controlling the forces of nature. At that point it is logical for it to begin believing that it is a chosen people who need no longer fear any major setback. The Romans reached that juncture after several centuries of ruling the Mediterranean. The Chinese were confident of their immutable superiority before the Mongol conquest, and the Aztecs before the arrival of the Spaniards. This culture is or overweening presumption about what we are entitled to from a universe that is basically insensitive to human needs, generally leads to trouble. The unwarranted sense of security sooner or later results in a rude awakening. When people start believing that progress is inevitable and life easy, they quickly lose courage and determination in the face of the first signs of adversity. As they realize that what they had believed in is not entirely true, they abandon faith in everything else they have learned. Deprived of the customary supports that cultural values had given them, they flounder in a morass of anxiety and apathy. Such symptoms of disillusion are not hard to observe around us now. The most obvious ones relate to the pervasive listlessness that affects so many lives. Genuinely happy individuals are few and far between. How many people do you know who enjoy what they are doing? who are reasonably satisfied with their lot, who do not regret the past and look to the future with genuine confidence. If Diogenes with his lantern 23 centuries ago had difficulty finding an honest man, today he would have perhaps an even more troublesome time finding a happy one. This general malaise is not due directly to external causes. Unlike Mehali C.S. and Mehali 11. So the nations in the contemporary world, we can't blame our problems on a harsh environment, on widespread poverty, or on the oppression of a foreign occupying army. The roots of the discontent are internal, and each person must untangle them personally, with his or her own power. The shields that have worked in the past, the order that religion, patriotism, ethnic traditions, and habits instilled by social classes used to provide are no longer effective for increasing number of people who feel exposed to the harsh winds of chaos. The lack of inner order manifests itself in a subjective condition that some call ontological anxiety, or existential dread. Basically, it is a fear of being, a feeling that there is no meaning to life and that existence is not worth going on with. Nothing seems to make sense. In the last few generations, the specter of nuclear war has added an unprecedented threat to our hopes. There no longer seems to be any point to the historical strivings of humankind. We are just forgotten specks drifting in the void. With each passing year, the chaos of the physical universe becomes magnified in the minds of the multitude. As people move through life, passing from the hopeful ignorance of youth to sobering adulthood, they sooner or later face an increasingly nagging question, is this all there is? Childhood can be painful, adults sense confusing, but for most people, behind it all there is the expectation that after one grows up, things will get better. During the years of early adulthood the future still looks promising, the hope remains that one's goals will be realized. 
but inevitably the bathroom mirror shows the first white hairs, and confirms the fact that those extra pounds are not about to leave. Inevitably eyesight begins to fail and mysterious pains begin to shoot through the body. Like waiters in a restaurant starting to place breakfast. Settings on the surrounding tables while one is still having dinner. These. Intimations of mortality plainly communicate the message. Your time is up. It's time to move on. When this happens, few people are ready. Wait a minute. This can't be happening to me. I haven't even begun to live. Where's all that money I was supposed to have made? Where are all the good times I was going to have? A feeling of having been led on, of being cheated, is an understandable consequence of this realization. From the earliest years we have been conditioned to believe that a benign fate would provide for us. After all, everybody seemed to agree that we had the great fortune of living in the richest country that ever was, in the most scientifically advanced period of human history, surrounded by the most efficient technology, protected by the wise institution. Therefore, it made sense to expect that we would have a richer, more meaningful life than 12th law. Any earlier members of the human race, if our grandparents, living in that ridiculously primitive past, could be content, just imagine how happy we would be. Scientists told us this was so, it was preached from the pulpits of churches, and it was confirmed by thousands of t commercials celebrating the good life. Yet despite all these assurances, sooner or later we wake up alone, sensing that there is no way this affluent, scientific, and sophisticated is going to provide us with happiness. As this realization slowly sets in, different people react to it differently. Some try to ignore it, and renew their efforts to acquire more of the things that were supposed to make life good, bigger cars and homes, more power on the job, a more glamorous lifestyle. They renew their efforts, determined still to achieve the satisfaction that up until then has eluded them. Sometimes this solution works, simply because one is so drawn into the compete. It is struggle that there is no time to realize that the goal has not come any nearer. But if a person does take the time out to reflect, the disillusionment returns, after each success it becomes clearer that money, power, status, and possessions do not, by themselves, necessarily add one iota to the quality of life. Others decide to attack directly the threatening symptoms. If it is a body going to seed that rings the first alarm, they will go on diets, join health clubs, do aerobics, buy a nautilus, or undergo plaster surgery. If the problem seems to be that nobody pays much attention, they buy books about how to get power or how to make friends, or they enroll in assertive training courses and have power lunches. After a while, however, it becomes obvious that these piecemeal solutions won't work either. No matter how much energy we devote to its care, the body will eventually give out. If we are learning to be more assertive, we might inadvertently alienate our friends. And if we devote too much time to cultivating new friends, we might threaten relationships with our spouse and family. There are just so many dams about to burst and so little time to tend to them all. Daunted by the futility of trying to keep up with all the demands they cannot possibly meet, some will just surrender and retire gracefully into relative oblivion. Following candid's advice, they will give up on the world and cultivate their little gardens. They might dabble in genteel forms of escape such as developing a harmless hobby or accumulating a collection of abstract paintings or porcelain figurines. Or they might lose themselves in alcohol or the dream world of drugs. While exotic pleasures and expensive recreations temporarily take the mind of the basic question, is this all there is, few claim to have ever found an answer that way. Mehal C.S. Exent Mehali 13 Traditionally, the problem of existence has been most directly confronted through religion, and an increasing number of the disillusioned are turning back to it, choosing either one of the standard creeds or a more esoteric Eastern variety. But religions are only temporarily successful attempts to cope with the lack of meaning in life, 
they are not permanent answers. At some moments in history, they have explained convincingly what was wrong with human existence and have given credible answers. From the 4th to the 8th century of our era, Christianity spread throughout Europe, Islam arose in the Middle East, and Buddhism conquered Asia. For hundreds of years these religions provided satisfying goals for people to spend their lives pursuing. But today it is more difficult to accept their worldviews as definitive. The form in which religions have presented their truths, myths, revelations, holy texts, no longer compels belief in an error of scientific rationality, even though the substance of the truths may have remained unchanged. A vital new religion may one day arise again. In the meantime, those who seek consolation in existing churches often pay for their peace of mind with a tacit agreement to ignore a great deal of what is known about the way the world works. The evidence that none of these solutions is any longer very effective is irrefutable. In the heyday of its material splendor, our society is suffering from an astonishing variety of strange ills. The profits made from the widespread dependence on illicit drugs are enriching murderers and terrorists. It seems possible that in the near future we shall be ruled by an oligarchy of former drug dealers, who are rapidly gaining wealth and power at the expense of law-abiding citizens. And in our sexual lives, by shading the shackles of hypocritical morality, we have unleashed destructive viruses upon one another. The trends are often so disturbing that we tend to become shaded and tune out whenever we hear the latest statistics. But the ostrich's strategy for avoiding bad news is hardly productive, better to face facts and take care to avoid becoming one of the statistics. There are figures that may be reassuring to some, for instance, in the past 30 years, we have doubled our per capita use of energy, most of thanks to a five-fold increase in the use of electric utilities and appliances. Other trend, however, would reassure no one. In 1984, there were still 34 million people in the United States who lived below the poverty line, defined as a yearly income of $10,609 or less for a family of four, a number that has changed little in generations. In the United States the per capita frequency of violent crimes, murder, rape, robbery, assault, increased by well over 300% between 1960 and 1986. As recently as 1978-1085,500 such crimes were 14th low reported, and by 1986 a number had climbed to 148,140. The murder rate held steady at about 1,000% above that in other industrialized countries like Canada, Norway, or France. In roughly the same period, the rate of divorce rose by about 400%, from 31 per 1,000 married couples in 1950 to 121 in 1984. During those 25 years venereal disease more than tripled, in 1960 there were 259000 cases of gonorrhea, by 1984 there were almost 900 triple zero. We still have no idea what tragic price that latest scourge, the AIDS epidemic, will claim before it's over. The three to four fold increase in social pathology over the last generation holds true in an astonishing number of areas. For instance, in 1955 there were 1700 triple zero instances of clinical intervention involving mental patients across the country, by 1975 the number had climbed to 6400 000. Perhaps not coincidentally, similar figures illustrate the increase in our national paranoia. During the decade from 1975 to 1985 the budget authorized to the Department of Defense climbed from $87.9 billion a year to dollar to $84.7 billion, more than a threefold increase. It is true that the budget of the Department of Education also tripled in the same period, but in 1985 this amounted to, only, $17.4 billion. At least as far as the allocation of resources is concerned, the sword is about 16 times mightier than the pen. The future does not look much rosier. Today's teenagers show symptoms of the malaise that ails their elders, 
sometimes in an even more virulent form. Fewer young people now grow up in families where both parents are present to share the responsibilities involved in bringing up children. In 1960 only one in ten adolescents was living in a one-parent family. By 1980 the proportion had doubled, and by 1990 it is expected to triple. In 1982 there were over 80,000 juveniles, average age, 15 years, committed to various jails. The statistics on drug use, venereal disease, disappearance. From home, and unwed pregnancy are all grim, yet probably quite short. Of the mark. Between 1950 and 1980 teenage suicides increased by about 300%, especially among white young men from the more affluent classes. Of the 29,253 suicides reported in 1985, 1,339 were white boys in the 15-19 age range, four times fewer white girls of the same age killed themselves, and ten times fewer black boys, young blacks, however, more than catch up in the number of deaths from homicide. Last but not least, a level of knowledge in the population seems to be declining everywhere. For instance, the average math score on the SAT tests was 466 in 1967, in 1984 it was 426. A similar decrease has been noted in the verbal scores. And the Dirge Lake statistics could go on and on. Why is it that, despite having achieved previously undreamed of? Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 15 Miracles of Progress we seem more helpless in facing life than our less privileged ancestors were. The answer seems clear, while humankind collectively has increased its material powers a thousandfold, it has not advanced very far in terms of proving the content of experience. Reclaiming Experience There is no way out of this predicament except for an individual to take things in hand personally. If values and institutions no longer provide as supportive a framework as they once did, each person must use whatever tools are available to carve out a meaningful, enjoyable life. One of the most important tools in this quest is provided by psychology. Up to now the main contribution of this science has been to discover how past events shed light on present behavior. It has made us aware that adult irrationality is often the result of childhood frustrations. But there is another way that the discipline of psychology can be put to use. It is in helping answer the question, given that we are who we are, whatever hang-ups and repressions, what can we do to improve our future? To overcome the anxieties and depressions of contemporary life, individuals must become independent of the social environment a degree. That they no longer respond exclusively in terms of its rewards and punish. Ments. To achieve such autonomy, a person has to learn to provide rewards to herself. She has to develop the ability to find enjoyment and purpose regardless of external circumstances. This challenge is both easier and more difficult than it sounds. Easier because the ability to do so is entirely within each person's hands. Difficult because it requires a discipline and perseverance that are relatively rare in any era, and perhaps especially in the present. And before all else, achieving control over experience requires a drastic change in attitude about what is important and what is not. We grow up believing that what counts most in our lives is that which will occur in the future. Parents teach children that if they learn good habits now, they will be better off as adults. Teachers assure pupils that the boring classes will benefit them later, when the students are going to be looking for jobs. The company vice president tells junior employees to have patience and work hard, because one of these days will be promoted to the executive ranks. At the end of the long struggle for advancement, the golden years of retirement beckon. We are always getting to live, as Ralph Waldo Emerson used to say, but never living. Or as poor Francis learned in the children's story, it is always bread and jam tomorrow, never b and jam today. 16th Flow Of course this emphasis on the postponement of gratification is to a CER inevitable. 
As Freud and many others before and after him have noted, civilization is built on the repression in individual desires. It would be impossible to maintain any kind of social order, any complex division of labor, unless society's members were forced to take on the habits and skills that the culture required, whether the individual liked it or not. Socialization, or the transformation of a human organism into a person who functions successfully within a particular social system, cannot be avoided. The essence of socialization is to make people dependent on social controls, to have them respond predictively to rewards and punishments. And the most effective form of socialization is achieved when people identify so thoroughly with the social order that they no longer can imagine themselves breaking any of its rules. In making us work for its goals, society is assisted by some powerful al. Lus, our biological needs and our genetic conditioning. All social controls, for instance, are ultimately based on a threat to the survival instinct. The people of an oppressed country obey their conquerors because they want to go on living. Until very recently, the laws of even the most civilized nations, such as Great Britain, were enforced by the threats of caning, whipping, mutilation, or death. When they do not rely on pain, social systems use pleasure as the inducement to accept norms. The good life promised a reward for a lifetime of work and adherence to laws is built on the cravings contained in our genetic programs. Practically every desire that has become part of human nature, from sexuality to aggression, from a longing for security to a receptivity to change, has been exploited as a source of social control by politicians, churches, corporations, and advertisers. To lure recruits into the Turkish armed forces, the sultans of the 16th century promised conscripts the rewards of raping women in the conquered territories, nowadays posters promise young men that if they join the army, they will see the world. It is important to realize that seeking pleasure is a reflex response built into our genes for the preservation of the species, not for the purpose of our own personal advantage. The pleasure we take in eating is an efficient way to ensure that the body will get the nourishment it needs. The pleasure of sexual intercourse is an equally practical method for the genes to program the body to reproduce and thereby to ensure the continuity of the genes. When a man is physically attracted to a woman, or vice versa, he usually imagines, assuming that he thinks about it at all, that this desire is an expression of his own individual interests, a result of his own intentions. In reality, more often than not his interest is simply being manipulated by the invisible genetic code. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali Seversin Following its own plans As long as the attraction is a reflex based on pure physical reactions, the person's own conscious plans probably play only a minimal role. There is nothing wrong with following this genetic programming and relishing the resulting pleasures it provides as long as we recognize them for what they are, and as long as we retain some control over them when it is necessary to pursue other goals, to which we might decide to assign priority. The problem is that it has recently become fashionable to regard whatever we feel inside as the true voice of nature speaking. The only authority many people trust today is instinct. If something feels good, if it is natural and spontaneous, then it must be right. But when we follow the suggestions of genetic and social instructions without question we relinquish the control of consciousness and become helpless playthings of impersonal forces. The person who cannot resist food or alcohol, or whose mind is constantly full. Cute on sex, is not free to direct his or her psychic energy. The liberated view of human nature which accepts and endorses every instinct or drive we happen to have simply because it's there, results in consequences that are quite reactionary. Much of contemporary realism turns out to be just a variation on good old-fashioned fatalism. People feel relieved of responsibility by recourse to the concept of nature. By nature, however, we are born ignorant. Therefore should we not try to learn? Some people produce more than the usual amount of androgens and therefore become excessively aggressive. Does that mean they should freely express violence? 
We cannot deny the facts of nature, but we should certainly try to improve on them. Submission to genetic programming can become quite dangerous, because it leaves us helpless. A person who cannot override genetic instructions when necessary is always vulnerable. Instead of deciding how to act in terms of personal goals, he has to surrender to the things that his body has been programmed or misprogrammed to do. One must particularly achieve control over instinctual drives to achieve a healthy independence of society, for as long as we respond predictably to what feels good and what feels bad, it is easy for others to exploit our preferences for their own ends. A thoroughly socialized person is one who desires only the rewards that others around him have agreed he should long for, rewards often grafted onto genetically programmed desires. He may encounter thousands of potentially fulfilling experiences, but he fails to notice them because they are not the things he desires. What matters is not what he has now, but what he might obtain if he does as others want him to do. Caught in a mill of social controls, that person keeps reaching for a prize that always dissolves in his hands. In a complex society, many powerful groups are involved in socializing, sometimes to seemingly contradictory goals. On the one hand, official institutions like schools, churches, and banks try to turn us into responsible citizens willing to work hard and save. On the other hand, we are constantly cajoled by merchants, manufacturers, and advertisers to spend our earnings on products that will produce the most profits for them. And, finally, the underground system of forbidden pleasures run by gamblers, pimps, and drug dealers, which is dialectically linked to the official institutions, promises its own rewards of easy dissipation, provided we pay. The messages are very different, but their outcome is essentially the same. They make us dependent on a social system that exploits our energies for its own purposes. There is no question that to survive, and especially to survive in a com. Plex society, it is necessary to work for external goals and to postpone immediate gratifications. But a person does not have to be turned into a puck shirked about by social controls. The solution is to gradually become free of societal rewards and learn how to substitute for them rewards that are under one's own powers. This is not to say that we should abandon every goal endorsed by society, rather, it means that, in addition to or instead of the goals others use to bribe us with, we develop a set of our own. The most important step in emancipating oneself from social controls is the ability to find rewards in the events of each moment. If a person learns to enjoy and find meaning in the ongoing stream of experience, in the process of living itself, the burden of social control automatically falls from one's shoulders. Power returns to the person when rewards are no longer relegated to outside forces. It is no longer necessary to struggle for goals that always seem to recede into the future, to end each boring day with the hope that tomorrow, perhaps, something good will happen. Instead of forever straining for the tantalizing prize dangled just out of reach, one begins to harvest the genuine rewards of living. But it is not by abandoning ourselves to instinctual desires that we become free of social controls. We must also become independent from the dictates of the body, and learn to take charge of what happens in the mind. Pain and pleasure occur in consciousness and exist only there. As long as we obey the socially conditioned stimulus response patterns that exploit our biological inclinations, we are controlled from the outside. To the extent that a glamorous ad makes us salivate for the product sold or that a frown from the boss spoils the day. Mehali CS Exempt Mehali 19 We are not free to determine the content of experience. Since what we experience is reality, as far as we are concerned, we can transform reality to the extent that we influence what happens in consciousness and thus free ourselves from the threat and blandishments of the outside world. Men are not afraid of things, but of how they view them, said Epictetus a long time ago. And the great emperor Marcus Aurelius wrote, if you are pained by external things, it is not they that disturb you, but your own judgment of them. And it is in your power to wipe out that judgment now.
paths of liberation. This simple truth, that control of consciousness determines the quality of life, has been known for a long time, in fact, for as long as human records exist. The oracles advice in ancient Elfi, know thyself, implied it. It was clearly recognized by Aristotle, whose notion of the virtuous activity of the soul, in many ways prefigures the argument of this book, and it was developed by the Stoic philosophers in classical antiquity. The Christian monastic orders perfected various methods for learning how to channel thoughts and desires. Ignatius of Loyola rationalized them in his famous spiritual exercises. The last great attempt to free consciousness from the domination of impulses and social controls was psychoanalysis, as Freud pointed out. The two tyrants that fought for control over the mind were the id and the superego, the first a servant of the genes, the second a lackey of society, both representing the other. Opposed to them was the ego, which stood for the genuine needs of the self connected to its concrete end. Weirdment. In the East techniques for achieving control over consciousness proliferated and achieved levels of enormous sophistication. Although quite different from one another in many respects, the yogi disciplines in India, the Taoist approach to life developed in China, and the Zen varieties of Buddhism all seek to free consciousness from the deterministic influences of outside forces, be they biological or social in nature. Thus, for instance, a yogi disciplines his mind to ignore pain that ordinary people would have no choice but to let into their awareness, Similarly he can ignore the insistent claims of hunger or sexual arousal that most people would be helpless to resist. The same effect can be achieved in different ways, either through perfecting severe mental discipline as in yoga or through cultivating constant spontaneity as in Zen. But the intended result is identical, to free inner life from the threat of chaos, on the one hand, and from the rigid conditioning of biological. 20 urges, on the other, and hence to become independent from the social controls that exploit both. But if it is true that people have known for thousands of years what it takes to become free and in control of one's life, why haven't we made more progress in this direction? Why are we as helpless, or more so, than our ancestors were in facing the chaos that interferes with happiness? There are at least two good explanations for this failure. In the first place, the kind of knowledge, or wisdom, one needs for emancipating consciousness is not cumulative. It cannot be condensed into a formula, it cannot be memorized and then routinely applied. Like other complex forms of expertise, such as a much your political judgment or a refined aesthetic sense, it must be earned through trial and error experience by each individual, generation after generation. Control over consciousness is not simply a cognitive skill. At least as much as intelligence, it requires the commitment of emotions and will. It is not enough to know how to do it, one must do it, consistently. In the same way as athletes or musicians who must keep practicing what they know in theory. And this is never easy. Progress is relative fast in fields that apply knowledge to the material world, such as physics or genetics. But it is painfully slow when knowledge is to be applied to modify our own habits and desires. Second, the knowledge of how to control consciousness must be reformulated every time the cultural context changes. The wisdom of the mystics, of the Sufi, of the great yogi, or of the Zen masters might have been excellent in their own time, and might still be the best, if we lived in those times and in those cultures. But when transplanted to contemporary California those systems lose quite a bit of their original power. They contain elements that are specific to their original contexts, and when these accidental components are not distinguished from what is essential, the path to freedom gets overgrown by brambles of meaningless mumbo-jumbo. Ritual form wins over substance, and the seeker is back where he started. Control over consciousness cannot be institutionalized. As soon as it becomes part of a set of social rules and norms, it ceases to be effective in the way it was originally intended to be. Routinization, unfortunately, tends to take place very rapidly. 
Troy was still alive when his quest for liberating the ego from its oppressors was turned into a state ideology and a rigidly regulated profession. Marx was even less fortunate. His attempts to free consciousness from the tyranny of economic exploitation were soon turned into a system of repression that would have boggled the poor founder's mind. And as Dostoevsky. Mehali C.S. Exent Mehali 21. And many others observed. If Christ had returned to preach his message of liberation in the Middle Ages, he would have been crucified again and again by the leaders of that very church whose worldly power was built on his name. In each new epoch, perhaps every generation, or even every few years, if the conditions in which we live change that rapidly, it becomes necessary to rethink and reformulate what it takes to establish autonomy in consciousness. Early Christianity helped the masses free themselves from the power of the ossified imperial regime and from an ideology that could give meaning only to the lives of the rich and the powerful. The Reformation liberated great numbers of people from political and ideological exploitation by the Roman Church. The philosophies and later the statesmen who drafted the American Constitution resisted the controls established by kings, popes, and aristocracy. When the inhuman conditions of factory labor became the most obvious obstacles to the workers' freedom to order their own experience, as they were in 19th century industrial Europe, Marx's message turned out to be especially relevant. The much more subtle but equally coercive social controls of bourgeois Vienna made Freud's road to liberation pertinent to those whose minds had been warped by such conditions. The insights of the Gospels, of Martin Luther, of the framers of the Constitution, of Marx and Freud, just to mention a very few of those attempts that have been made in the West to increase happiness by enhancing freedom, will always be valid and useful, even though some of them have been perverted in their application. But they certainly do not exhaust either the problems or the solutions. Given the recurring need to return to this central question of how to achieve mastery over one's life, what does the present state of knowledge say about it? How can it help a person learn to rid himself of anxieties and fears and thus become free of the controls of society, whose rewards he can now take or leave? As suggested before, the way is through control over consciousness, which in turn leads to control over the quality of experience. Any small gain in that direction will make life more rich, more enjoyable, more meaningful. Before starting to explore ways in which to improve the quality of experience, it will be useful to review briefly how consciousness works and what it actually means to have experiences. Armed with this knowledge, one can more easily achieve personal liberation. 22 Flow 2. The Anatomy of Consciousness at certain times in history cultures have taken it for granted that a person wasn't fully human unless he or she learned to master thoughts and feelings. In Confucian China, in ancient Sparta, in Republican Rome, in the early pilgrim settlements of New England, and among the British upper classes of the Victorian era, people were held responsible for keeping a tight rein on their emotions. And even who indulged in self-pity, who let instinct rather than reflection dictate actions, forfeited the right to be accepted as a member of the community. In other historical periods, such as the one in which we are now living, the ability to control oneself is not held in high esteem. People who attempt it are thought to be faintly ridiculous, uptight, or not quite, with it. But whatever the dictates of fashion, it seems that those who take trouble to gain mastery over what happens in consciousness do live a happier life. To achieve such mastery it is obviously important to understand how consciousness works. In the present chapter, we shall take a step in that direction. To begin with, and just to clear the air of any suspicion that in talking about consciousness we are referring to some mysterious process, we should recognize that, like every other dimension of human behavior, it is the result of biological processes. It exists only because of the incredibly complex architecture of our nervous system, which in turn is built up AC according to instructions contained in the protein. 23. Molecules of our chromosomes. At the same time, 
we should also recognize that the way in which consciousness works is not entirely controlled by its biological program. In many important respects that we shall review in the pages that follow, it is self-erected. In other words, consciousness has developed the ability to override its genetic instructions and to set its own independent course of action. The function of consciousness is to represent information about what is happening outside and inside the organism in such a way that it can be evaluated and acted upon by the body. In this sense, it functions as a clearinghouse for sensations, perceptions, feelings, and ideas, establishing priorities among all the diverse information. Without consciousness we would still know what is going on, but we would have to react to it in a reflexive, instinctive way. With consciousness, we can deliberately weigh what the senses tell us and respond accordingly. And we can also invent information that did not exist before. It is because we have consciousness that we can daydream, make up lies, and write beautiful poems and see scientific theories. Over the endless dark centuries of its evolution, the human nervous system has become so complex that it is now able to affect its own states, making it to a certain extent functionally independent of its genetic blueprint and of the objective environment. A person can make himself happy or miserable, regardless of what is actually happening outside, just by changing the contents of consciousness. We all know individuals who can transform hopes situations into challenges to be overcome just through the force of their personalities. This ability to persevere despite obstacles and setbacks is the quality people most admire in others, and justly so, it is probably the most important trait not only for succeeding in life, but for enjoying it as well. To develop this trait, one must find ways to order consciousness so as to be in control of feelings and it is best not to expect that shortcuts will do the trick. Some people have a tendency to become very mystical when talking about consciousness and expect it to accomplish miracles that at present it is not designed to perform. They would like to believe that anything is possible in what they think of as the spiritual realm. Other individuals claim the power to channel past existences, to communicate with spiritual entities, and to perform uncanny acts of extrasensory perception. When not outright frauds, these accounts usually turn out to be self-delusions, lies that an overly receptive mind tells itself. The remarkable accomplishments of Hindu fakirs and other practitioners of mental disciplines are often presented as examples of the 24th law, limited powers of the mind, and with more justification. But even many of these claims do not hold up under investigation, and the ones that do can be explained in terms of the extremely specialized training of a normal mind. After all, mystical explanations are not necessary to account for the performance of a great violinist, or a great athlete, even though most of us could not even begin to approach their powers. The yogi, similarly, is a virtuoso of the control of consciousness. Like all virtuosi, he must spend many years learning, and he must keep constantly in training. Being a specialist, he cannot afford the time or the mental energy to do anything other than fine-tune his skill at manipulating inner experiences. The skills the yogi gains are at the expense of the more mundane abilities that other people learn to develop and take for granted. What an individual yogi can do is amazing, but so is what a plumber can do, or a good mechanic. Perhaps in time we shall discover hidden powers of the mind that will allow it to make the sort of quantum leaps that now we can only dream about. There is no reason to rule out the ability that eventually we shall be able to bend spoons with brain waves. But at this point, when there are so many more mundane but no less urgent tasks to accomplish, it seems a waste of time to lust for powers beyond our reach when consciousness, with all its limitation, could be employed so much more effectively. Although in its present state it cannot do what some people would wish it to do, the mind has enormous untapped potential that we desperately need to learn how to use. Because no branch of science deals with consciousness directly, there is no single accepted description of how it works. Many disciplines touch on and thus provide peripheral accounts. Neuroscience, neuroanatomy, 
cognitive science, artificial intelligence, psychoanalysis, and phenomenology are some of the most directly relevant fields to choose from, however, trying to summarize their findings would result in an account similar to the day. Descriptions the blind men gave of the elephant, each different, and each unrelated to the others. No doubt we shall continue to learn important things about consciousness from these disciplines, but in the meantime we are left with the task of providing a model that is grounded in fact, yet expressed simply enough so that anyone can make use of it. Although it sounds like indecipherable academic jargon, the most concise description of the approach I believe to be the clearest way to examine the main facets of what happens in the mind, in a way that can be useful in the actual practice of everyday life, is a phenomenological model of consciousness based on information theory. This representa Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 25 Shun of consciousness is phenomenological in that it deals directly with events, phenomena, as we experience and interpret them, rather than focusing on the anatomical structures, neurochemical processes, or unconscious purposes that make these events possible. Of course, it is understood that whatever happens in the mind is the result of electrochemical changes in the central nervous system, as laid down over millions of years by biological evolution. But phenomenology assumes that a mental event can be best understood if we look at it directly as it was experienced, rather than through the specialized optics of a particular discipline. Yet in contrast to pure phenomenology, which intentionally excludes any other theory or science from its method, the model we will explore here adopts principles from information theory as being relevant for understanding what happens in consciousness. These principles include knowledge about how sensory data are processed, stored, and used, the dynamics of attention and memory. With this framework in mind, what, then, does it mean to be conscious? It simply means that certain specific conscious events, sensations, feelings, thoughts, intentions, are occurring, and that we are able to direct their cause. In contrast, when we are dreaming, some of the same events are present, yet we are not conscious because we cannot control them. For instance, I may dream of having received news of a relative's being involved in an accident, and I may feel very upset. I might think, I wish I could be help. Despite the fact that I perceive, feel, think, and form intentions in the dream, I cannot act on these processes, by making provisions for checking out the truthfulness of the news, for example, and hence, I am not conscious. In dreams we are locked into a single scenario we cannot change at will. The events that constitute consciousness, the things we see, feel, think, and desire, are information that we can manipulate and use. Thus we might think of consciousness as intentionally ordered informa. This dry definition, accurate as it is, does not fully suggest the importance of what it conveys. Since for us outside events do not exist unless we are aware of them, consciousness corresponds to subjective experienced reality. While everything we feel, smell, hear, or remember is potentially a candidate for entering consciousness, the experiences that actually do become part of much fewer than those left out. Thus, while consciousness is a mirror that reflects what our senses tell us about what happens both outside our bodies and within the nervous system, it reflects those chains selectively, actively shaping events, imposing on them a reality of its own. The reflection consciousness provides is what we call our life, the sum of all we have heard, seen, felt. 26 flow Hoped, and suffered from birth to death. Although we believe that there are things outside consciousness, we have direct evidence only of those that find a place in it. As the central clearing house in which varied events processed by different senses can be represented and compared, consciousness can contain a famine in Africa, the smell of a rose, the performance of the Dow Jones, and a plan to stop at the store to buy some bread all at the same time. But that does not mean that its content is a shapeless jumble. 
we may call intentions the force that keeps information in consciousness ordered. Intentions arise in consciousness whenever a person is aware of desiring something or wanting to accomplish something. Intentions are also bits of information, shaped either by biological needs or by internalized social goals. They act as magnetic fields, moving attention towards some objects and away from others, keeping our mind focused on some stimuli. In preference to others, we often call the manifestation of intentionality by other names, such as instinct, need, drive, or desire. But these are all explanatory terms, telling us why people behave in certain ways. Intention is a more neutral and descriptive term, it doesn't say why a person wants to do a certain thing, but simply states that he does. For instance, whenever blood sugar level drops below a critical point, we start feeling uneasy, we might feel irritable and sweaty, and get stomach cramps. Because of genetically programmed instructions to restore the level of sugar in the blood, we might start thinking about food. We will look for food until we eat and are no longer hungry. In this instance we could say that it was the hunger drive that organized the content of conscious, forcing us to focus attention on food. But this is already an interpretation of the facts, no doubt chemically accurate, but phenomenologically irrelevant. The hungry person is not aware of the level of sugar in his blood. Stream, he knows only that there is a bit of information in his consciousness that he has learned to identify as hunger. Once the person is aware that he is hungry, he might very well form the intention of obtaining some food. If he does so, his behavior will be the same as if he were simply obeying a need or drive. But alternatively, he could disregard pangs of hunger entirely. He might have some stronger and opposite intentions, such as losing weight, or wanting to save money, or fasting for religious reasons. Sometimes, as in the case of political protesters who wish to starve themselves to death, the intention of making an ideological statement might override genetic instructions, resulting in voluntary death. Mehali C.S. Exent Mehali 27 The intentions we either inherit or acquire are organized in hierarchies of goals, which specify the order of precedence among them. For the protester, achieving a given political reform may be more important than anything else, life included. That one goal takes precedence over all others. Most people, however, adopt principle goals based on the needs of their body, to live a long and healthy life, to have sex, to be well fed and comfortable, or on the desires implanted by the social system, to be good, to work hard, to spend as much as possible, live up to others' expectations. But there are enough exceptions in every culture to show that goals are quite flexible. Individuals who depart from the norms, heroes, saints, sages, artists, and poets, as well as madmen and criminals, look for different things in life than most others do. The existence of people like these shows that consciousness can be ordered in terms of different goals and intentions. Each of us has this freedom to control our subjective reality. The Limits of Consciousness If it were possible to expand indefinitely what consciousness is able to encompass, one of the most fundamental dreams of humankind would come true. It would be almost as good as being immortal or omnipotent, in short, godlike. We could think everything, feel everything, do everything, scan through so much information that we could fill up every fraction of a second with a rich tapestry of experiences. In the space of a lifetime we could go through a million, or, why not, through an infinite number of lives. Unfortunately, the nervous system has definite limits on how much information it can process at any given time. There are just so many events that can appear in consciousness and be recognized and handled appropriately before they begin to crowd each other out. Walking across a room while chewing gum at the same time is not too difficult, even though some statesmen have been alleged to be unable to do it, but, in fact, there is not that much more that can be done concurrently. Thoughts have to follow each other, or they get jumbled. 
while we are thinking about a problem we will not truly experience either happiness or sadness. We cannot run, sing, and balance the checkbook simultaneously, because each one of these activities exhausts most of our capacity for attention. At this point in our scientific knowledge we are on the verge of being able to estimate how much information the central nervous system is capable of processing. It seems we can manage at most 7 bits of 28 flow formation, such as differentiated sounds, or visual stimuli, or recognizable nuances of emotion or thought, at any one time, and that the shortest time it takes to discriminate between one set of bits and another is about 118 of a second. By using these figures one concludes that it is possible to process at most 126 bits of information per second, or 7560 per minute, or almost half a million per hour. Over a lifetime of 70 years, and counting 16 hours waking time each day, this amounts to about 185 billion bits of information. It is out of this total that everything in our life must come, every thought, memory, feeling, or action. It seems like a huge amount, but in reality it does not go that far. The limitation of consciousness is demonstrated by the fact to understand what another person is saying we must process 40 bits of information each second. If we assume the upper limit of our capacity to be 126 bits per second, it follows that to understand what three people are saying simul Continuously is theoretically possible, but only by managing to keep out of consciousness every other thought or sensation. We couldn't, for instance, be aware of the speaker's expressions, nor could we wonder about why they are saying what they are saying, or notice what they are wearing. Of course, these figures are only suggestive at this point in our knowledge of the way the mind works. It could be argued justifiably that they either underestimate or overestimate the capacity of the mind to process information. The optimists claim that through the course of evolution the nervous system has become adept at chunking bits of information so that processing capacity is constantly expanded. Simple functions like adding a column of numbers or driving a car grow to be automated, leaving the mind free to deal with more data. We also learn how to compress and streamline information through symbolic means, language, math, abstract concepts, and stylized narratives. Each biblical parable, for instance, tries to encode the hardwon experience of many individuals over unknown eons of time. Consciousness, the optimists argue, is an open system, in effect, it is infinitely expandable, and there is no need to take its limitations into account. But the ability to compress stimuli does not help as much as one might expect. The requirements of life still dictate that we spend about 8% of waking time eating, and almost the same amount taking care of personal bodily needs such as washing, dressing, shaving, and going to the bathroom. These two activities alone take up 15% of consciousness, and while engaged in them we can't do much else that requires serious concentration. But even when there is nothing else. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 29 Pressing occupying their minds, most people fall far below the peak capacity for processing information. In the roughly one third of the day that is free of obligations, in their precious, leisure, time, most people in fact seem to use their minds as little as possible. The largest part of free time, almost half of it for American adults, is spent in front of the television set. The plots and characters of the popular shows are so repetitive that although watching TV requires the processing of visual urges, very little else in the way of memory, thinking, or volition is required. Not surprisingly, people report some of the lowest levels of concentration, use of skills, clarity of thought, and feelings of potency when watching television. The other leisure activities people usually do at home are only a little more demand ing. Reading most newspapers and magazines, talking to other people, and gazing out the window also involve processing very little new inform. Ocean, and thus require little concentration. 
So the 185 billion events to be enjoyed over our mortal days might be either an overestimate or an underestimate. If we consider the amount of data the brain could theoretically process, the number might be too low, but if we look at how people actually use their minds, it is definitely much too high. In any case, an individual can experience only so much. Therefore, the information we allow into consciousness becomes extremely important. It is, in fact, what determines the content and the quality of life. Attention as Psychic Energy Information enters consciousness either because we intend to focus attention on it or as a result of attentional habits based on biological or social instructions. For instance, driving down the highway, we pass hundreds of cars without actually being aware of them. Their shape and color might register for a fraction of a second, and then they are immediately forgotten. But occasionally we notice a particular vehicle, perhaps because it is swerving unsteadily between lanes, or because it is moving very slowly, or because of its unusual appearance. The image of the unusual car enters the focus of consciousness, and we become aware of it. In the mind the visual information about the car, e.g., it is swerving, gets related to information about other errant cars stored in memory, to determine into which category present instance fits. Is this an inexperienced driver, a drunken driver, a momentarily distracted but competent driver? As soon as the event is mashed to an already known class of events, it is identified. Now it must be evaluated, is this 30th law something to worry about? If the answer is yes, then we must decide on an appropriate course of action, should we speed up, slow down, change lanes, stop and alert the highway patrol. All these complex mental operations must be completed in a few seconds, sometimes in a fraction of a second. While forming such a judgment seems to be a lightning fast reaction, it does take place in real time. And it does not happen automatically, there is a distinct process that makes such reactions possible, a process called attention. It is attention that selects the relevance of information from the potential millions of bits available. It takes attention to retrieve the appropriate references from memory, to evaluate the event, and then to choose the right thing to do. Despite its great powers, attention cannot step beyond the limits already described. It cannot notice or hold in focus more information than can be processed simultaneously. Retrieving information from memory storage and bringing it into the focus of awareness, comparing information, evaluating, deciding, all make demands on the mind's limited processing capacity. For example, the driver who notices the swerving car will have to stop talking on his cellular phone if he wants to avoid an accident. Some people learn to use this priceless resource efficiently, while others waste it. The mark of a person who is in control of consciousness is the ability to focus attention at will, to be oblivious to distractions, to concentrate for as long as it takes to achieve a goal, and not longer. And the person who can do this usually enjoys the normal course of everyday life. Two very different individuals come to mind to illustrate how attention can be used to order consciousness in the service of one's goals. The first is E a European woman who is one of the best known and powerful women in her country. A scholar of international reputation, she has at the same time built up a thriving business that employs hundreds of people and has been on the cutting edge of its field for a generation. He travels constantly to political, business, and professional meetings, moving among her several residences around the world. If there is a concert in the town where she is staying, he will probably be in the audience, at the first free moment she will be a museum or library. And while she is in a meeting, her chauffeur, instead just standing around and waiting, will be expected to visit the local art gallery or museum, for on the way home, his employer will want to discuss what he thought of its paintings. Not one minute of E.S. life is wasted. Usually she is writing, solving. Mehali C.S. Sent Mehali 31, Problems, reading one of the five newspapers of the earmarked sections of books on her daily schedule, 
or just asking questions, watching curiously what is going on, and planning her next task. Very little of her time is spent on the routine functions of life. Chatting or socializing out of mere politeness is ungraciously, but avoided whenever possible. Each day, however, she devotes some time to recharging her mind, by such simple means as standing still for 15 minutes on the lakeshore, seeing the sun with eyes closed. Or she may take her hounds for a walk in the meadows on the hill outside town. He is so much in control of her attentional processes that she can disconnect her consciousness at will and fall asleep for a refreshing nap whenever she has a moment free. E.S. Life has not been easy. Her family became impoverished after World War I, and she herself lost everything, including her freedom, during World War II. Several decades ago she had a chronic disease her doctors were sure was fatal. But she recovered everything, including her health, by disciplining her attention and refusing to diffuse it on unproductive thoughts or activities. At this point she radiates a pure glow of energy. And despite past hardships and the intensity of her present life, she seems to relish thoroughly every minute of it. The second person who comes to mind is in many ways the opposite of E, the only similarity we are the same unbending sharpness of attention. R is a slight, at first sight, unprepossessing man. Shy, modest to the point of self-effacement, he would be easy to forget immediately after a short meeting. Although he is known to only a few, his reputation among them is very great. He is master of an arcane branch of scholarship, and at the same time the author of exquisite words translated into many languages. Every time one speaks to him, the image of a deep well full of energy comes to mind. As he talks, his eyes take in everything, every sentence he hears is analyzed three or four different ways even before the speaker has finished saying it. Things that most people take for granted puzzle him, and until he figures them out in an original yet perfectly appropriate way, he will not let them be. Yet despite this constant effort of focused intelligence, R gives the impression of restfulness, of calm serenity. He always seems aware of the keenest ripples of activity in his surroundings. But R does not notice things in order to change them or judge them. He is content to register reality, to understand, and then, perhaps, to express his understanding. R is not going to make the immediate impact on society that he has. But his consciousness is just as ordered and complex, his attention is stretched as far as it can go interacting with the world around him. And like E, he seems to enjoy his life intensely. 32 Flow Each person allocates his or her limited attention either by focusing it intentionally like a beam of energy, as do E and R in the previous examples, or by diffusing it in desultory, random movements. The shape and content of life depend on how attention has been used. Entirely different realities will emerge depending on how it is invested. The names we use to describe personality traits, such as extrovert, high achiever, or paranoia, refer to the specific patterns people have used to structure their attention. At the same party, the extrovert will seek out and enjoy interactions with others, the high achiever will look for useful business contacts, and the paranoid will be on guard for signs of danger he must avoid. Attention can be invested in innumerable ways, ways that can make life either rich or miserable. The flexibility of attentional structures is even more obvious when they are compared across cultures or occupational classes. Eskimo hunters are trained to discriminate between dozens of types of snow, and are always aware of the direction and speed of the wind. Traditional Melanesian sailors can be taken blindfolded to any point of the ocean within a radius of several hundred miles from their island home and, if allowed to float for a few minutes in the sea, are able to recognize the spot by the feel of the currents on their bodies. A musician structures her attention so as to focus on nuances of sound that ordinary people are not aware of, a stockbroker focuses on tiny changes in the market that others do not register. A good clinical diagnostician has an uncanny eye for symptoms, because they have trained their attention to process signals that otherwise would pass unnoticed. 
because attention determines what will or not appear in consciousness, and because it is also required to make any other mental events, such as remembering, thinking, feeling, and making decisions, happen there. It is useful to think of it as psychic energy. Attention is like energy in that. Without it no work can be done, and in doing work it is dissipated. Create ourselves by how we invest this energy. Memories, thoughts, and feelings are all shaped by how we use it. And it is an energy under our control, to do with as we please, hence, attention is our most important tool in the task of improving the quality of experience. Enter the self. But what do those first person pronouns refer to in the lines above, those we and rs that are supposed to control attention? Where is the I, the entity that decides what to do with the psychic energy generated? Mehali CS Exent Mehali 33 By the nervous system. Where does the captain of the ship, the master of the soul, reside? As soon as we consider these questions even a short while, we realize that the I, or the self as we shall refer to it from now on, is also one of the contents of consciousness. It is one that never strays very far from the focus of attention. Of course my own self exists solely in my own consciousness, in that of others who know me and will be versions of it, most of them probably unrecognizable likenesses of the original myself as I see me. The self is no ordinary piece of information, however. In fact, it contains everything else that has passed through consciousness, all the memories, actions, desires, pleasures, and pains are included in it. And more than anything else, the self represents the hierarchy of goals that we have built up, bit by bit, over the years. The self of the political activist may become indistinguishable from his ideology, the self of the banker may become wrapped up in his inverts. Of course, ordinarily we do not think of ourselves in this way. At any given time, we are usually aware of only a tiny part of it, as when we become conscious of how we look, of what impression we are making, or of what we really would like to do if we could. We most often associate ourselves with our body, though sometimes we extend its boundaries to identify it with the car, house, or family. Yet however much we are aware of it, the self is in many ways the most important element of consciousness, for it represents symbolically all of consciousness's other contents, as well as the pattern of their interrelations. The patient reader who has followed the argument so far might detect at this point a faint trace of circularity. If attention, or psychic energy, is directed by the self, and if the self is the sum of contents of consciousness and the structure of its goals, and if the contents of consciousness and the goals are the result of different ways of investing attention, then we have a system that is going round and round, with no clear causes or effects. At one point we are saying that the self directs attention, at another, that a Kenshan determines the self. In fact, both these statements are true. Consciousness is not a strictly linear system, but one in which circular casuality obtains. Attention shapes the self, and is in turn shaped by it. An example of this type of casuality is the experience of Sam Browning, one of the adolescents we have followed in our longitudinal research studies. Sam went to Bermuda for a Christmas holiday with his father when he was 15. At the time, he had no idea of what he wanted to do with his life, his self was relatively unformed, without an 34th law. Identity of its own. Sam had no clearly differentiated goals, he wanted exactly what other boys his age are supposed to want, either because of their genetic programs or because of what the social environment told them to want, in other words, he thought vaguely of going to college, then later finding some kind of well-paying job, getting married, and living somewhere in the suburbs. In Bermuda, Sam's father took him on an excursion to a coral barrier, and they dug underwater to explore the reef. Sam couldn't believe his eyes. He found a mysterious, beautifully dangerous environment so enchanting that he decided to become more familiar with it. He ended up taking a number of biology courses in high school, 
and is now in the process of becoming a marine scientist. In Sam's case an accidental event imposed itself on his consciousness. The challenging beauty of life in the ocean. He had not planned to have this experience. It was not the result of his self or his goals having directed at tension to it. But once he became aware of what went on undersea, Sam liked it. The experience resonated with previous things he had enjoyed doing, with feelings he had about nature and beauty, with priorities about what was important that he had established over the years. He felt the experience was something good, something worth seeking out again. Thus he built this accidental event into a structure of goals, to learn more about the ocean, to take courses, to go on to college and graduate school, to find a job as a marine biologist, which became a central element of his self. From then on, his goals directed Sam's attention to focus more and more closely on the ocean and on its life, thereby closing the circle of casualty. At first attention helped to shape his self, when he noticed the beauties of the underwater world he had been exposed to by accident, later, as he intentionally sought knowledge in marine biology, his self began to shape his attention. There is nothing very unusual about Sam's case, of course. Most people develop their attentional structures in similar ways. At this point, almost all the components needed to understand how consciousness can be controlled are in place. We have seen that experience depends on the way we invest psychic energy, on the structure of attention. This, in turn, is related to goals and intentions. These processes are connected to each other by the self, or the dynamic mental representation we have of the entire system of our goals. These are the pieces that must be maneuvered if we wish to improve things. Of course, existence can also be improved by outside events, like winning a million dollars in the lottery, marrying the right man or woman, or helping to change an art social system. But even these marvelous events must take their place in consciousness, and be connected in positive ways too. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 35 Our self, before they can affect the quality of life. Structure of consciousness is beginning to emerge, but so far we have a rather static picture, one that has sketched out the various elements, but not the processes through which they interact. We need now consider what follows whenever attention brings a new bit of information into awareness. Only then will we be ready to get a thorough sense of how experience can be controlled, and hence changed for the better. Disorder in Consciousness, Psychic Entropy One of the main forces that affects consciousness adversely is psychic disorder, that is, information that conflicts with existing intentions, or distracts us from carrying them out. We give this condition many names, depending on how we experience it, pain, fear, rage, anxiety, or jealousy. All these varieties of disorder force attention to be diverted to undesirable objects, leaving us no longer free to use it according to our preferences. Psychic energy becomes unwieldy and ineffective. Consciousness can become disordered in many ways. For instance, in a factory that produces audiovisual equipment, Giulio Martinez, one of the people he studied with the experience sampling method, is feeling listless on his job. As the movie projectors pass in front of him on the assembly line, he is distracted and can hardly keep up the rhythm of moves necessary for soldering the connections that are his responsibility. Usually he can do his part of the job with time to spare and then relax for a while to exchange a few jokes before the next unit stops at his station. But today he is struggling and occasionally he slows down the entire line. When the man at the next station kids him about it, Julio snaps back irritably. From morning to quitting time tension keeps building, and it spills over to his relationship with his co-workers. Julio's problem is simple, almost trivial, but it has been weighing heavily on his mind. One evening a few days earlier he noticed on arriving home from work that one of his tires was quite low. Next morning the rim of the wheel was almost touching the ground. Julio would not receive his paycheck till the end of the following week, and he was certain he would not have enough money until then to have the tire patched up, let alone buy a new one. 
credit was something he had not yet learned to use. The factory was out in the suburbs, about 20 miles from where he lived, and he simply had to reach it by 8 a.m. The only solution Julio could think of was to drive gingerly to the service. 36 flow. Station in the morning, fill the tire with air, and then drive to work as quickly as possible. After work the tire was low again, so he inflated it at a gas station near the factory and drove home. On the morning in question, he had been doing this for three days, hoping the procedure would work until the next paycheck. But today, by the time he made it to the factory, he could hardly steer the car because the wheel with the bum tire was so flat. All through the day he worried, will I make it home tonight? How will I get to work tomorrow morning? These questions kept intruding in his mind, disrupting concentration on his work and throwing a pall on his moods. Julio is a good example of what happens when the internal order, the self is disrupted. The basic pattern is always the same, some information that conflicts with an individual's goals appears in consciousness. Depend ing on how central that goal is to the self and on how severe the threat to it is. Some amount of potential will have to be mobilized to eliminate the danger, leaving less attention free to deal with other matters. For Julio, holding a job was a goal of very high priority. If he were to lose it, all his other goals would be compromised, therefore keeping it was essential to maintain the order of his self. The flat tire was jeopardizing the job, and consequently it absorbed a great deal of his psychic energy. Whenever information disrupts consciousness by threatening its goals we have a condition of inner disorder, or psychic entropy, a disorganization of the self that impairs its effectiveness. Prolonged experiences of this kind can weaken the self to the point that it is no longer able to invest pursue its goals. Julio's problem was relatively mild and transient. A more chronic example of psychic entropy is the case of Jim Harris, a greatly talented high school sophomore who was in one of our surveys. Alone at home on a Wednesday afternoon, he was standing in front of the mirror in the bedroom. His parents used to share. On the box at his feet, a tape of the Grateful Dead was playing, as it had been almost without interruption for the past week. Jim was trying on one of his father's favorite garments, a heavy green chamois shirt his father had worn whenever the two had gone camping together. Passing his hand over the warm fabric, Jim remembered the cozy feeling of being snuggled up to his dead in the smoky tent, while the loons were laughing across the lake. In his right hand, Jim was holding a pair of large sewing scissors. The sleeves were too long for him, and he was wondering if he dared to trim them. Dead would be furious, or would he even notice? A few hours later, Jim was lying in his bed. On the nightstand beside him was a bottle of Mehali CSX Zen Mehali 37. And now empty, although there had been 70 tablets in it just a while before. Jim's parents had separated a year earlier, and now they were getting a divorce. During the week while he was in school, Jim lived with his mother. Friday evenings he packed up to go and stay in his father's new apartment in the suburbs. One of the problems with this arrangement was that he was never able to be with his friends, during the week they were all too busy, and on weekends Jim was stranded in foreign territory where he knew nobody. He spent his free time on the phone, trying to make connections with his friends. Or he listened to tapes that he felt echoed the solitude gnawing inside him. But the worst thing, Jim felt, was that his parents were constantly battling for his loyalty. They kept making snide remarks about each other, trying to make Jim feel guilty if he showed any interest or love toward one in the presence of the other. Help, he scribbled. In his diary a few days before his attempted suicide. I don't want to hate. My mom, I don't want to hate my dad. I wish they stopped doing this to me. Luckily that evening Jim's sister noticed the empty bottle of aspirin and called her mother, and Jim ended up in the hospital, where his stomach was pumped and he was set back on his feet in a few days. Thousands of kids his age are not that fortunate. 
the flat tire that threw Julio into a temporary panic, and the divorce that almost killed Jim don't act directly as physical causes producing a physical effect. As, for instance, one billiard ball hitting another and making it carom in a predictable direction. The outside event appears in consciousness purely as information, without necessarily having a positive or negative value attached to it. It is the self that interprets that raw information in the context of its own interests, and determines whether it is harmful or not. For instance, if Julio had had more money or some credit, his problem would have been perfectly innocuous. If in the past he had invested more psychic energy in making friends on the job, the flat tire would not have created panic, because he could have always asked one of his co-workers to give him a ride for a few days. And if he had had a stronger sense of self-confidence, the temporary setback would not have affected him as much because he would have trusted his ability to overcome it eventually. Similarly, if Jim had been more independent, the divorce would not have affected him as deeply. But at his age his goals must have still been bound up too closely with those of his mother and father, so that the split between them also split his sense of self. Had he had closer friends or a longer record of goals successfully achieved, his self have had the strength to maintain its integrity. 38 Flow He was lucky that after the breakdown his parents realized the predicament and sought help for themselves and their son, re-establishing a stable enough relationship with Jim to allow him to go on with the task of building a sturdy self. Every piece of information we process gets evaluated for its bearing on the self. Does it threaten our goals, does it support them, or is it neutral? News of the fall of the stock market will upset the banker, but it might reinforce the sense of self of the political activist. A new piece of information will either create disorder in consciousness, by getting us all worked up to face the threat, or it will reinforce our goals, thereby freeing up psychic energy. Order in consciousness, oh. The opposite state from the condition of psychic entropy is optimal experience. When the information that keeps coming into awareness is congruent with goals, psychic energy flows effortlessly. There is no need to worry, no reason to question one's adequacy. But whenever one does stop to think about oneself, the evidence is enriching, you are doing all right. The positive feedback strengthens the self and more attention is freed to deal with the outer and the inner environment. Another one of our respondents, a worker named Raiko Medelling, gets this feeling quite often on his job. He works in the same factory as Julio, a little further up on the assembly line. The task he has to perform on each unit that passes in front of his station should take 43 seconds to perform, the same exact operation almost 600 times in a working day. Most people would grow tired of such work very soon. But Raiko has been at this job for over five years, and he still enjoys it. The reason is that he approaches his task in the same way an Olympic athlete approaches his event, how can I beat my record? Like the runner who trains for years to shave a few seconds of his best performance on the track. Raiko has trained himself to better his time on the assembly line. With the painstaking care of a surgeon, he has worked out a private routine for how to use his tools, how to do his moves. After five years, his best average for a day has been 28 seconds per unit. In part he tries to improve his performance to earn a bonus and the respect of his supervisors. But most often he does not even let on to others that he is ahead and lets his success pass unnoticed. It is enough to know that he can do it, because when he is working at top performance the experience is so enthralling that it is almost painful for him to slow down. It's better than anything else, Raiko says. It's a whole lot better. Mehali CS Exent Mehali 39 Than watching TV. Raiko knows that very soon he will reach the limit beyond which he will no longer be able to improve his performance at his job. So twice a week he takes evening courses in electronics. When he has his diploma he will seek a more complex job, one that presumably he will confront with the same enthusiasm he has shown so far. 
For Pam Davis it is much easier to achieve this harmonious, effortless state when she works. As a young lawyer in a small partnership, she is fortunate to be involved in complex, challenging cases. She spends hours in the library, chasing down references and outlining possible courses of action for the senior partners of the firm to follow. Often her concentration is so intense that she forgets to have lunch, and by the time she realizes that she is hungry it is dark outside. While she is immersed in her job every piece of information fits, even when she is temporarily frustrated, she knows what causes the frustration, and she believes that eventually the obstacle can be overcome. These examples illustrate what we mean by optimal experience. They are situations in which attention can be freely invested to achieve a person's goals, because there is no disorder to straighten out, no threat for the self to defend against. We have called it take the flow experience, because this is the term many of the people we interviewed had used in their descriptions of how it felt to be in top form, it was like floating, I was carried on by the flow. It is the opposite of psychic entropy, in fact, it is sometimes called gentropy, and those who attain it develop a stronger, more confident self, because more of their psychic energy has been invested successfully in goals they themselves had chosen to pursue. When a person is able to organize his or her consciousness so as to experience flow as often as possible, the quality of life is inevitably going to improve, because, as in the case of Raiko and Pam, even the usually boring routines of work become purposeful and enjoyable. In flow we are in control of our psychic energy, and everything we do adds order to consciousness. One of our respondents, a well-known West Coast rock climber, explains concisely the tie between the avocation that gives him a profound sense of flow and the rest of his life, it's exhilarating to come closer and closer to self-discipline. You make your body go and everything hurts, then you look back in or at the self, at what you have done, it just blows your mind. It leads to ecstasy, to self-fulfillment. If you win these battles enough, that battle against yourself, at least for a moment, it becomes easier to win the battles in the world. The battle is not really against the self, but against the entropy that brings disorder to consciousness. It is really a battle for the self, it. 40 flow is a struggle for establishing control over attention. The struggle does not necessarily have to be physical, as in the case of the climber. But anyone who has experienced flow knows that the deep enjoyment it provides requires an equal degree of discipline concentration, complexity and the growth of the self. Following a flow experience, the organization of the self is more complex than it had been before. It is by becoming increasingly complex that the self might be said to grow. Complexity is the result of two broad psychological processes, differentiation and integration. Differentiation implies a movement toward uniqueness, toward separating oneself from others. Integration refers to its opposite, a union with other people, with ideas and entities beyond the self. A complex self is one that succeeds in combining these opposite tendencies. The self becomes more differentiated as a result of flow because overcome ing a challenge inevitably leaves a person feeling more capable, more skilled. As the rock climber said, you look back in or at the self, at what you have done, it just blows your mind. After each episode of flow a person becomes more a unique individual, less predictable, possessed of rarer skills. Complexity is often thought to have a negative meaning, synonymous with difficulty and confusion. That may be true, but only if we equate it with differentiation alone. Yet complexity also involves a second dimension, the integration of autonomous parts. A complex engine, for instance, not only has many separate components, each performing a different function, but also demonstrates a high sensitivity because each of the components is in touch with all the others. Without integration, a differentiated system would be a confusing mess. Flow helps to integrate the self because in that state of deep concentration consciousness is unusually well ordered. Thoughts, intentions, feelings, 
and all the senses are focused on the same goal. Experience is in harmony. And when the flow episode is over, one feels more, together, than before, not only internally but also with respect to other people and to the world in general. In the words of the climber whom we quoted earlier, there's no place that more draws the best from human beings than a mountain. Hearing situation. Nobody hassles you to put your mind and body under tremendous stress to get to the top. Your comrades are there, but you all feel the same way anyway, you are all in it together. Who can you trust more in the twain? Mehali Sikhs and Mehali 41 Tilth century than these people. People after the same self-discipline as yourself, following the deeper commitment. A bond like that with other people is in itself an ecstasy. A self that is only differentiated, not integrated, may attain great individual accomplishments, but risks being mired in self-centered egotism. By the same token, a person whose self is based exclusively on integration will be connected and secure, but lack autonomous individuality. Only when a person invests equal amounts of psychic energy in these two processes and avoids both selfishness and conformity is the self likely to reflect complexity. The self becomes complex as a result of experiencing flow. Paradoxically, it is when we act free, for the sake of the action itself rather than for old career motives, that we learn to become more than what we were. When we choose a goal and invest ourselves in it to the limits of our concentration, whatever we do will be enjoyable. And once we have tasted this joy, we will redouble our efforts to taste it again. This is the way the self grows. It is the way Raiko was able to draw so much out of his ostensibly boring job on the assembly line, or off from his poetry. It is the way he overcame her disease to become an influential scholar and a powerful executive. Flow is important both because it makes the present instant more enjoyable, and because it builds the self-confidence that allows us to develop skills and make significant contributions to humankind. The rest of this volume will explore more thoroughly what we know about optimal experiences, how they feel and under what conditions they occur. Even though there is no easy shortcut to flow, it is possible, if one understands how it works, to transform life, to create more harm in it and to liberate the psychic energy that otherwise would be wasted in boredom or worry. 42 Flow 3. Enjoyment and the quality of life there are two main strategies we can adopt to improve the quality of life the first is to try making external conditions match our goals the second is to change how we experience external conditions to make them fit our goal better for instance feeling secure is an important component of happiness the sense of security can be improved by buying a gun installing strong locks on the front door moving to a safer neighborhood, exerting political pressure on city hall for more police protection, or helping the community to become more conscious of the importance of civil order. All these different responses are aimed at bringing conditions in the environment more in line with our goals. The other method by which we can feel more secure involves modifying what we mean by security. If one does not expect perfect safety, recognizes that risks are inevitable, and succeeds in enjoying a less than ideally predictable world, the threat of insecurity will not have as great a chance of marrying happiness. Neither of these strategies is effective when used alone. Changing external conditions might seem to work at first, but if a person is not in control of his consciousness, the old fears or desires will soon return, reviving previous anxieties. One cannot create a complete sense of inner security even by buying one's own Caribbean island and surrounding it with armed bodyguards and attack dogs. The myth of King Midas well illustrates the point that controlling. 43. External conditions does not necessarily improve existence. Like most people, King Midas supposed that if he were to become immensely rich, his happiness would be ash. So he made a pact with the gods who after much haggling granted his wish that everything he touched would turn into gold. King Midas thought he had made an absolutely first-rate deal. 
nothing was to prevent him now from becoming the richest, and therefore the happiest, man in the world. But we know how the story ends. Midas soon came to regret his bargain because the food in his mouth and the wine on his palate turned to gold before he could swallow them, and so he died surrounded by golden plates and golden cups. The old fable continues to echo down the centuries. The waiting rooms of psychiatrists are filled with rich and successful patients who, in their 40s or 50s, suddenly wake up to the fact that a plush suburban home, expensive cars, and even an Ivy League education are not enough to bring peace of mind. Yet people keep hoping that changing the external conditions of their lives will provide a solution. If only they could earn more money, be in better physical shape, or have a more understanding partner, they would really have it made. Even though we recognize that material successes may not bring happiness, we engage in an endless struggle to reach external goals, expecting they will improve life. Wealth, status, and power have become in our culture all too powerful symbols of happiness. When we see people who are rich, famous, or good-looking, we tend to assume that their lives are rewarding, even though all the evidence might point to their being miserable. And we assume that if only we could acquire some of those same symbols, we would be much happier. If we do actually succeed in becoming richer, or more powerful, we believe, at least for a time, that life as a whole has improved. But symbols can be deceptive, they have a tendency to distract from the reality they are supposed to represent. And the reality is that the quality of life does not depend directly on what others think of us or on what we own. The bottom line is, rather, how we feel about ourselves and about what happens to us. To improve life one must improve quality of experience. This is not to say that money, physical fitness, or aim are irrelevant to happiness. They can be genuine blessings, but only if they help to make us feel better. Otherwise they are at best neutral, at worst obstacles to a reward ing life. Research on happiness and life satisfaction suggests that in general there is a mild correlation between wealth and well-being. People in economically more affluent countries, including the 44th low United States, tend to rate themselves as being on the whole more happy than people in less affluent countries. Ed Diana, a researcher from the University of Illinois, found that very wealthy persons report being happy on the average 77% of the time, while persons of average say they are happy only 62% of the time. This difference, while statistically significant, is not very large, especially considering that the very wealthy group was selected from a list of the 400 richest Americans. It is also interesting to note that not one respondent in Diana's study believed that money by itself guaranteed happiness. The majority agreed with the statement, money can increase or decrease happiness, depending on how it is used. In an earlier study, Norman Bradburn found that the highest income group reported being happy about 25% more often than the lowest. Again, the difference was present, but it was not very large. In a comprehensive survey entitled The Quality of American Life published a decade ago, the heirs report that a person's financial situation is one of the least important factors affecting overall satisfaction with life. Given these observations, instead of worrying about how to make a million dollars or how to win friends and influence people, it seems more beneficial to find out how everyday life can be made more harmonious and more satisfying, and thus achieve by a direct route what cannot be reached through the pursuit of symbolic goals. Pleasure and enjoyment. When considering the kind of experience that makes life better, most people first think that happiness consists in experiencing pleasure, good food, good sex, all the comforts that money can buy. We imagine the satisfaction of traveling to exotic places or being surrounded by interesting company and expensive gadgets. If we cannot afford those goals that slay comma chulls and colorful ads keep reminding us to pursue, then we are happy to settle for a quiet evening in front of the television set with a glass of liquor close by. 
Pleasure is a feeling of contentment that one achieves whenever information in consciousness says that expectations set by biological programs or by social conditioning have been met. The taste of food when we are hungry is pleasant because it reduces a physiological imbalance. Resting in the evening while passively absorbing information from the media, with alcohol or drugs to dull the mind overexcited by the demands of work, is pleasantly relaxing. Traveling to Acapulco is pleasant because the stimulant ING novelty restores our palate jaded by the Mehali CSX and Mehali 45 Repetitive routines of everyday life and because we know that this is how the beautiful people also spend their time Pleasure is an important component of the quality of life but by itself it does not bring happiness Sleep, rest, food and sex provide restorative homostatic excellences that return consciousness to order after the needs of the body intrude and cause psychic entropy to occur. But they do not produce psychological growth. They do not add complexity to the self. Pleasure helps to maintain order, by itself cannot create new order in consciousness. When people ponder further about what makes their lives rewarding, they tend to move beyond pleasant memories and begin to remember other events other experiences that overlap with pleasurable ones but fall into a category that deserves a separate name, enjoyment. Enjoyable events occur when a person has not only met some prior expectation or satisfied a need or a desire but also gone beyond what he or she has been pro programmed to do and achieved something unexpected, perhaps something even imagined before. Enjoyment is characterized by this forward movement, by a sense of novelty, of accomplishment. Playing a close game of tennis that stretches one's ability is enjoyable, as is reading a book that reveals things in a new light, as is having a conversation that leads us to express ideas we didn't know we had. Closing a contested business deal, or any piece of work well done, is enjoyable. None of these experiences may be particularly pleasurable at the time they are taking place, but afterward we think back on them and say, that really was fun and wish they would happen again. After an enjoyable event we know that we have changed, that our self has grown, in some respect, we have become more complex as a result of it. Experiences that give pleasure can also give enjoyment, but the two situations are quite different. For instance, everybody takes pleasure in eating. To enjoy a food, however, is more difficult. A gourmet enjoys eating. As anyone who pays enough attention to a meal so as to discriminate the various sensations provided by it. As this example suggests, we can experience pleasure without any investment of psychic energy, whereas enjoyment happens only as a result of unusual investments of attention. A person can feel pleasure without any effort, if the appropriate centers in his brain are electrically stimulated, or as a result of the chemical stimulation of drugs. But it is impossible to enjoy a tennis game, a book, or a conversation unless attention is fully concentrated on the activity. It is for this reason that pleasure is so evanescent, and that the self. 46 Flow does not grow in consequence of pleasurable experiences. Complexity requires investing psychic energy in goals that are new, that are relatively challenging. It is easy to see this process in children, during the first few years of life every child is a little, learning machine, trying out new movements, new work daily. The rapt concentration on the child's face as she learns each new skill is a good indication of what enjoyment is about. And each instance of enjoyable learning adds to the complexity of the child's developing self. Unfortunately, this natural connection between growth and enjoyment tends to disappear with time. Perhaps because, learning, becomes an external imposition when schooling starts, the excitement of mastering new skills gradually wears out. It becomes all too easy to settle down within the narrow boundaries of the self developed in adolescence. But if one gets to be too complacent, feeling that psychic energy invested in new directions 
is wasted unless there is a good chance of reaping extrinsic rewards for it. One may end up no longer enjoying life, and pleasure becomes the only source of positive experience. On the other hand many individuals continue to go to great lengths to preserve enjoyment in whatever they do. I used to know an old man in one of the decrepit suburbs of Naples who made a precarious living out of a ramshackle antique store his family owned for generations. One morning a prosperous looking American lady walked into the store, and after looking around for a while, asked the price of a pair of baroque wooden putty, those chubby little cherubs so dear to Neapolitan craftsmen of a few centuries ago, and to their contemporary imitators. Signor Orsini, the owner, quoted an exorbitant price. The woman took out her folder of traveler's checks, ready to pay for the dubious artifacts. I held my breath, glad for the unexpected windfall about to reach my friend. But I didn't know Signor Orsini well enough. He turned purple and with barely con. Thined agitation escorted the customer out of the store. No, no, Signora, I. I'm sorry but I cannot sell you those angels. To the flabbergasted woman he kept repeating, I cannot make business with you. You understand. After the tourist finally left, he calmed down and explained, if I were starving, I would have taken her money. But since I am not, why should I make a deal that isn't any fun? I enjoy the clash of wits involved in bargain I and she, when two persons try to outdo each other with ruses and with eloquence. She didn't even flinch. She didn't know any better. She didn't pay me the respect of assuming that I was going to try to take advantage of her. If I had sold those pieces to that woman at that ridiculous price, I would have felt cheated. Few people, in southern Italy or elsewhere, have this strange. Mehali CSX Zent Mehali 47 Attitude towards business transactions But then I suspect that they don't enjoy their work as much as Signor Orsini did, either. Without enjoyment life can be endured, and it can even be pleasant. But it can so only precariously, depending on luck and the cooperation of the external environment. To gain personal control over the quality of experience, however, one needs to learn how to build enjoyment into what happens day in, day out. The rest of this chapter provides an overview of what makes experience enjoyable. This description is based on long interviews, questionnaires, and other data collected over a dozen years from several thousand respondents. Initially we interviewed only people who spent a great amount of time and effort in activities that were difficult, yet provided no obvious rewards, such as money or prestige, rock climbers, composers of music, chess players, amateur athletes. Our later studies included interviews with ordinary people, leading ordinary existences. We asked them to describe how it felt when their lives were at their fullest, when what they did was most enjoyable. These people included urban Americans, surgeons, professors, clerical and assembly line workers, young mothers, retired people, and teenagers. They also included respondents from Korea, Japan, Thailand, Australia, various European cultures, and Anavazor reservation. On the basis of these interviews we can now describe what makes an experience enjoyable, and thus provide examples that all of us can use to enhance the quality of life. The Elements of Enjoyment The first surprise we encountered in our study was how similarly very different activities were described when they were going especially well. Apparently the way a long-distance swimmer felt when crossing the English Channel was almost identical to the way a chess player felt during a tournament or a climber dressing up a difficult rock face. All these feelings were shared, in important respects, by subjects ranging from musicians composing a new quartet to teenagers from the ghetto involved in a championship basketball game. The second surprise was that, regardless of culture, stage of modernization, social class, age, or gender, the respondents described enjoyment in very much the same way. What they did to experience enjoyment varied enormously, the elderly Koreans liked to meditate, 
the teenage Japanese liked to swarm around in motorcycle gangs, but they described how it felt when they enjoyed themselves in almost identical. 48 Flow Terms Moreover, the reasons the activity was enjoyed shared many more similarities than differences. In sum, optimal experience and the psychological conditions that make it possible seem to be the same the world over. As our studies have suggested, the phenomenology of enjoyment has eight components. When people reflect on how it feels when their experience is most positive, they mention at least one, and often all, of the following. First, the experience usually occurs when we confront tasks we have a chance of completing. Second, we must be able to concentrate on what we are doing. Third and fourth, the concentration is usually possible because the task undertaken has clear goals and provides immediate feedback. Fifth, one acts with a deep but effortless involvement that removes from awareness the worries and frustrations of everyday life. Sixth, enjoyable experiences allow people to exercise a sense of control over their actions. Seventh, concern for the self disappears, yet paradoxically sense of self emerges stronger after the flow experience is over. Finally, the sense of the duration of time is altered, hours pass by in minutes, and minutes can stretch out to seem like hours. The combination of all these elements causes a sense of deep enjoyment that is so rewarding people feel that expending a great deal of energy is worthwhile simply to be able to feel it. We shall take a closer look at each of these elements so that we may better understand what makes enjoyable activities so gratifying. With this knowledge, it is possible to achieve control of consciousness and turn even the most humdrum moments of everyday lives into events that help the self grow. A challenging activity that requires skills. Sometimes a person reports having an experience of extreme joy, a feeling of ecstasy for no apparent good reason, a bar haunting music may trigger it, or a wonderful view, or even less, just a spontaneous sense of well-being. But by far the overwhelming proportion of optimal experiences are reported to occur within sequences of activities that are goal-directed and bounded by rules, activities that require the investment of psychic energy, and that could not be done without the appropriate skills. Why this should be so will become clear as we go along. At this point it is sufficient to note that this seems to be universally the case. It is important to clarify at the outset that an activity need not be active in the physical sense, and the skill necessary to engage in it need not be a physical skill. For instance, one of the most frequently mentioned enjoyable activities the world over is reading. Reading is an Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 49 activity because it requires the concentration of attention and has a goal, and to do it one must know the rules of written language. The skills involved in reading include not only literacy but also the ability to translate words into images, to empathize with fictional characters, to recognize historical and cultural contexts, to anticipate turns of the plot, to criticize and evaluate the author's style, and so on. In this broader sense, any capacity to manipulate symbolic information is a skill, such as the skill of the mathematician to shape quantitative relationships in his head, or the skill of a musician in combining musical notes. Another universally enjoyable activity is being with other people. Socializing might at first sight appear to be an exception to the statement that one needs to use skills to enjoy an activity for it does not seem that gossip ing or joking around with another person requires particular abilities. But, of course, it does, as so many shy people know, if a person feels self con says, he or she will dread establishing informal contacts, and avoid company whenever possible. Any activity contains a bundle of opportunities for action, or, challenges, they require appropriate skills to realize. For those who don't have the right skills, the activity is not challenging, it is simply meaningless. Setting up a chessboard gets the juice of a chess player flowing, but leaves cold anyone who does not know the rules of the game. To most people, 
the sheer wall of El Capitan in Yosemite Valley is just a huge chunk of featureless rock. But to the climber it is an arena offering an endlessly complex symphony of mental and physical challenges. One simple way to find challenges is to enter a competitive situation. Hence the great appeal of all games and sports that pit a person or team against another. In many ways, competition is a quick way of developing complexity, he who wrestles with us, wrote Man Burke, strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill. Our antagonist is our helper. The challenges of competition can be stimulating and enjoyable. But when beating the opponent takes precedence in the mind over performing as well as possible, enjoyment tends to disappear. Competition is enjoyable only when it is a means to perfect one's skills, when it becomes an end in itself, it ceases to be. But challenges are by no means confined to competitive or to physical activities. They are necessary to provide enjoyment even in situations where one would not expect them to be relevant. For example, here is a quote from one of our studies, of a statement made by an art expert describing the enjoyment he takes in looking at a painting, something most people would regard as an immediate, intuitive process. 50 Flow A lot of pieces that you deal with are very straightforward, and you don't find anything exciting about them, you know, but there are other pieces that have some sort of challenge. Those are the pieces that stay in your mind, that are the most interesting. In other words, even the passive enjoyment one gets from looking at a painting or sculpture depends on the challenges that the work of art contains. Activities that provide enjoyment are often those that have been designed for this very purpose. Games, sports, and artistic and literary forms were developed over the centuries for the express purpose of enriching life with enjoyable experiences. But it would be a mistake to assume that only art and leisure can provide optimal experiences. In a healthy culture, productive work and the necessary routines of everyday life are also satisfying. In fact, one purpose of this book is to explore ways in which even routine details can be transformed into personally meaningful games that provide optimal experiences. Mowing the lawn or waiting in a dentist's office can become enjoyable provided one restructures the activity by providing goals, rules, and the other elements of enjoyment to be reviewed below. Heinz Melibnitz, the famous German experimental physicist and a descendant of the 18th century philosopher and mathematician, provides an intriguing example of how one can take control of a boring situation and turn it into a mildly enjoyable one. Professor Melibnitz suffers from an occupational handicap common to academicians, having to sit through endless, often boring conferences. To alleviate this burden he invented a private activity that provides just enough challenges for him not to be completely bored during a dull lecture, but is so automated that it leaves enough attention free so that if something interesting is being said, it will register in his awareness. What he does is this, whenever a speaker begins to get tedious, he starts to tap his right thumb once, then the third finger of the right hand, then the index, then the fourth finger, then the third finger again, then the little finger of the right hand. Then he moves to the left hand and taps the little finger, the middle finger, the fourth finger, the index, and the middle finger again, and ends with the thumb of the left hand. Then the right hand reverses the sequence of fingering, followed by the reverse of the left hand's sequence. It turns out that by introducing full and half stops at regular intervals, there are 888 combinations one can move through without repeating the same pattern. By interspersing pauses among the taps at regular intervals, the pattern acquires an almost musical harmony, and in fact it is easily represented on a musical staff. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 51 After inventing this innocent game, Professor Melibnitz found an interesting use for it, as a way of measuring the length of trains of thought. The pattern of 880 taps, repeated three times, provides a set of 2664 taps that, with practice, takes almost exactly 12 minutes to perform. As soon as he starts tapping, by shifting attention to his fingers, 
Professor Melibnitz can tell exactly at what point he is in the sequence. So suppose that a thought concerning one of his physics experiments appears in his consciousness while he is tapping during a boring lecture. He immediately shifts attention to his fingers, and registers the fact that he is at the 300th tap of the second series, then in the same split second he returns to the train of thought about the experiment. At a certain point the thought is completed, and he has figured out the problem. How long did it take him to solve the problem? By shifting attention back to his fingers, he notices that he is about to finish second series, the thought process has taken approximately two and a quarter minutes to play itself out. Few people bother inventing quite such ingenious and complex diverse science to improve the quality of their experiences. But all of us have more modest versions of the same. Everybody develops routines to fill in the boring gaps of the day, or to bring experience back on an even keel when anxiety threatens. Some people are compulsive doodlers, others chew on things or smoke, smooth their hair, hum a tune, or engage in more esoteric private rituals that have the same purpose, to impose order in consciousness through the performance of patterned action. These are the microflow activities that help us negotiate the doldrums of the day. But how enjoyable an activity is depends ultimately on its complexity. The small automatic games woven into the fabric of everyday life help reduce boredom, but add little to the positive quality of experience. For that one needs to face more demanding challenges and use higher level skills. In all the activities people in our study reported engaging in, enjoyment comes at a very specific point, whenever the opportunities for action perceived by the individual are equal to his or her capabilities. Playing tennis, for instance, is enjoyable if the two opponents are mismatched. The less skilled player will feel anxious, and the better player will feel bored. The same is true of every other activity, a piece of music that is too simple relative to one's listening skills will be boring, while music that is too complex will be frustrating. Enjoyment appears at the boundary between boredom and anxiety, when the challenges are just balanced with the person's capacity to act. The golden ratio between challenges and skills does not only hold. 52 Flow True for human activities Whenever I took our hunting dog, Hazar, for a walk in the open fields he liked to play a very simple game, the prototype of the most culturally widespread game of human children, escape and pursue it. He would run circles around me at top speed, with his tongue hanging out and his eyes warily watching every move I made, daring me to catch him. Occasionally I would take a lunge, and if I was lucky I got to touch him. Now the interesting part is that whenever I was tired, moved half-heartedly, Hazar would run much tighter circles, making it relatively easy for me to catch him. On the other hand, if I was in good shape and willing to extend myself, he would enlarge the diameter of his circle. In this way, the difficulty of the games kept constant. With an uncanny sense for the fine balancing of challenges and skills, he would make sure that the game would yield the maximum of enjoyment for us both. The merging of action and awareness. When all a person's relevant skills are needed to cope with the challenges of a situation, that person's attention is completely absorbed by the activity. There is no excess psychic energy left over to process any information but what the activity offers. All the attention is concentrated on the relevant stimuli. As a result, one of the most universal and distinctive features of optimal experience takes place, people become so involved in what they are doing that the activity becomes spontaneous, almost automatic. They stop being aware of themselves as separate from the actions they are performing. A dancer describes how it feels when a performance is going well, your concentration is very complete. Your mind isn't wandering, you are not thinking of something else, you are totally involved in what you are do ing. Your energy is flowing very smoothly. You feel relaxed, comfortable, and energetic. A rock climber explains how it feels when he is scaling a mountain. You are so involved in what you are doing, that you aren't thinking of yourself.
as separate from the immediate activity. You don't see yourself as separate from what you are doing. A mother who enjoys the time spent with her small daughter, her reading is the one thing that she's really into, and we read together. She reads to me, and I read to her, and that's a time when I sort of lose touch with the rest of the world, I'm totally absorbed in what I'm doing. A chess player tells of playing in a tournament, the concentra. Mehali CSEZ Mehali 53 Shun is like breathing, you never think of it. The roof could fall in and, if it missed you, you would be unaware of it. It is for this reason that we call the optimal experience, flow. The short and simple word describes well the sense of seemingly effortless movement. The following words from a poet and rock climber apply to all the thousands of interviews collected by us and by others over the years. The mystique of rock climbing is climbing. You get to the top of a rock glad it's over but really wish it would go on forever. The justification, climbing is climbing. Like the justification of poetry is writing. You don't conquer anything except things in yourself. The act of writing justifies poetry. Climbing is the same, recognizing that you are a flow. The purpose of the flow is to keep on flowing, not looking for a peak or utopia but staying in the flow. It is not a moving up but a continuous flowing, you. Move up to keep the flow going. There is no possible reason for climbing. Except the climbing itself, it is a self-communication. Although the flow experience appears to be effortless, it is far from being so. It often requires strenuous physical exertion, or high disciplined mental activity. It does not happen without the application of skilled performance. Any lapse in concentration will erase it. And yet while it lusts consciousness works smoothly, action follows action seamlessly. In normal life, we keep interrupting what we do with doubts and questions. Why am I doing this? Should I perhaps be doing something else? Repeatedly we question the necessity of our actions, and evaluate critically the reasons for carrying them out. But if so there is no need to reflect, because the action carries us forward as if by magic. Clear goals and feedback. The reason it is possible to achieve such complete involvement in a flow experience is that goals are usually clear, and feedback immediate. A tennis player always knows what she has to do, return the ball into the opponent's court. And each time she hits the ball she knows whether she has done well or not. The chess player's goals are equally obvious, to make the OP opponent's king before his own is mated. With each move, he can calculate whether he has come closer to this objective. The climber inching up a vertical wall of rock has a very simple goal in mind, to complete the climb without failing. Every second, hour after hour, he receives information that he is meeting that basic goal. Of course, if one chooses a trivial goal, success in it does not provide enjoyment. If I set as my goal to remain alive while sitting on the living room sofa, I also could spend days knowing that I was achieved. 54 Flow ING it, just as the rock climber does. But this realization would not make me particularly happy, whereas the climber's knowledge brings exhilaration to his dangerous ascent. Certain activities require a very long time to accomplish, yet the components of goals and feedback are still extremely important to them. One example was given by a 62-year-old woman living in the Italian Alps, who said her most enjoyable experiences were taking care of the cows and tending the orchard. I find special satisfaction in caring for the plants, I like to see them grow by day. It is very beautiful. Although it involves a period of patient waiting, seeing the plants one has cared for grow provides a powerful feedback even in the urban apartments of American cities. Another example is solo ocean cruising, in which a person alone might sail for weeks in a small boat without seeing land. Jim Macbeth, who did. A study of flow in ocean cruising, comments on the excitement a sailor feels. When, after days of anxiously scanning the empty reaches of water, he discerns the outline of the island he had been aiming for as it starts to rise over the horizon. One of the legendary cruisers describes this sensation as follows, I, 
experienced a sense of satisfaction coupled with some astonishment that my observations of the very distant sun from an unsteady platform and the use of some simple tables enable d a small island to be found with certainty after an ocean crossing and another each time i feel the same mixture of astonishment love and pride as this new land is born which seems to have been created for me and by me the goals of an activity are not always as clear as those of tennis and the feedback is often more ambiguous than the simple i am not falling information processed by the climber a composer of music for instance may know that he wishes to write a song or a flute concerto but other than that his goals are usually quite vague and how does he know whether the notes he is writing down are right or wrong the same situation holds true for the artist painting a picture and for all activities that are creative or open ended in nature but these are all exceptions that prove the rule unless a person learns to set goals and to recognize and gauge feedback in such activities she will not enjoy them in some creative activities where goals are not clearly set in advance a person must develop a strong personal sense of what she intends to do the artist might not have a visual image of what the finished painting should look like but when the picture has progressed to a certain point she should know whether this is what she wanted to mehali csc sent mehali 55 achieve or not and a painter who enjoys painting must have internalized criteria for good or bad so that after each brush stroke she can say yes this works no this doesn't without such internal guidelines it is impossible to experience flow sometimes the goals and the rules governing an activity are invented or negotiated on the spot for example teenagers enjoy impromptu interactions in which they try to gross each other out or tell tall stories or make fun of their teachers the goal of such sessions emerges by trial and error and is rarely made explicit often it remains below the participants level of awareness yet it is clear that these activities develop their own rules and that those who take part have a clear idea of what constitutes a successful move and of who is doing well in many ways this is the pattern of a good jazz band or any improvisational group scholars or day waiters obtain similar satisfaction when the moves in their arguments mesh smoothly and produce the desired result what constitutes feedback varies considerably in different activities some people are indifferent to things that others cannot get enough of for instance surgeons who love doing operations claim that they wouldn't switch to internal medicine even if they were paid 10 times as much as they are for doing surgery because an internist never knows exactly how well he is doing in an operation on the other hand the status of the patient is almost always clear as long as there is no blood in the incision for example a specific procedure has been successful when the diseased organ is cut out the surgeon's task is accomplished after that there is the suture that gives a gratifying sense of closure to the activity and the surgeon's disdain for psychiatry is even greater than that for internal medicine to hear surgeons talk the psychiatrist might spend 10 years with the patient without knowing whether that cure is helping him yet the psychiatrist who enjoys his trade is also receiving constant feedback the way the patient holds himself the expression on his face the hesitation in his voice the content of the material he brings up in the therapeutic are all these bits of information are important clues the psychiatrist uses to monitor the progress of the therapy the difference between a surgeon and a psychiatrist is that the former considers blood and excision the only feedback worth attending to whereas the latter considers the signals reflecting a patient's state of mind to be significant information The surgeon judges the psychiatrist to be soft because he is interested in such ephemeral goals. The psychiatrist thinks the surgeon crude for his concentration on mechanics. 56 flow. The kind of feedback we work toward is in and of itself often unimportant. What difference does it make if I hit the tennis ball between the white lines, if I immobilize the enemy king on the chessboard, 
or if I notice a glimmer of understanding in my patient's eyes at the end of the therapeutic hour. What makes this information valuable is the symbolic message it contains, that I have succeeded in my goal. Such knowledge creates order in consciousness, and strengthens the structure of the self. Almost any kind of feedback can be enjoyable, provided it is equally related to a goal in which one has invested psychic energy. If I were to set myself up to balance a walking stick on my nose, then the sight of the stick wobbling upright above my face would provide a brief enjoyable interlude. But each of us is temperamentally sensitive to a certain range of information that we learn to value more than most other people do, and it is likely that we will consider feedback involving that information to be more relevant than others might. For instance, some people are born with exceptional sensitivity to sound. They can discriminate among different tones and pitches, and recognize and remember combinations of sounds better than the general population. It is likely that such individuals will be attracted to playing with sounds. They will learn to control and shape auditory information. For them the most important feedback will consist in being able to combine sounds, to produce or reproduce rhythms and melodies. Composers, singers, performers, conductors, and music critics will develop from among them. In contrast, some are ethically predisposed to be unusually sensitive to other people, and they will learn to pay attention to the signals they send out. The feedback they will be looking for is the expression of human emotion. Some people have fragile selves that need constant reassurance, and for them the only information that counts is winning in a competitive situation. Others have invested so much in being liked that the only feed back they take into account is approval and admiration. A good illustration of the importance of feedback is contained in the responses of a group of blind religious women interviewed by Professor Fostu Massimini's team of psychologists in Milan, Italy. Like the other respondents in our studies, they were asked to describe the most enjoyable experiences in their lives. For these women, many of whom had been sightless since birth, the most frequently mentioned flow experiences were the result of reading books in breath, praying, doing handicrafts like knitting and binding books, and helping each other in case of sickness or other need. Of the over 600 people inter. Mehali CSX and Mehali 57. Viewed by the Italian team, these blind women stressed more than any even else the importance of receiving clear feedback as a condition for enjoying whatever they were doing. Unable to see what was going on around them, they needed to know even more than sighted people whether what they were trying to accomplish was actually coming to pass. Concentration on the task at hand. One of the most frequently mentioned dimensions of the flow experience is that, while it lasts, one is able to forget all the unpleasant aspects of life. This feature of flow is an important byproduct of the fact that enjoyable activities require a complete focusing of attention on the task at hand, thus leaving no room in the mind for irrelevant information. In normal everyday existence, we are the prey of thoughts and worries intruding unwanted in consciousness. Because most jobs, and home life in general, lack the pressing demands of flow experiences, concentration is rarely so intense that preoccupations and anxieties can be automatically ruled out. Consequently the ordinary state of mind involved unexpected and frequent episodes of entropy interfering with the smooth run of psychic energy. This is one reason why flow improves the quality of experience, the clearly structured demands of the activity impose order, and exclude the interference of disorder in consciousness. A professor of physics who was an avid rock climber described his state of mind while climbing as all lows, it is as if my memory input has been cut off. All I can remember is the last 30 seconds, and all I can think ahead is the next 5 minutes. In fact, any activity that requires concentration has a similarly narrow window of time. But it is not only the temporal focus that counts. What is even more significant is that only a very select range of information can be allowed into awareness. Therefore all the troubling thoughts that ordinarily keep passing through the mind are temporarily kept in abeyance. As a young basketball player explains, the court, 
that's all that matters. Sometimes out on the court I think of a problem, like fighting with my steady girl, and I think that's nothing compared to the game. You can think about a problem all day but as soon as you get in the game, the hell with it. And another. Kids my age, they think a lot, but when you are playing basketball, that's all there is on your mind, just basketball. Everything seems to follow right along. A mountainier expands on the same theme, when you are climbing, you are not aware of other problematic life situations. It 58 flow becomes a world unto its own, significant only to itself. It's a concentration thing. Once you are into the situation, it's incredibly real, and you are very much in charge of it. It becomes your total world. A similar scene is reported by a dancer. I get a feeling that I don't get anywhere else. I have more confidence in myself than any other time. Maybe an effort to forget my problems. Dance is like therapy. If I am troubled about something, I leave it out of the door as I go in, the dance studio, bought. On a larger time scale, ocean cruising provides an equivalent merciful oblivion, but no matter how many little discomforts there may be at sea, once real cares and worries seem to drop out of sight as the land slips behind the horizon. Once we were at sea there was no point in worrying, there was nothing we could do about our problems till we reached the next port. Life was, for a while, stripped of its artificialities, other problems seemed quite unimportant compared with the state of the wind and the sea and the length of the day's run. Edwin Moses, the great hurdler, has this to say in describing the concentration necessary for a race, your mind has to be absolutely clear. The fact that you have to cope with your opponent, jet lag, different foods, sleeping in hotels, and personal problems has to be erased from consciousness, as if they didn't exist. Although Moses was talking about what it takes to win world-class sports events, he could have been describing the kind of concentration we achieve when we enjoy any activity. The concentration of the flow experience, together with clear goals and immediate feedback, provides order to consciousness, inducing the enjoyable condition of psychic negentropy. The Paradox of Control Enjoyment often occurs in games, sports, and other leisure activities that are distinct from ordinary life, where any number of bad things can happen. If a person loses a chess game or botches his hobby, he need not worry, in real life. However, a person who mishandles a business deal may get fired, lose the mortgage on the house, and end up on public assistance. Thus the flow experience is typically described as involving a sense of control, or, more precisely, as lacking the sense of worry about losing control that is typical in many situations of normal life. Here is how a dancer expresses this dimension of the flow experience, a strong relaxation and calmness comes over me. I have no worries of failure. What a powerful and warm feeling it is. I want to expand, to hug the world. I feel enormous power to if something off. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 59 grace and beauty. And a chess player, I have a general feeling of well-being, and that I am in complete control of my world. What these responses are actually describing is the possibility, rather than the actuality, of control. The ballet dancer may fall, break her leg, and never make the perfect turn, and the chess player may be defeated and never become a champion. But at least in principle, in the world of flow perfection is attainable. This sense of control is also reported in enjoyable activities that involve serious risks, activities that to an outsider would seem to be much more potentially dangerous than the affairs of normal life. People who practice hang gliding, spelunking, rock climbing, riskar driving, deep sea diving, and many similar sports for fun are purposefully placing themselves in situations that lack the safety nets of civilized life. Yet all these individuals report flow experiences in which a heightened sense of control plays an important part 
it is usual to explain the motivation of those who enjoy dangerous activities as some sort of pathological need. They are trying to exercise a deep-seated fear. They are compensating. They are compulsively reenacting an Oedipal fixation. They are sensation seekers. While such motives may be occasionally involved, what is most striking, when one actually speaks to specialists in risk, is how their enjoyment derives not from the danger itself, but from their ability to minimize it. So rather than a pathological thrill that comes from courting disaster, the positive emotion they enjoy is the perfectly healthy feeling of being able to control potentially dangerous forces. The important thing to realize here is that activities that produce flow experiences, even the seemingly most risky ones, are so constructed as to allow the practitioner to develop sufficient skills to reduce the margin of error to as close to zero as possible. Rock climbers, for instance, recognize two sets of dangers, objective and subjective ones. The first kind are the unpredictable physical events that might confront a person on the mountain, a sudden storm, an avalanche, a falling rock, a drastic drop in temperature. One can prepare oneself against these threats, but they can never be completely foreseen. Subjective dangers are those that arise from the climber's lack of skill, including the inability to estimate correctly the difficulty of a climb in relation to one's ability. The whole point of climbing is to avoid objective dangers as much as possible, and to eliminate subjective dangers entirely by rigorous discipline and sound preparation. As a result, climbers genuinely believe that climbing the Matagon is safer than crossing a street in Manhattan. Sixth Low Tan, where the objective dangers, taxi drivers, bicycle messengers, buses, muggers, are far less predictable than those on the mountain, and where personal skills have less chance to ensure the pedestrians safety. As this example illustrates, what people enjoy is not the sense of being in control, but the sense of exercising control in difficult situations. It is not possible to experience a feeling of control unless one is willing to give up the safety of proactive routines. Only when a doubtful outcome is at stake, and one is able to influence that outcome, can a person really know whether she is in control. One type of activity seems to constitute an exception. Games of chance are enjoyable, yet by definition they are based on random outcomes pre summary not affected by personal skills. The spin of a roulette wheel or the turn of a cup in blackjack cannot be controlled by the player. In this case, at least, a sense of control must be irrelevant to the experience of enjoyment. The objective conditions, however, happen to be deceptive, for it is actually the case that gamblers who enjoy games of hazard are subjectively convinced that their skills do play a major role in the outcome. In fact, they tend to stress the issue of control even more than practitioners of activities where skills obviously allow greater control. Poker players are convinced it is their ability, and not chance, that makes them win, if they lose they are much more inclined to credit bad luck, but even in defeat they are willing to look for a personal lapse to explain the outcome. Roulette players develop elaborate systems to predict the turn of the wheel. In general, players of games of chance often believe that they have the gift of seeing into the future, at least within the restricted set of goals and rules that defines their game. And this most ancient feeling of control, whose precursors include the rituals of divination so prevalent in every culture, is one of the greatest attractions the experience of gambling offers. This sense of being in a world where entropy is suspended explains in part why flow-producing activities can become so addictive. Novelists have often written on the theme of chess a metaphor for escape from reality. Vladimir Nabokov's short story, The Luchin Defense, describes a young chess genius so involved in the game that the rest of his life, his marriage, his friendships, his livelihood, is going by the boards. Luchin tries to cope with these problems, but he's unable to see them except in terms of chess situations. His wife is the White Queen, standing on the fifth square of the third file, threatened by the Black Bishop, who is Luchin's agent and so forth. 
in trying to solve. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 61. His personal conflicts Luchin turns to chess strategy and endeavors to invent the Luchin defense, a set of moves that will make him invulnerable to outside attacks. As his relationships in real life disintegrate, Luchin has a series of hallucinations in which the important people around him become pieces on a huge chessboard, trying to immobilize him. Finally, he has a vision of the perfect defense against his problems, and jumps out of the hotel window. Such stories about chess are not so far-fetched. Many champions, including the first and the last great American chess masters, Paul Morphy and Bob B. Fisher, became so comfortable with the beautifully clear-cut and logically ordered world of chess that they turned their backs on the messy confusion of the real world. The exhilaration gamblers feel in figuring out random chance is even more notorious. Early ethnographers have described North American Plains Indians so hypnotically involved in gambling with buffalo rib bones that losers would often leave the tepee without clothes in the dead of winter, having wagered away their weapons, hosts, and wives as well. Almost any enjoyable activity can become addictive, in the sense that instead of being a conscious choice, it becomes a necessity that interferes with other activities. Surgeons, for instance, describe operations as being addictive, like taking heroin. When a person becomes so dependent on the ability to control an enjoyable activity that he cannot pay attention to anything else, then he loses the ultimate control, the freedom to determine the content of consciousness. Thus enjoyable activities that produce flow have a potentially negative aspect, while they are capable of improving the quality of existence by creating order in the mind, they can become addictive, at which point the self becomes captive of a certain kind of order, and is then unwilling to cope with the ambiguities of life. The loss of self-consciousness We have seen earlier that when an activity is thoroughly engrossing, there is not enough attention left over to allow a person to consider either the past or the future, or any other temporarily irrelevant stimuli. One item that disappears from awareness deserves special mention, because in normal life we spend so much time thinking about it, our own self. Here is a climber describing this aspect of the experience, it's a zen feeling, like meditation or concentration. One thing you are after is the one-pointedness of mind. You can get your ego mixed up with climbing in all sorts of ways and it isn't necessarily entertaining. But when things become automatic, it's like an egoless thing, in a way. T2 flow. Somehow the right thing is done without you ever thinking about it or doing anything at all. It just happens. And yet you are more concentrated. Or, in the words of a famous long distance ocean cruiser, so one forgets oneself, one forgets everything, seeing only the play of the boat with the sea, the play of the sea around the boat, leaving aside everything not essential to that game. The loss of the sense of a self separate from the world around it is sometimes accompanied by a feeling of union with the environment, whether it is a mountain, a team, or, in the case of this member of a Japanese motorcycle gang, the run of hundreds of cycles roaring down the streets of Kyoto, I understand something, when all of our feelings get tuned up. When running, we are not in complete harmony at the start. But if the run begins to go well, all of us, all of us feel for the others. How can I say this, when our minds become one? At such a time, it's a real please. Your. When all of us become one, I understand something. All of a sudden I realize, oh, we are one, and think, if we speed as fast as we can, it will become a real run. When we realize that we become one flesh, it's supreme. When we get high on speed, at such a moment, it's really super. This, becoming one flesh, so vividly described by the Japanese teenager is a very real feature of the flow experience. Persons report feeling it as con as they feel relief from hunger or from pain. It is a greatly rewarding experience, but as we shall see later on, one that presents its own dangers. 
preoccupation with the self consumes psychic energy because in everyday life we often feel threatened. Whenever we are threatened we need to bring the image we have of ourselves back into awareness, so we can find out whether or not the threat is serious, and how we should meet it. For instance, if walking down the street I noticed some people turning back and looking at me with grins on their faces, the normal thing to do is imedi. Italy to start worrying, is there something wrong? Do I look funny? Is it the way I walk, or is my face smudged? Hundreds of times every day we are reminded of the vulnerability of ourselves. And every time this happens psychic energy is lost trying to restore order to consciousness. But in flow there is no room for self-scrutiny. Because enjoyable activities have clear goals, stable rules, and challenges well matched to sc There is little opportunity for the self to be threatened. When a climber is making a difficult ascent, he is totally taken up in the mountaineering role. He is 100% a climber, or he would not survive. There is no way for anything or anybody to bring into question any. Mehali CS Exent Mehali 63 Other aspect of his self Whether his face is smudged makes absolutely no difference. The only possible threat is the one that comes from the mountain, but a good climber is well trained to face that threat, and does not need to bring the self into play in the process. The absence of the self from consciousness does not mean that a person in flow has given up the control of his psychic energy, or that she is unaware of what happens in her body or in her mind. In fact the opposite is usually true. When people first learn about the flow experience they sometimes assume that law of self-consciousness has something to do with the passive obliteration of the self, a uh, going with a flow, Southern California style. But in fact the optimal experience involves a very active role for the self. A violinist must be extremely aware of every movement of her fingers, as well as of the sound entering her ears, and of the total form of the piece. She is playing, both analytically, note by note, and holistically, in terms of its overall design. A good runner is usually aware of every relevant muscle in his body of the rhythm of his breathing, as well as of the performance of his competitors within the overall strategy of the race. A chess player could not enjoy the game if he were unable to retrieve from his memory, at will, previous positions, past combinations. So loss of self-consciousness does not involve a loss of self, and certainly not a loss of consciousness, but rather, only a loss of consciousness of the self. What slips below the threshold of awareness is the concept of self, the information we use to represent to ourselves who we are. And being able to forget temporarily who we are seems to be very enjoyable. When not preoccupied with ourselves, we actually have a chance to expand the concept of who we are. Loss of self-consciousness can do self-transcendence, to a feeling that the boundaries of our being have been pushed forward. This feeling is not just a fancy of the imagination, but is based on a con. Crete experience of close interaction with some other, an interaction that produces a rare sense of unity with these usually foreign entities. During the long watches of the night the solitary sailor begins to feel that the boat is an extension of himself, moving to the same rhythms toward a common goal. The violinist, wrapped in the stream of sound she helps to create, feels as if she is part of the harmony of the spheres. The climber, focusing all her attention on the small irregularities of the rock wall that will have to support her weight safely, speaks of the sense of kinship that develops between fingers and rock, between the frail body and the context of stone, sky, and wind. In a chess tournament, players whose attention has been riveted, for us. 64th Low to the logical battle on the blame that they feel as if they have been merged into a powerful field of force, clashing with other forces in some non-material dimension of existence. Surgeons say that during a difficult operation they have the sensation that the entire operating team is a single organism, moved by the same purpose, they describe it as a ballet, in which the individual is subordinated to the group performance, and all involved share in a feeling of harmony and power. 
one could treat these testimonials as poetic metaphors and leave them at that. But it is important to realize that they refer to experiences that are just as real as being hungry, or as concrete as bumping into a wall. There is nothing mysterious or mystical about them. When a person invests all her psychic energy into an interaction, whether it is with another person, a boat, a mountain, or a piece of music, she in effect becomes part of a system of action greater than what the individual self had been before. This system takes its form from the rules of the activity, its energy comes from the person's attention. But it is a real system, subjectively as real as being part of a family, a corporation, or a team, and the self that is part of it expands its boundaries and becomes more complex than what it had been. This growth of the self occurs only if the interaction is an enjoyable one, that is, if it offers non-trivial opportunities for action and requires a constant perfection of skills. It is also possible to lose oneself in systems of action that demand nothing but faith and agents. Fundamentalist religions, mass movements, and extremist political parties also offer opportunities for self-transcendence that millions are eager to accept. They also provide a welcome extension of the boundaries of the self, a feeling that one is involved in something great and powerful. The true believer also becomes part of the system in concrete terms, because his psychic energy will be focused as shaped by the goals and rules of his belief. But the true believer is not really interacting with the belief system, he usually lets his psychic energy be absorbed by it. From this submission nothing new can come, consciousness may attain a welcome order, but it will be an order imposed rather than achieved. At best the self of the true believer resembles a crystal, strong and beautifully symmetrical, but very slow to grow. There is one very important and at first apparently paradoxical relationship between losing the sense of self in a flow experience, and having it emerge stronger afterward. It almost seems that occasionally giving up self-consciousness is necessary for building a strong self-concept. Why this should be so is fairly clear. In flow a person is challenged to do her best, and must constantly improve her skills. At the time, she Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 65 doesn't have the opportunity to reflect on what this means in terms of the self, if she did allow herself to become self-conscious, the experience could not have been very deep. But afterward, when the activity is over and self-consciousness has a chance to resume, the self that the person reflects upon is not the same self that existed before the flow experience, it is now enriched by new skills and fresh achievements. The Transformation of Time One of the most common descriptions of optimal experience is that time no longer seems to pass the way it ordinarily does. The objective, external duration we measure with reference to outside events like night and day, or the orderly progression of clocks, is rendered irrelevant by the rhythms dictated by the activity. Often hours seem to pass by in minutes, in general, most people report that time seems to pass much faster. But occasionally the reverse occurs, ballet dancers describe how a difficult turn that takes less than a second in real time stretches out for what seems like minutes, two things happen. One is that it seems to pass really fast in one sense. After it's passed, it seems to have passed really fast. I see that it's one o'clock in the morning, and I say, aha, just a few minutes ago it was eight, double zero. But then while I'm dancing, it seems like it's been much longer than maybe it really was. The safest generalization to make about this phenomenon is to say that during the flow experience the sense of time bears little relation to the passage of time as measured by the absolute convention of the clock. But here, too, there are exceptions that prove the rule. An outstanding open-heart surgeon who derives a deep enjoyment from his work is well known for his ability to tell the exact time during an operation with only half a minute margin of error, without consult or watch. But in his case timing is one of the essential challenges of the job, since he is called only to do a very small but extremely difficult part of the operation, he is usually involved in several operations simultaneously, 
and has to walk from one case to the next, making sure that he is not holding up his colleagues responsible for the preliminary phases. A similar skill is often found among practitioners of other activities where time is of the essence, for instance, runners and racers. In order to pace themselves precisely in a competition, they have to be very sensitive to the passage of seconds and minutes. In such cases, the ability to keep track of time becomes one of the skills next. Sorry to do well in the activity, and thus it contributes to, rather than detracts from, the enjoyment of the experience. But most flow activities do not depend on claw like ball. 66 flow. They have their own pace, their own sequences of events marking transitions from one state to another without regard to equal intervals of duration. It is not clear whether this dimension of flow is just an epiphenomenon, a byproduct of the intense concentration required for the activity at hand, or whether it is something that contributes in its own right to the positive quality of the experience. Although it seems likely that losing track of the clock is not one of the major elements of enjoyment, freedom from the tyranny of time does add to the exhilaration we feel during a state of complete involvement. The Autotelic Experience The key element of an optimal experience is that it is an end in itself. Even if initially undertaken for other reasons, the activity that consumes us becomes intrinsically rewarding. Surgeons speak of their work, it is so enjoyable that I would do it even if I didn't have to. Sailors say, I am spending a lot of money and time on this boat, but it is worth it, nothing quite cares with the feeling I get when I am out sailing. The term, autotelic, is from two Greek words, auto meaning self, and telos meaning goal. It refers to a self-contained activity, one that is done not with the expectation of some future benefit, but simply because the doing itself is the reward. Playing the stock market in order to make money is not an autotelic experience, but playing it in order to prove one's skill at foretelling future trends, even though the outcome in terms of dollars and cents is exactly the same. Teaching children in order to turn them into good citizens is not autotelic, we're teaching them because one enjoys. Interesting with children is what transpires in the two situations is ostensibly identical, what differs is that when the experience is autotelic, the person is paying attention to the activity for its sake, when it is not, the attention is focused on its consequences. Most things we do are either purely autotelic nor purely exotelic, as we shall call activities done for external reasons only, but are a combination of the two. Surgeons usually enter into their long period of training because of exotelic expectations, to help people, to make money, to achieve prestige. If they are lucky, after a while they begin to enjoy their work, and then surgery becomes to a large extent also autotelic. Some things we are initially forced to do against our will turn out in the course of time to be intrinsically rewarding. A friend of mine, with whom I worked in an office many years ago, had a great gift. Whenever. Mehali CSX and Mehali 67. The work got to be particularly boring. He would look up with a laced look in his half closed eyes, and he would start to hum a piece of music, a Bach chorale, a Mozart concerto, Beethoven symphony. But humming is a pitifully inadequate description of what he did. He reproduced the entire piece, imitating with his voice the principal instruments involved in the particular passage. Now he wailed like a violin, now he crooned like a bassoon, now he blared like a baroque trumpet. We in the office listened entranced, and resumed work refreshed. What is curious is the way my friend had developed this gift. Since the age of three, he had been taken by his father to concerts of classical music. He remembers having been unspeakably bored, and occasionally falling asleep in the seat, to be awakened by a sharp slap. He grew to hate concerts, classical music, and presumably his father, but year after year he was forced to repeat this painful experience. Then one evening, when he was about seven years old, during the overture to a Mozart opera, he had what he described as an easy static insight, 
he suddenly discerned the melodic structure of the piece, and had an overwhelming sense of a new world opening up before him. It was the three years of painful listening that had prepared him for this epiphany, years during which his musical skills had developed, however unconsciously, and made it possible for him to understand the challenge Mozart had built into the music. Of course he was lucky, many children never reached the point of recognize ing the possibilities of the activity into which they are forced, and end up disliking it forever. How many children have come to hate classical music because their parents forced them to practice an instrument? Often children, and adults, need external incentives to take the first steps in an activity that requires a difficult restructuring of attention. Most enjoyable. Activities are not natural, they demand an effort that initially one is reluctant to make. But once the interaction starts to provide feedback to the person's skills, it usually begins to be intrinsically rewarding. An autotelic experience is very different from the feelings we typically have in the course of life. So much of what we ordinarily do has no value in itself, and we do it only because we have to do it, or because we expect some future benefit from it. Many people feel that the time they spend at work is essentially wasted, they are alienated from it, and the psychic energy invested in the job does nothing to strengthen their self. For quite a few people free time is also wasted. Leisure provides a relaxing respite from work, but it generally consists of passively absorbing information, without using any skills or exploring new opportunities. 68 Flow For action as a result life passes in a sequence of boring and anxious experiences over which a person has little control. The autotelic experience, or flow, lifts the course of life to a different level. Alienation gives way to involvement, enjoyment raises boredom, helplessness turns into a feeling of control, and psychic energy works to reinforce the sense of self, instead of being lost in the service of external goals. When experience is intrinsically rewarding life is justified in the present, instead of being held hostage to a hypothetical future game. But, as we have already seen in the section dealing with the sense of control, one must be aware of the potentially addictive power of flow. We should reconcile ourselves to the fact that nothing in the world is entirely positive, every power can be misused. Love may lead to cruelty, science can create destruction, Technology unchecked produces pollution. Optimal. Experience is a form of energy, and energy can be used either to help or to destroy. Fire warms or burns, atomic energy can generate electricity or it can obliterate the world. Energy is power, but power is only a means. The goals to which it is applied can make life either richer or more painful. The Marquis de Sade perfected the infliction of pain into a form of pleasure, and in fact, cruelty is a universal source of enjoyment for people who have not developed more sophisticated skills. Even in societies that are called, civilized, because they try to make life enjoyable without interfering with anyone's well-being, people are attracted to violence. Gladiatorial combat amused the Romans, Victorians paid money to see rats being torn up by terriers, Spaniards approach the killing of bulls with reverence, and boxing is a staple of our own culture. Veterans from Vietnam or other wars sometimes speak with nostalgia about frontline action, describing it as a flow experience. When you sit in a trench next to a rocket launcher, life is focused very clearly, the goal is to destroy the enemy before he destroys you good and bad become self-evident, the means of control are at hand, distractions are eliminated. Even if one hates war, the experience can be more exhilarating than anything encountered in civilian life. Criminals often say things such as, if you showed me saying I can do that's as much fun as breaking into a house at night, and lifting the jewelry without waking anyone up, I would do it. Much of what we label juvenile delinquency, car theft, Vandalism, body behavior in general, is motivated by the same need to have flow experiences not available in ordinary life. 
as long as a significant segment of society has few opportunities to encounter meaningful challenges and few chances. Mehali CS sent Mehali 69. To develop the skills necessary to benefit from them, we must expect that violence and crime will attract those who cannot find their way to more complex autotelic experiences. This issue becomes even more complicated when we reflect that respected scientific and technological activities, which later assume a highly ambiguous and perhaps even horrifying aspect, are originally very enjoyable. Robert Oppenheimer called his work on the atomic bomb a sweet problem, and there is no question that the manufacture of nerve gas or the planning of Star Wars can be deeply engrossing to those involved in them. The flow experience, like everything else, is not good in absolute sense. It is good only in that it has the potential to make life more rich, intense, and meaningful. It is good because it increases the strength and complexity of the self. But whether the consequence of any particular instance of flow is good in just sense needs to be discussed and evaluated. In terms of more inclusive social criteria, the same is true, however, of all. Human activities, whether science, religion, or politics. A particular religious belief may benefit a person or a group, but repress many others. Christianity helped to integrate the decaying ethnic communities of the Roman Empire, but it was instrumental in dissolving many cultures with which it later came into contact. A given scientific advance may be good for science and a few scientists, but bad for humanity as a whole. It is an illusion to believe that any solution is beneficial for all people and all times. No human achievement can be taken as the final word. Jefferson's uncomfortable dictum, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, applies outside the fields of politics as well. It means that we must constantly reevaluate what we do, lest habits and past wisdom blind us to new possibilities. It would be senseless, however, to ignore a source of energy because it can be misused. If my mind had tried to ban fire because it could be used to burn things down, we would not have grown to be very different from the great apes. As Democritus said so simply many centuries ago, water can be both good and bad, useful and dangerous. To the danger, however, a remedy has been found, learning to swim. To swim in this case involves learning to distinguish the useful and the harmful forms of food, and then making the most of the former while placing limits on the latter. The task is to learn how to enjoy everyday life without diminishing other people's chances to enjoy theirs. 70 Flow 4. The Conditions Of Flow We have seen how people describe the common characteristics of optimal experience. The sense that one's skills are adequate to cope with the challenges at hand, in a goal-directed, rule-bound action system that provides clear clues as to how well one is performing. Concentration is so intense that there is no attention left over to think about anything irrelevant, or to worry about problems. Self-consciousness disappears, and the sense of time becomes distorted. An activity that produces such experiences is so gratifying that people are willing to do it for its own sake, with little concern for what they will get out of it, even when it is difficult, or dangerous. But how do such experiences happen? Occasionally flow may occur by chance, because of a fortunate coincidence of external and internal conditions. For instance, friends may be having dinner together, and someone brings up a topic that involves everyone in the conversation. One by one. They begin to make jokes and tell stories, and pretty soon all are having fun and feeling good about one another. While such events may happen spontaneously, it is much more likely that flow will result either from a structured activity, or from an individual's ability to make flow occur, or both. Why is playing a game enjoyable? while the things we have to do every day, like working or sitting at home, are often so boring. And why is it that one person will experience joy even in a concentration? 71. Camp, while another gets a blast while vacationing at a fancy resort. 
answering these questions will make it easier to understand how experience can be shaped to improve the quality of life. This chapter will explore those particular activities that are likely to produce optimal experiences and the personal traits that help people achieve flow easily. So activities. When describing optimal experience in this book, we have given as examples such activities as making music, rock climbing, dancing, sailing, chess, and so forth. What makes these activities conducive to flow is that they were designed to make optimal experience easier to achieve. They have rules that require the learning of skills, they set up goals, they provide feedback, they make control possible. They facilitate concentration and involvement by making the activity as distinct as possible from the so-called paramount reality of everyday existence. For example, in each sport participants dress up in eye-catching uniforms and enter special enclaves that set them apart temporarily from ordinary mortals. For the duration of the event, players and spectators cease to act in terms of calm more sense and concentrate instead on the peculiar reality of the game. Such flow activities have as their primary function the provision of enjoying able experiences. Play, art, pageantry, ritual, and sports are some examples. Because of the way they are constructed, they help participants and spectators achieve an ordered state of mind that is highly enjoyable. Roger K. Lois, the French psychological anthropologist, has did the world's games using that word in its broadest sense to include every form of pleasure activity into four broad classes depending on the kind of experiences they provide again includes games that have competition as their main feature such as most sports and artistic events alia is the class that includes all games of chance from dice to bingo ilingsa or vertigo is the name he gives to activities that alter consciousness by something ordinary perception such as riding a merry-go-round or skydiving, and mimicry is the group of activities in which alternative realities are created, such as dance, theater, and the arts in general. Using this scheme, it can be said that games offer opportunities to go beyond the boundaries of ordinary experience in four different ways. In agnostic games, the participant must stretch her sails to meet the challenge provided by the skills of the opponents. The roots of a 72 flow word, compete, are the Latin competia, which meant, to seek together. What each person seeks is to actualize her potential, and this task is made easier when others force us to do our best. Of course, Competition improves experience only as long as attention is focused primarily on the activity itself. If extrinsic goals, such as beating the opponent, wanting to impress an audience, or obtaining a big professional contract, are what one is concerned about, then competition is likely to become a distraction, rather than an incentive to focus consciousness on what is happening. Aleatory games are enjoyable because they give the illusion of controlling the inscrutable future. The Plains Indians shuffled the marked rib bones of buffaloes to predict the outcome of the next hunt, the Chinese interpreted the pattern in which sticks fell, and the Ashanti of East Africa read the future in the way their sacrificed chickens died. Divination is a universal feature of culture, an attempt to break out of the constraints of the present and get a glimpse of what is going to happen. Games of chance draw on the same need. The buffalo ribs become dice, the sticks of the I Ching become playing cards, and the ritual of divination becomes gambling, a secular activity in which people try to outsmart each other or try to outguess fate. Vertigo is the most direct way to alter consciousness. Small children love to turn around in circles until they are dizzy, the whirling dervishes in the Middle East go into states of ecstasy through the same means. Any activity that transforms the way we perceive reality is enjoyable, a fact that accounts for the attraction of consciousness expanding, drugs of all sorts, from magic mushrooms to alcohol to the current Pandora's box of hallucinogenic chemicals. But consciousness cannot be expanded, all we can do is shuffle its content, which gives us the impression of having broadened it somehow. 
The price of most artificially induced alterations, however, is that we lose control over that very consciousness we were supposed to expand. Mimicry makes us feel as though we are more than what we actually are through fantasy, pretense, and disguise. Our ancestors, as they danced wearing the masks of their gods, felt a sense of powerful identification with the forces that ruled the universe. By dressing like a deer, the Yakui Indian dancer felt at one with the spirit of the animal he impersonated. The singer who blends her voice in the harmony of a choir finds chills running down her spine as she feels at one with the beautiful sound she helps create. The little girl playing with her doll and her brother pretending to be a cowboy also stretch the limits of the ordinary experience, so that they become, temporarily, someone differ, and more powerful, as well as learn the gender-typed adult roles of their society. In our studies, we found that every flow activity, whether it involved competition, chance, or any other dimension of experience, had this in common, it provided a sense of discovery, a creative feeling of transporting the person into a new reality. It pushed the person to higher levels of performance, and led to previously undreamed of states of consciousness. It, it transformed the self by making it more complex. In this growth of the self lies the key to flow activities. A simple diagram might help explain why this should be the case. Let us assume that the figure represents a specific activity, for example, the game of tennis. The two theoretically most important dimensions of the experience, challenges and skills, are represented on the two axes of the diagram. The letter represents as a boy who is learning to play tennis. The diagram shows Alex at four different points in time. When he first starts playing, a one, Alex has practically no skills, and the only challenge he faces is hitting the ball over the net. This is not a very difficult feat, but Alex is likely to enjoy it because the difficulty is just right for his rudiment Aris. So at this point he will probably be in flow. But he cannot stay there long. After a while, if he keeps practicing, his skills are bound to improve, and then he will grow. Why the complexity of consciousness increases as a result of flow experiences? 74 flow. Bored just batting the ball over the net, a two. Or it might happen that he meets a more practiced opponent, in which case he will realize that there are much harder challenges for him than just lobbing the ball. At that point, he will feel some anxiety, a three, concerning his poor performance. Neither boredom nor anxiety are positive experiences, so Alex will be motivated to return to the flow state. How is he to do it? Glancing again at the diagram, we see that if he is bored, a two, and wishes to be in flow again, Alex has SNE only one choice, to increase the challenges he is facing. He also has a second choice, which is to give up tennis altogether, in which case A would simply disappear from the diagram. By setting himself a new and more difficult goal that matches his skills, for instance, to beat an opponent just a little more advanced than he is, Alex would be back in flow, a 4. If Alex is anxious, a 3, the way back to flow requires that he increase his skills. Theoretically, he could also reduce the challenges he is facing, and thus return to flow where he started, in a 1, but in practice it is difficult to ignore challenges once one is aware that they exist. The diagram shows that both the 1 and a 4 represent situations in which Alex is in flow. Although both are equally enjoyable, the two states are quite different in that a 4 is a more complex experience than a 1. It is more complex because it involves greater challenges, and demands greater skills from the player. But 4, although complex and enjoyable, does not represent a stable situation, either. As Alex keeps playing, either he will become bored by the stale opportunities he finds at that level, or he will become anxious and frustrated by his relatively low ability. So the motivation to enjoy himself again will push him to get back into the flow channel, but now at a level of complexity even higher than a 4. 
It is this dynamic feature that explains why flow activities lead growth and discovery. One cannot enjoy doing the same thing at the same level for long. We grow either bored or frustrated, and then the desire to enjoy ourselves again pushes us to strive our skills or to discover new opportunities for using them. It is important, however, not to fall into the mechanistic fallacy and expect that, just because a person is objectively involved in a flow activity, she will necessarily have the appropriate experience. It is not only the real challenges presented by the situation that count, but those that the person is aware of. It is not skills we actually have that determine how we feel, but the ones we think we have. One person may respond to the challenge of a mountain peak but remain indifferent too. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 75 The opportunity to learn to play a piece of music. The next person may jump at the chance to learn the music and ignore the mountain. How we feel at any given moment of a flow activity is strongly influenced by the objective conditions but consciousness is still free to follow its own assessment of the case. The rules of games are intended to direct psychic energy in patterns that are enjoyable, but whether they do so or not is ultimately up to us. A professional athlete might be playing football without any of the elements of flow being present. He might be bored, self-conscious, concerned about the size of his contract rather than the game. And the opposite is even more likely that a person will deeply enjoy activities that were intended for other purposes. To many people activities like working or raising children provide more flow than playing a game or painting a picture, because these individuals have learned to perceive opportunities in such mundane tasks. That others do not see. During the course of human evolution, Every culture has developed activities designed primarily to improve the quality of experience. Even the least technologically advanced societies have some form of art, music, dance, and a variety of games that children and adults play. There are natives of New Guinea spend more time looking in the jungle for the colorful feathers they use for decoration in their ritual dances than they spend looking for food. And this is by no means a rare example, art, play and ritual probably occupy more time and energy in most culture than work. While these activities may serve other purposes as well, the fact that they provide enjoyment is the main reason they have survived. Humans began decorating caves at least 30,000 years ago. These paintings surely had religious and practical significance. However, it is likely that the major rhizodatre of art was the same in the Paleolithic era as it is now, namely, it was a source of flow for the painter and for the viewer. In fact, flow and religion have been intimately connected from earliest times. Many of the optimal experiences of mankind have taken place in the context of religious rituals. Not only art but drama, music, and dance had their origins in what we now call religious settings, that is, activities aimed at connecting people with supernatural powers and entities. The same is true of games. One of the earliest ball games, a form of basketball played by the Maya, was part of religious celebrations, and so were the original Olympic Games. This connection is not surprising, because what we call religion is actually the oldest and most ambitious attempt to create order in consciousness. It therefore makes sense that religious rituals would be a profound source of enjoyment. 76 Flow in modern times art, play, and life in general have lost their supernatural moorings. The cosmic order that in the past helped interpret and give meaning to human history has broken down into disconnected fragments. Many ideologies are now competing to provide the best explanation for the way we behave, the law of supply and demand and the invisible hand. Regulating the free market seek to account for our rational economic choices, the law of class conflict that underlies historical materialism tries to explain our irrational political actions. The genetic competition on which sociobiology is based would explain why we help some people and exterminate others. Behaviorism's law of effect offers two 
explain how we learn to repeat pleasurable acts, even when we are not aware of them. These are some of the modern religions rooted in the social sciences. None of them, with the partial exception of historical materialism, itself a dwindling. Creed commands great popular support, and none has inspired the us. Aesthetic visions or enjoyable rituals that previous models of cause uh, spawned. As contemporary flow activities are secularized, they are unlikely to link the actor with powerful meaning systems such as those the Olympic Games or the Mayan Ball Games provided. Generally their content is purely hedonic. We expect them to improve how we feel, physically or mentally, but we do not expect them to connect us with the gods. Nevertheless, the steps we take to improve the quality of experience are very important for the culture as a whole. It has long been recognized that the productive activities of a society are a useful way of describing its character, thus we speak of hunting-gathering, pastoral, agricultural, and ethnological societies. But because flow activities are freely chosen and more intimately related sources of what is ultimately meaningful, they are perhaps more precise indicators of who we are. Flow and Culture A major element of the American experiment in democracy has been to make pursuit of happiness a conscious political goal, indeed, a responsibility of the government. Although the Declaration of Independence may have been the first official political document to spell out this goal explicitly, it is probably true that no social system has ever survived long unless its people had some hope that their government would help them achieve happiness. Of course there have been many repressive cultures whose populace was willing to tolerate even extremely wretched rulers. If the slaves who built the pyramids rarely revolted it was because compared to the alternatives they perceived, working as slaves for the Mehali C.S. Exent Mehali 77 Despotic pharaohs offered a marginally more hopeful future. Over the past few generations social scientists have grown extremely unwilling to make value judgments about cultures. Any comparison that is not strictly factual runs the risk of being interpreted as invidious. It is bad form to say that one culture's practice, or belief, or institution is in any sense better than another's. This is, cultural relativism, a stance anthropologists adopted in the early part of this century as a reaction against the overly smug and ethnocentric assumptions of the colonial Victorian era, when the Western industrial nations considered themselves to be the pinnacle of evolution, better in every respect than technologically less developed cultures. This naive confidence of our supremacy is long past. We might still object if a young ab drives a truck of explosives into Neem Basi, blowing himself up in the process, but we can no longer feel morally superior in condemning his belief that paradise has special sections reserved for self-immolating warriors. We have come to accept that our morality simply no longer has currency outside our own culture. According to this new dogma, it is inadmissible to apply one set of values to evaluate another. And since every evaluation across cultures must necessarily involve at least one set of values foreign to one of the cultures being evaluated, the very possibility of comparison is ruled out. If we assume, however, that the desire to achieve optimal experience is the foremost goal of every human being, the difficulties of interpretation raised by cultural relativism become less severe. Each social system can then be evaluated in terms of how much psychic entropy it causes, mere scoring that disorder not with reference to the ideal order of one or another belief system, but with reference to the goals of the members of that society. A starting point would be to say that one society is better than another. If a greater number of its people have access to experiences that are in line with their goals, a second essential criterion would specify that these experiences should lead to the growth of the self on an individual level, by allowing as many people as possible to develop increasingly complex skills. It seems clear that cultures differ from one another in terms of the degree of the pursuit of happiness they make possible. The quality of life in some societies, in some historical periods, is distinctly better than in others. Toward the end of the 18th century, 
the average Englishman was probably much worse off than he had been earlier, or would be again a hundred years later. The evidence suggests that the Industrial Revolution not only shortened the lifespans of members of several generations, but made them more nasty and brutish as well. It 78 Flow It is hard to imagine that weavers swallowed by the satanic mills, at five years of age, worked 70 hours a week or more until they dropped dead from exhaustion, could feel that what they were getting out of life was what they wanted, regardless of the values and beliefs they shared. To take another example, the culture of the Dobu Islanders, as described by the anthropologist Rio Fortune, is one that encouraged constant fear of sorcery, mistrust among evil sassed relatives, and vindictive behavior. Just going to the bathroom was a major problem, because it involved stepping out into the bush, where everybody expected to be attacked by bad magic when alone among the trees. The Dobuans didn't seem to, like, these characteristics so pervasive in their everyday experience, but they were unaware of alternatives. They were caught in a web of beliefs and practices that had evolved through time, and that made it very difficult for them to experience psychic harmony. Many ethnographic accounts suggest that built-in psychic entropy is more common in proletariat cultures than the myth of the noble savage would suggest. The Ik of Uganda, unable to cope with a deteriorating environment that no longer provides enough food for them to survive, have institutionalized selfishness beyond the wildest dreams of capitalism. The Unomamo Venezuela, like many other warrior tribes, worship violence more than our militaristic superpowers, and find nothing as enjoyable as a good bloody raid on a neighbor ING village. Laughing and smiling were almost unknown in the Nigerian tribe beset by sorcery and intrigue that Laura Bohnanov studied. There is no evidence that any of these cultures chose to be selfish, violent, or fearful. Their behavior does not make them happier, on the contrary, it causes suffering. Such practices and beliefs, which interfere with happiness, are neither inevitable nor necessary, they evolved by chance, as a result of random responses to accidental conditions. But once they become part of the norms and habits of a culture, people assume that this is how things must be, they come to believe they have no other options. Fortunately there are also many instances of cultures that, either by luck or by foresight, have succeeded in creating a context in which flow is relatively easy to achieve. For instance, the pygmies of the Ichiri forest described by Colin Turner live in harmony with one another and their environment, filling their lives with useful and challenging activities. When they are not hunting or improving their villages they sing, dance, play musical instruments, or tell stories to each other. As in many so-called primitive cultures, every adult in this pygmy society. CSX Zent 79 is expected to be a bit of an actor, singer, artist, and historian as well as a skilled worker. Their culture would not be given a high rating in terms of material achievement, but in terms of providing optimal experiences their way of life seems to be extremely successful. Another good example of how a culture can build flow into its lifestyle is given by the Canadian ethnographer Richard Cool, describing one of the Indian tribes of British Columbia. The Shushwap region was and is considered by the Indian people to be a rich place, rich in salmon and game, rich in below ground food resources such as tubers and roots, a plentiful land. In this region, the people would live in permanent village sites and exploit the environs for needed resources. They had elaborate technologies for very effectively using the resources of the environment, and perceived their lives as being good and rich. Yet, the elders said, at times the world became too predictable and the challenge began to go out of life. Without challenge, life had no meaning. So the elders, in their wisdom, would decide that the entire village should move, those moves occurring every 25 to 30 years. The entire population would move to a different part of the Shushwap land and there, they found challenge. There were new streams to figure out, 
new game trails to learn, new areas where the balsam root would be. Plentiful. Now life would regain its meaning and be worth living. Everyone would feel rejuvenated and healthy. Incidentally, it also allowed exploited resources in one area to recover after years of harvesting. An interesting parallel is the Great Shrine at Ice, south of Kyoto, Japan. The Ice Shrine was built about 1500 years ago on one of adjacent fields. Every 20 years or so it has been taken down from the field it had standing on, and rebuilt on the next one. By 1973 it had been re-arrested for the 60th time. During the 14th century conflict between competing emperors temporarily interrupted the practice. The strategy adopted by the Shushwap and the monks of Ice resembles one that several statesmen have only dreamed about accomplishing. For example, both Thomas Jefferson and Chairman Mao Zedong believed that each generation needed to make its own revolution for its members to stay actively involved in the political system ruling their lives. In reality, few cultures have ever attained so good a fit between the psychological needs of their people and the options available for their lives. Most fall short, either by making survival too strenuous a task, or by closing themselves off into rigid patterns that stifle the 80 flow opportunities for action by each succeeding generation careers are defensive constructions against chaos designed to reduce the impact of randomness on experience they are adaptive responses just as feathers are for birds and fur is for mammals cultures prescribe norms evolve goals build beliefs that help us tackle the challenges of existence. In so doing they must rule out many alternative goals and beliefs, and there are limit possibilities, but this channeling of attention to a limited set of goals and means is what allows effortless action within self-created boundaries. It is in this respect that games provide a compelling analogy to cultures. Both consist of more or less arbitrary goals and rules that allow people to become involved in a process and act with a minimum of doubts and distractions. The difference is mainly one of scale. Cultures are all embracing. They specify how a person should be born, how she should grow up, marry, have children, and die. Games fill out the interludes of the cultural script. They enhance action and concentration during free time when cultural instructions offer little guidance, and a person's attention threatens to wander into the uncharted realms of chaos. When a culture succeeds in evolving a set of goals and rules so compelling and so well matched to the skills of the population that its members are able to experience flow with unusual frequency and intensity, the analogy between games and cultures is even closer. In such a case we can say that the culture as a whole becomes a great game. Some of the classical civilizations may have succeeded in reaching this state. Athenian citizens, Romans who shaped their actions by virtues, Chinese intellectuals, or Indian Brahmans moved through life with intricate grace, and derived perhaps the same enjoyment from the challenging harmony of their actions as they would have from an extended dance. The Athenian polis, Roman law, divinely grounded bureaucracy of China, and the all-encompassing spur. Each order of India were successful and lasting examples of how culture can enhance flow, at least for those who were lucky enough to be among the principal players. A culture that enhances flow is not necessarily good in any moral sense. The rules of Sparta seem needlessly cruel from the vantage point of the 20th century, even though they were by all accounts successful in motivating those who abided by them. The joy of battle and the butchery that accelerated the Tatar hordes or the Turkish Janissaries were legendary. It is certainly true that for great segments of the European population, confused by the dislocating economic and cultural shocks of the 1920s the Nazi fascist regime and ideology provided. Mehali Csik Zent Mehali 81 an attractive game plan. It set simple goals, clarified feedback, and allowed a renewed involvement with life that many found to be a relief from prior anxieties and frustrations. Similarly, while flow is a powerful motivator, 
it does not guarantee virtue in those who experience it. Other things being equal, a culture that provides flow might be seen as better than one that does not. But when a group of people embraces goals and norms that will enhance its enjoyment of life there is always the possibility that this will happen at the expense of someone else. The flow of the Athenian citizen was made possible by the slaves who worked his property, just as the elegant lifestyle of the southern plantations in America rested on the labor of imported slaves. We are still very far from being able to measure with any accuracy how much optimal experience different cultures make possible. According to a large-scale Gallup survey taken in 1976, 40% of North Americans said that they were very happy, as opposed to 20% of Europeans, 18% of Africans, and only 7% of Far Eastern respondents. On the other hand, Another survey conducted only two years earlier indicated that the personal happiness rating of U.S. citizens was about the same as that of Cubans and Egyptians, whose per capita GNPs were respectively five and over ten times less than that of the Americans. West Germans and Nigerians came out with identical happiness ratings, despite an over 15-fold difference in per capita GNP. So far, these discrepancies only demonstrate that our instruments for measuring optimal experience are still very primitive. Yet the fact that differences do exist seems incontestable. Despite ambiguous findings, all large-scale surveys agree that citizens of nations that are more affluent, better educated, and ruled by more stable governments report higher levels of happiness and satisfaction with life. Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and the Netherlands appear to be the happiest countries, and the United States, despite high rates of divorce. Alcoholism, crime, and addictions, is not very far behind. This would not be surprising, given the amount of time and resources we spend on activities whose main is to provide enjoyment. Average American adults work only about 30 hours a week and spend an additional 10 hours doing things irrelevant to their jobs while at the workplace, such as daydreaming or chatting with fellow workers. They spend a slightly smaller amount of time, on the order of 20 hours per week, involved in leisure activities, 7 hours actively watching television, 3 hours reading, 2 in more active. 82 Flow Pursuits like jogging, making music, or bowling, and seven hours in social activities such as going to parties, seeing movies, or entertaining family and friends. The remaining 50 to 60 hours that an American is awake each week are spent in maintenance activities like eating, traveling to and from work, shopping, cooking, washing up, and fixing things, or in unstructured free time, like sitting alone and staring to space. Although average Americans have plenty of free time, and ample access to leisure activities, they do not, as a result, experience flow often. Potentiality does not imply actuality, and quantity does not translate into quality. For example, TV watching, the single most often pursued leisure activity in the United States today, leads to the flow condition very rarely. In fact, working people achieve the flow experience, deep concentration, high and balanced challenges and skills, a sense of control and satisfaction about four times as often on their jobs proportionately as they do when they are watching television one of the most ironic paradoxes of our time is this great availability of leisure that somehow fails to be translated into enjoyment compared to people living only a few generations ago we have enormously greater opportunities to have a good time Yet, there is no indication that we actually enjoy a life more than our ancestors did. Opportunities alone, however, are not enough. We also need the skills to make use of them. And we need to know how to control consciousness, a skill that most people have not learned to cultivate. Surrounded by an astounding panoply of recreational gadgets and leisure choices, most of us go on being bored and vaguely frustrated. This fact brings us to the second condition that affects whether an optimal experience will occur or not, an individual's ability to restructure consciousness so as to make flow possible. Some people enjoy themselves wherever. 
there, while others stay bored even when confronted with the most dazzling prospects. So in addition to considering the external conditions, or the structure of flow activities, we need also to take into account the internal conditions that make flow possible. The Autotelic Personality It is not easy to transform ordinary experience into flow, but almost everyone can improve his or her ability to do so. While the remainder of this book will continue to explore the phenomenon of optimal experience, which in turn should help the reader to become more familiar with. Mehali CSX Zent Mehali 83 It, we shall now consider another issue, whether all people have the same potential to control consciousness, and if not, what distinguishes those who do it easily from those who don't. Some individuals might be constitutionally incapable of experiencing flow. Psychiatrists describe schizophrenics as suffering from anhedonia, which literally means, lack of pleasure. This symptom appears to be related to, stimulus overinclusion, which refers to the fact that schizophrenics are condemned to notice irrelevant stimuli, to process information whether they like it or not. The schizophrenic's tragic inability to keep things in or out of consciousness is vividly described by some patients, things just happen to me now, and I have no control over them. I don't seem to have the same say in things anymore. At times I can't even control what I think about. Or, oh, things are coming in too fast. I lose my grip of it and get lost. I am attending to everything at once and as a result I do not really attend to anything. Unable to concentrate, attending indiscriminately to everything, patients who suffer from this disease not surprisingly end up unable to enjoy it themselves. But what causes stimulus over inclusion in the first place? Part of the answer probably has to do with innate genetic causes. Some people are just temperamentally less able to concentrate their psychic energy than others. Among school children, a great variety of learning disabilities have been reclassified under the heading of attentional disorders, because what they have in common is lack of control over attention. Although attentional disorders are likely to depend on chemical imbalances, it is also very likely that the quality of childhood experience will either exacerbate or alleviate their cause. From our point of view, what is important to realize is that attentional disorders not only interfere with learning, but effectively rule out the possibility of experiencing flow as well. When a person cannot control psychic energy, neither learning nor true enjoyment is possible. A less drastic obstacle to experiencing flow is excessive self-consciousness. A person who is constantly worried about how others will perceive her, who is afraid of creating the wrong impression, or of doing something inappropriate, is also condemned to permanent exclusion from enjoyment. So are people who are excessively self-centered. A self-centered individual is usually not self-conscious, but instead evaluates every bit of information only in terms of how it relates to her desires. For such a person everything is valueless in itself. A fleur is not worth a second look unless it can be used. A man or a woman who cannot advance one's interests does not deserve further attention. Con. 84 Flow Searsness is structured entirely in terms of its own ends, and nothing is allowed to exist in it that does not conform to those ends. Although a self-conscious person is in many respects different from a self-centered one, neither is in enough control of psychic energy to enter early into a flow experience. Both lack the attentional fluidity needed to relate to activities for their own sake. Too much psychic energy is wrapped up in the self, and free attention is rigidly guided by its needs. Under these conditions it is difficult to become interested in intrinsic goals, to lose oneself in an activity that offers no rewards outside the interaction itself. Attentional disorders and stimulus overinclusion prevent flow because psychic energy is too fluid and erratic. Excessive self-consciousness and self-centeredness prevent it for the opposite reason, attention is too rigid and tight. Neither extreme allows a person to control attention. Those who operate at these extremes cannot enjoy it themselves, have a difficult time learning, and forfeit opportunities for the growth of the self. 
Paradoxically, a self-centered self cannot become more complex, because all the psychic energy at its disposal is invested in fulfilling its current goals, instead of learning about new ones. The impediments to flow considered thus far are located within the individual himself. But there are also many powerful environmental obstacles to enjoyment. Some of these are natural, some social in origin. For instance, one would expect that people living in the incredibly harsh conditions of the Arctic regions, or in the Kalhari Desert, would have little opportunity to enjoy their lives. Yet even the most severe natural conditions cannot entirely eliminate flow. The Eskimos in their bleak, inhospitable lands learn to sing, dance, joke, carve beautiful objects, and create an elaborate mythology to give order and sense to their experiences. Possibly as no. Dwellers and the sand dwellers who couldn't build enjoyment into their lives eventually gave up and died out. But the fact that some survived shows that nature alone cannot prevent flow from happening. The social conditions that inhibit flow might be more difficult to overcome. One of the consequences of slavery, oppression, exploitation, and the destruction of cultural values is the elimination of enjoyment. When the now extinct natives of the Caribbean islands were put to work in the plantations of the coloring Spaniards, their lives became so painful and meaningless that they lost interest in survival, and eventually ceased reproducing. It is probable that many cultures disappeared in a similar fashion, because they were no longer able to provide the experience of enjoyment. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 85 Two terms describing states of social pathology apply also to conditions that make flow difficult to experience, anomi and alienation. Anomi, literally, lack rules, is the name the French sociologist Emile Durkheim gave to a condition in society in which the norms of behavior had become muddled. When it is no longer clear what is permitted and what is not, when it is uncertain what public opinion values, behavior becomes erratic and meaningless. People who depend on the rules of society to give order to their consciousness become anxious. Anomic situations might arise when the economy collapses, or when one culture is destroyed by another, but they can also come about when prosperity increases rapidly, and old values of thrift and hard work are no longer as relevant as they had been. Alienation is in many ways the opposite, it is a condition in which people are constrained by the social system to act in ways that go against their goals. A worker who in order to feed himself and his family must perform the same meaningless task hundreds of times on an assembly line is likely to be alienated. In socialist countries one of the most irritating sources of alienation is the necessity to spend much of one's free time waiting in line for food, for clothing, for entertainment, or for endless bureaucratic clearances. When a society suffers from anomi, flow is made difficult because it is not clear what is worth investing psych energy in. When it suffers from alienation the problem is that one cannot invest psychic energy in what is clearly desirable. It is interesting to note that these two societal obstacles to flow, anomi and alienation, are functionally equivalent to the two personal pathologies, attentional disorders and self-centeredness. At both levels, the individual and the collective, what prevents flow from occurring is either the fragmentation of attentional processes, as in anomi and attentional disorders, or their excessive rigidity, as in alienation and self-centeredness. At the indie, individual level anomi corresponds to anxiety, while alienation corresponds to boredom. Neurophysiology and flow. Just as some people are born with better muscular coordination, it is possible that there are individuals with a genetic advantage in controlling consciousness. Such people might be less prone to suffer from attentional disorders, and they may experience flow more easily. Dr. Jean Hamilton's research with visual perception and cortical activation patterns lends support to such a claim. One set of her evidence is based on a test in which subjects had to look at an ambiguous figure, a NECA cube, or an Escher type illustration that at one point. 86 flow seems to be coming out of the plane of the paper toward the viewer and the next moment seems to recede behind the plane, and then perceptually, 
rivers, it, that is, see the figure that shuts out of the surface as if it were sinking back, and vice versa. Dr. Hamilton found that students who reported less intrinsic motivation in daily life needed on the average to fix their eyes on more point before they could reverse the ambiguous figure, whereas students who on the whole found their lives more intrinsically rewarding needed to look at fewer points, or even only a single point, to reverse the same figure. These findings suggest that people might vary in the number of external cues they need to accomplish the same mental task. Individuals who require a great deal of outside information to form representations of reality in consciousness may become more dependent on the external environment for using their minds. They would have less control over their thoughts, which in turn would make it more difficult for them to enjoy experience. By contrast, People who need only a few external cues to represent events in consciousness are more autonomous from the environment. They have a more flexible attention that allows them to restructure experience more easily, and therefore to achieve optimal experiences more frequently. In another set of experiments, students who did and who did not report frequent flow experiences were asked to pay attention to flashes of lights or to zones in a laboratory. While the subjects were involved in this again channel task, their cortical activation in response to the stimuli was measured, and averaged separately for the visual and auditory conditions. These are called, evoked potentials. Dr. Hamilton's findings showed that subjects who reported only rarely experiencing flow behaved as expected. When responding to the flashing stimuli their activation went up significantly above their baseline level. But the results from subjects who reported flow frequently were very surprising. Activation decreased when they were gone. Centrating. Instead of requiring more effort, investment of attention actually seemed to decrease mental effort. A separate behavioral measure of Akain Shun confirmed that this group was also more accurate in a sustained Akain Channel task. The most likely explanation for this unusual finding seems to be that the group reporting more flow was able to reduce mental activity in every information channel but the one involved in concentrating on the flashing stimuli. This in turn suggests that people who can enjoy themselves in a variety of situations have the ability to screen out stimulation and to focus only on what they decide is relevant for the moment. While paying attention ordinarily involves an additional bar. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 87 Den of information processing above the usual baseline effort, for people who have learned to control consciousness focusing attention is relatively effortless, because they can shut off all mental processes but the relevant ones. It is this flexibility of attention, which contrasts so sharply with the helpless over-inclusion of the schizophrenic, that may provide the neurological basis for the autotelic personality. The neurological evidence does not, however, prove that some individuals have inherited a genetic advantage in controlling attention and therefore experiencing flow. The findings could be explained in terms of learning rather than inheritance. The association between the ability to concentrate and flow is clear. It will take further research to ascertain which one causes the other. The effects of the family on the autotelic personality. A neurological advantage in processing information may not be the only key to explaining why some people have a good time waiting at a bus station while others are bored no matter how entertaining their environment is. Early childhood influences are also very likely factors in determining whether a person will or will not easily experience flow. There is ample evidence to suggest that how parents interact with the child will have a lasting effect on the kind of person that child grows up to be. In one of our studies conducted at the University of Chicago, for example, Kevin Rathund observed that teenagers who had certain types of relationship with their parents were significantly more happy, satisfied, and strong in most life situations than their peers who did not have such a relationship. The family context promoting optimal experience could be described as having five characteristics. The first one is clarity, the teenagers feel that they know what their parents expect from them, goals and feedback in. The family interaction are unambiguous. The second is centering, or the children's perception that their parents are interested in what they are doing in the present, in their concrete feelings and experiences, 
rather than being preoccupied with whether they will be getting into a good college or obtaining a well-paying job. Next is the issue of choice. Children feel that they have a variety of possibilities from which to choose, including that of breaking parental rules, as long as they are prepared to face the consequences. The fourth differentiating characteristic is commitment, or the trust that allows the child to feel comfortable enough to set aside the shield of his defenses, and become unselfconsciously involved in whatever he is interested in. 88 Flow And finally there is challenge, or the parents' dedication to provide increasingly complex opportunities for action to their children. The presence of these five conditions made possible what's called the autotelic family context, because they provide an ideal training for enjoying life. The five characteristics clearly parallel the dimensions of the flow experience. Children who grow up in family situations that facilitate clarity of goals, feedback, feeling of control, concentration on the task at hand, intrinsic motivation, and challenge will generally have a better chance to order their lives so as to make flow possible. Moreover, families that provide an autotelic context conserve a great deal of psychic energy for their individual members, thus making it possible to increase enjoyment all around. Children who know what they can and cannot do, who do not have to constantly argue about rules and controls, who are not worried about their parents' expectations for future success, always hanging over their heads, are released from many of the attentional demands that more chaotic households generate. They are free to develop interests in activities that will expand their selves. In less well-ordered families a great deal of energy is expended in constant negotiation and strife, and in the children's attempts to protect their fragile selves from being overwhelmed by other people's goals. Not surprisingly, the differences between teenagers whose families provided an autotelic context and those whose families did not were strongest when the children were at home with the family, here those from an autotelic context were much more happy, strong, cheerful, and satisfied than their less fortunate peers. But the differences were also present when the teenagers were alone studying, or in school, here, too, optimal experience was more accessible to children from autotelic families. Only when teenagers were with their friends did the differences disappear, with friends. Both groups felt equally positive, regardless of whether the families were autotel or not. It is likely that there are ways that parents behave with babies much earlier in life that will also predispose them to find enjoyment either with ease or with difficulty. On this issue, however, there are no long-term studies that trace the cause and effect relationships over time. It stands to reason, however, that a child who has been abused, or who has been often threatened with the withdrawal of parental love, and unfortunately we are becoming increasingly aware of what a disturbing proportion of children in our culture are so mistreated, will be so. Mehali C.S. Exent Mehali 89 Read about keeping his sense of self from coming apart as to have little energy left to pursue intrinsic rewards. Instead of seeking the complexity of enjoyment, an ill-treated child is likely to grow up into an adult who will be satisfied to obtain as much pleasure as possible from life. The people of flow. The traits that mark an autotelic personality are most clearly revealed by people who seem to enjoy situations that ordinary persons would find unbearable. Lost in Antarctica or confined to a prison cell, some individuals succeed in transforming their harrowing conditions into a manageable and even enjoyable struggle, whereas most others would succumb to the ordeal. Richard Logan, who has studied the accounts of many people in difficult situations, concludes that they survived by finding ways to turn the bleak objective conditions into subjectively controllable experience. They followed the blueprint of flow activities. First. They paid close attention to the most minute details of their environment, discovering in it hidden opportunities for action that matched what little they were capable of doing, given the circumstances. Then they set goals appropriate to their precarious situation, and closely monitored progress through the feedback they received. Whenever they reached their goal, they upped the ante, setting increasingly complex challenges for themselves. Christopher Burney 
a prisoner of the Nazis, who spent a long time in solitary confinement during World War II, gives a fairly typical example of this process. If the reach of experience is suddenly confined, and we are left with only a little food for thought or feeling, we are apt to take the few objects that offer themselves and ask a whole catalogue of often absurd questions about them. Does it work? How? Who made it and of what? And, in parallel, when and where did I last see something like it and what else does it remind me of? So we set in train a wonderful low of combinations and associations in our minds, the length and complexity of which soon obscures its humble starting point. My bed, for example, could be measured and roughly classified with school beds or army beds. When I had done with the bed, which was too simple to intrigue me long, I felt the blankets, estimated their warmth, examined the precise mechanics of the window, the discomfort of the toilet, computed the length and breadth, the orientation and elevation of the cell, italics added. 90 flow. Essentially the same ingenuity in finding opportunities for mental action and setting goals is reported by survivors of any solitary confinement, from diplomats captured by terrorists, to elderly ladies imprisoned by Chinese communists. Eva Zezel, the ceramic designer who was imprisoned in Moscow's Lyubyanka prison for over a year by Stalin's police, kept her sanity by figuring out how she would make a bra out of materials at hand, playing chess against herself in her head, holding imaginary conversations in French, doing gymnastics, and memorizing poems she composed. Alex Andersol's Henitsin describes how one of his fellow prisoners in the Le Fortovo jail mapped the world on the floor of the cell, and then imagined himself traveling across Asia and Europe to America, cut a few kilometers each day. The same game was independently discovered by many prisoners, for instance Albert Speer, Hitler's favorite architect, sustained himself in Spandau prison for months by pretending he was taking a walking trip from Berlin to Jerusalem, in which his imagination provided all the events and sus along the way. An acquaintance who worked in United States Air Force Intelligence tells the story of a pilot who was imprisoned in North Vietnam for many years, and lost 80 pounds and of his health in a jungle camp. When he was released, one of the first things he asked for was to play a game of golf. To the great astonishment of his fellow officers, he played a superb game, despite his emaciated condition. To their inquiries, he replied that every day of his imprisonment he imagined himself playing 18 holes, carefully choosing his clubs and approach and systematically varying the course. This discipline not only helped preserve his sanity, but apparently also kept his physical skills well honed. Tola Stiva, a poet who spent several years in solitary confinement during the most repressive phases of the Hungarian communist regime, says that in the Weisgrad jail, where hundreds of intellectuals were imprisoned, the inmates kept themselves occupied for more than a year by devising a poetry translation contest. First, they had to decide on the poem to translate. It took months to pass the nominations around from cell to cell, and several more months of ingenious secret messages before the votes were tallied. Finally it was agreed that Walt Whitman's O Captain, My Captain, was to be the poem to translate into Hungarian, partly because it was the one that most of the prisoners could recall from memory in the original English. Now began the serious work, everyone sat down to make his own version of a poem. Since no paper or writing tool was available, Tolast spread a film of soap on. Mehali C.S. Xent Mehali 91. The soles of his shoe, and carved the letters into it with a toothpick. When the line was learned by heart, he covered his shoe with a new coating of soap. As the various stanzas were written, they were the translator and passed on to the next cell. After a while, a dozen versions of the poem were circulating in jail, and each was evaluated and voted on by all the inmates. After the Whitman translation was dedicated, the prisoners went on to tackle a poem by Schiller. When adversity threatens to paralyze us, we need to reassert control by finding a new direction in which to invest psychic energy, a direction that lies outside the reach of external forces. 
when every aspiration is frustrated. A person still must seek a meaningful goal around which to organize the self. Then, even though that person is objectively a slave, subjectively he is free. Sols Henitsen describes very well how even the most degrading situation can be transformed into a flow experience, sometimes, when Standing in a column of dejected prisoners, amidst the shafts of guards with machine guns, I felt such a rush of rhymes and images that I seemed to be wafted overhead. At such moments I was both free and happy. Some prisoners tried to escape by smashing through the barbed wire. For me there was no barbed wire. The head count of prisoners remained unchanged but I was actually away on a distant flight. Not only prisoners report these strategies for wresting control back to their own consciousness. Explorers like Admiral Bivayadi, who once spent four cold and dark months by himself in a tiny hut near the South Pole, or Charles Lindbergh, facing hostile elements alone in his transatlantic flight, resorted to the same steps to keep the integrity of their selves. But what makes some people able to achieve this internal control? while most others are swept away by external hardships. Richard Logan proposes an answer based on the writings of many sore survivors, including those of Viktor Frankl and Bruno Bettelheim, who have reflected on the sources of strength under extreme adversity. He concludes that the most important trait of survivors is a non-self-conscious individualism, or a strongly directed purpose that is not self-seeing. People who have that quality are bent on doing their best in all circumstances, yet they are not concerned primarily with advancing their own interests. Because they are intrinsically motivated in their actions, they are not easily disturbed by external threats. With enough psychic energy free to observe and analyze their surroundings objectively, they have a better chance of discovering in them new opportunities for action. If we were to consider one trait a key element of the autotelic personality, this might be it. Narcissistic individuals, who are 92 flow, mainly concerned with protecting their self, fall apart when the excellent conditions turn threatening. The ensuing panic prevents them from doing what they must do. Their attention turns inward in an effort to restore order in consciousness, and not enough remains to negotiate outside reality. Without interest in the world, a desire to be actively related to it, a person becomes isolated into himself. Bertrand Russell, one of the greatest philosophers of our century, described how he achieved personal happiness. Gradually I learned to be indifferent to myself and my deficiencies. I came to center my attention increasingly upon external objects, the state of the world, various branches of knowledge, individuals for whom I felt affection. There could be no better short description of how to build for oneself an autotelic personality. In part such a personality is a gift of biological inheritance and early upbringing. Some people are born with a more focused and flexible near ological endowment, or are fortunate to have had parents who promoted a self-conscious individuality. But it is an ability open to cultivation, a skill one can perfect through training and discipline. It is now time to explore further the ways this can be done. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 93 5 The Body In Flow A man possesses nothing certainly save a brief loan of his own body, wrote J.B. Cable, yet the body of man is capable of much curious please your. When we are unhappy, depressed, or bored we have an easy remedy at hand, to use the body for all it is worth. Most people nowadays are aware of the importance of health and physical fitness. But the almost unlimited potential for enjoyment that the body offers often remains unexploited. Few learn to move with the grace of an acrobat, see with the fresh eye of an artist, feel the joy of an athlete who breaks his own record, taste with the subtlety of an nasur, or love with a skill that lifts sex into a form of art. Because these opportunities are easily within reach, the easiest step toward improving the quality of life consists in simply learning to control the body and its senses. Scientists occasionally amuse themselves by trying to figure out how much a human body might be worth. Chemists have painstakingly added up the market value of skin, 
flesh, bone, hair, and the various minerals and trace elements contained in it, and have come up with the paltry sum of a few dollars. Other scientists have taken into account the sophisticated information processing and learning capacity of the mind-body system and have come to a very different condition. They calculate that to build such a sensitive machine would require an enormous sum, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. Neither of these methods of assembling the body makes much sense. 94. Its worth is not derived from chemical ingredients, or from the neural wiring that makes information processing possible. What gives it a preciousness beyond reckoning is the fact that without it there would be no experiences, and therefore no record of life as we know it. Trying to attach a market value to the body and its processes is the same as attempting to put a price tag on life, by what scale can we establish its worth? Everything the body can do is potentially enjoyable. Yet many people ignore this capacity, and use their physical equipment as little as possible, leaving its ability to provide flow unexploited. When left undeveloped, the senses give us chaotic information, an untrained body moves in random and clumsy ways, an insensitive eye presents ugly or uninteresting sights, the unmusical ear mainly hears jarring noises, the coarse palate knows only insipid tastes. If the functions of the body are left to atrophy, the quality of life becomes merely adequate, and for some even dismal. But if one takes control of what the body can do, and learns to impose order on physical sensations, entropy yields to a sense of enjoyable harmony in consciousness. The human body is capable of hundreds of separate functions, seeing, hearing, touching, running, swimming, throwing, catching, climbing up mountains and climbing down caves, to name only a few, and to each of these there correspond flow experiences. In every culture, enjoyable activities have been invented to suit the potentialities of the body. When a normal physical function, like running, is performed in a socially designed, goal-directed setting with rules that offer challenges and require skills, it turns into a flow activity. Whether jogging alone, racing the clock, running against competition, or like the Tahumara Indians of Mexico, who race hundreds of miles in the mountains during several festivals, adding an elaborate ritual dimension to the activity, the simple act of moving the body across. Space becomes a source of complex feedback that provides optimal exper. Ends and adds strength to the self. Each sensory organ, each muscle function can be harnessed to the production of flow. Before exploring further how physical activity contributes to optimal experience, it should be stressed that the body does not produce flow merely by movements. The mind is always involved as well. To get enjoyment from swimming, for instance, one needs to cultivate a set of appropriate skills, which requires the concentration of attention. Without the relevant thoughts, motives, and feelings it would be impossible to achieve the discipline necessary to learn to swim well enough to enjoy it. Moreover, because enjoyment takes place in the mind of the Mehali CS Zent Mehali 95 Swimmer, flow cannot be a purely physical process, muscles and brain must be equally involved. In the pages that follow we shall review some of the ways that the quality of experience can be improved through the refined use of bodily processes. These include physical activities like sports and dance, the cultivation of sexuality, and the various Eastern disciplines for controlling the mind through the training of the body. They also feature the discriminating use of the senses of sight, hearing, and taste. Each of these modalities offers an almost unlimited amount of enjoyment, but only to persons who work to develop the skills they require. To those who do not, the body remains indeed a lump of rather inexpensive flesh. Higher, faster, stronger. The Latin motto of the modern Olympic Games, Altius, Sitius, Fortius, is a good, incomplete summary of how the body can experience flow. It encompasses the rationale of all sports, which is to do something better than it has ever been done before. The purest form of athletics, and sports in general, is to break through the limitations of what the body can accomplish. 
However unimportant an athletic goal may appear to the outsider, it becomes a sir affair when performed with the intent of demonstrating a perfection of skill. Throwing things, for instance, is a rather trivial ability, even small babies are quite good at it, as the toys surrounding any infant's crib testify. But how far a person can throw an object of a certain weight becomes a matter of legend. The Greeks invented the discus, and the great discus throwers of antiquity were immortalized by the best sculptors, the Swiss gathered on hollies in mountain meadows to see who could toss. The trunk of a tree farthest, the Scots did the same with gigantic rocks. In Baseball nowadays pitchers become rich and famous because they can throw balls with speed and precision, and basketball players because they can send them into hoops. Some athletes throw javelins, others are bowlers, short putters, or hammer throwers, some throw boomerangs or cast fishing lines. Each of these variations on the basic capacity to throw offers almost unlimited opportunities for enjoyment. Altheus, high, is the first word of the Olympic motto, and soaring above the ground is another universally recognized challenge. To break the bonds of gravity is one of the oldest dreams of mankind. The myth of Icarus, who had wings fashioned so he could reach the sun, has been long held to be a parable of the aims, noble and misguided at the 90s flow. Same time, of civilization itself. To jump higher, to climb the loftiest peaks, to fly far above the earth, are among the most enjoyable activities people can do. Yet some savants have recently invented a special psychic infirmity, the so-called Icarus complex, to account for this desire to be released from the pull of gravity. Like all explanations that try to reduce enjoyment to a defensive ploy against repressed anxieties, this one misses the point. Of course, in some sense all purposeful action can be regarded as a defense against the threats of chaos. But in that respect it is more worthwhile to consider acts that bring enjoyment as signs of health, not of disease. Flow experiences based on the use of physical skills do not occur only in the context of outstanding athletic feats. Olympians do not have an exclusive gift in finding enjoyment in pushing performance beyond existing boundaries. Every person, no matter how unfit he or she is, can rise a little higher, go a little faster, and grow to be a little stronger. The joy of surpass. ING the limits of the body is open to all. Even the simplest physical act becomes enjoyable when it is transformed so as to produce flow. The essential steps in this process are, a, to set an overall goal, and as many sub-goals as are realistically feasible, b, to find ways of measuring progress in terms of the goals chosen, c, to keep concentrating on what one is doing, and to keep making finer and finer distinctions in the challenges involved in the activity, d, to develop the skills necessary to interact with the opportunities available, and e, to keep raising the stakes if the activity becomes boring. A good example of this method is the act of walking, which is as simple a use of the body as one can imagine, yet which can become a complex flow activity, almost an art form. A great number of different goals might be set for a walk. For instance, the choice of the itinerary, where one wishes to go, and by what route. Within the overall route, one might select places to stop, or certain landmarks to see. Another goal may be to develop a personal style, a way to move the body easily and efficiently. An economy of motion that maximizes physical well-being is another obvious goal. For measuring progress, the feedback may include how fast and how easily the intended distance was covered, how many interesting sights one has seen, and how many new ideas or feelings were entertained along the way. The challenges of the activity are what force us to concentrate. The challenges of a walk will vary greatly, depending on the environment. For those who live in large cities, flat sidewalks and right angle layouts make the physical act of walking easy. Walking on a mountain trail is another thing altogether, for a skilled hiker each step presents. Mehali CSX and Mehali 97 
a different challenge to be resolved with the choice of the most efficient foothold that gave the best leverage, simultaneously taking into account the momentum and the center of gravity of the body and the various faces, dirt, rocks, roots, grass, branches, on which the foot can land. On a difficult trail an experienced hiker walks with economy of motion and lightness, and the constant adjustment of her steps to the terrain reveals a highly sophisticated process of selecting the best solution to a changing series of complex equations involving mass, velocity, and friction. Of course these calculations are usually automatic, and give the impression of being entirely intuitive, almost instinctive, but if the walker does not process the right information about the terrain, and fails to make the appropriate adjustments in her gait, she will stumble or will soon grow tired. So while this kind of walking might be entirely unselfconscious, it is in fact a highly intense activity that requires concentrated attention. In the city the terrain itself is not challenging, but there are other opportunities for developing skills. The social stimulation of the crowds, the historical and architectural references of the urban milieu can add enormous variety to walk. There are store windows to see, people to observe, patterns of human interaction to reflect on. Some walkers specialize in choosing the shortest routes, others the most interesting ones, some pride themselves in walking the same route with chronometric precision, others like to mix and match their itinerary. In winter some aim to walk as long as possible on the sunny stretches of the sidewalk, and to walk as much in the shade as possible in the summer. There are those who time their crossings exactly for when the traffic lights change to green. Of course these chances for enjoyment must be cultivated, they don't just happen automatically to those who do not control their itinerary. Unless one sets goals and develops skills. Walking is just featureless drudgery. Walking is the most trivial physical activity imaginable, yet it can be profoundly enjoyable if a person sets goals and takes control of the process. On the other hand, the hundreds of sophisticated forms of sport and body culture currently available, ranging from racquetball to yoga, from bicycling to martial arts, may not be enjoyable at all if one approaches them with the attitude that one must take part in them because they are fashionable, or simply because they are good for one's health. Many people get caught up in a treadmill of physical activity over which they end up having little control, feeling duty bound to exercise but not having any fun doing it. They have made the usual mistake of unfounding form and substance, and assume that concrete actions and 98 flow events are the only reality that determines what they experience. For such individuals, Joining a fancy health club should be almost a guarantee that they will enjoy themselves. However, enjoyment, as we have seen, does not depend on what you do, but rather on you do it. In one of our studies we addressed the following question, are people happier when they use more material resources in their leisure activities? Or are they happier when they invest more of themselves? We tried to answer these questions with the experience sampling method, ESM. The procedure I developed at the University of Chicago to study the quality of experience. As discussed earlier, this method consists in giving people electronic pages, or beepers, and a booklet, or on sheets. A radio transmitter is programmed to send signals about eight times a day, at random intervals, for a week. Each time the pager signals, respondents fill out a page of the booklet indicating where they are and what they are doing and with whom and rating their state of mind on a variety of dimensions such as a seven point scale ranging from very happy to very sad what we found was that when people were pursuing leisure activities that were expensive in terms of the outside resources required activities that demanded expensive equipment or electricity or other forms of energy measured in BTUs such as power boating, driving, or watching television, they were significantly less happy than when involved in inexpensive leisure. People were happiest when they were just talking to one another, when they gardened, knitted, or were involved in a hobby, all of these activities require few material resources, but they demand a relatively high investment of psychic energy. 
leisure that uses up extra resources, however, often requires less attention, and as a consequence it generally provides less memorable rewards. The Joys of Movement Sports and fitness are not the only media of physical experience that use the body as a source of enjoyment, for in fact a broad range of activities rely on rhythmic or harmonious movements to generate flow. Among these dance is probably the oldest and the most significant, both for its universal appeal and because of its potential complexity. From the most isolated New Guinea tribe to the polished troops of the Bolshoi Ballet, the response of the body to music is widely practiced as a way of improving the quality of experience. Older people may consider dancing at clubs a bizarre and senseless ritual, but many teenagers find it an important source of enjoyment. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 99 Here is how some of the dancers describe the sensation of moving on the floor, once I get into it, then I just float along, having fun, just feeling myself move around. I get sort of a physical high from it. I get very sweaty, very feverish or sort of ecstatic when everything is going really well. You move about and try to express yourself in terms of those motions. That's where it's at. It's a body language kind of communicative medium, in a way. When it's going good, I'm really expressing myself well in terms of music and in terms of the people that are out there. The enjoyment of dancing is often so intense that will give up many other options for its sake. Here is a typical statement from one of the dancers interviewed by Professor Massimini's group in Milan, Italy, from the very first I wanted to become a professional ballerina. It has been hard, little money, lots of traveling, and my mother always complains about my work. But love of the dance has always sustained me. It is now part of my life, a part of me that I could not live without. In this group of 60 professional dancers of marriageable age, only three were married, and only one had a child, pregnancy was seen as too great an interference with the career. But just as with athletics, one certainly need become a professional to enjoy controlling the expressive potentials of the body. Dilettante dancers can have just as much fun, without sacrificing every other goal for the sake of feeling themselves moving harmoniously. And there are other forms of expression that use the body as an instrument, aiming and acting, for instance. The popularity of charades as a parlor game is due to the fact that it allows people to shed for a time their customary identity, and act out different roles. Even the most silly and clumsy impersonation can provide an enjoyable relief from the limitations of everyday patterns of behavior, a glimpse into alternative modes of being. Sex Flow when people think of enjoyment, usually one of the first things that comes to mind is sex. This is not surprising, because sexuality is certainly one of the most universally rewarding experiences, surpassed in its power to motivate perhaps only by the need to survive, to drink, and to eat. The urge to have sex is so powerful that it can drain psychic energy away from other necessary goals. Therefore every culture has to invest great efforts in rechanneling and restraining it, and many complex social institutions exist only in order to regulate this. 100 Flow Urge The saying that, love makes the world go round, is a polite reference to the fact that most of our deeds are impelled, either directly or indirectly, by sexual needs. We wash, dress, and comb our hair to be attractive, Many of us go to work as to afford keeping a partner and a household. We struggle for status and power in part so as to be admired and loved. But is sex always enjoyable? By now the reader might be able to guess that the answer depends on what happens in the consciousness of those involved. The same sexual act can be experienced as painful, revolting, frightening, neutral, pleasant, pleasurable, enjoyable, or ecstatic depending on how it is linked to a person's goals. A rape may not be distinguishable physically from a loving encounter, but their psychological effects are worlds apart. It is safe to say that sexual stimulation in and of itself is generally pleasurable. That we are genetically programmed to derive pleasure from. Sexual 
Spirituality is evolution's rather clever way of guaranteeing that individuals will engage in activities likely to lead to procreation, thus ensuring the survival of the species. To take pleasure in sex one needs only to be healthy and willing, no special skills are required, and soon after the first experience, few new physical challenges arise again. But like other pleasures, unless it is transformed into an enjoyable activity, sex easily becomes boring with time. It turns from a genuinely positive experience into either a meaningless ritual or an addictive dependence. Fortunately there are many ways to make sex enjoyable. Eroticism is one form of cultivating sexuality that focuses on the development of physical skills. In a sense, eroticism is to sex as sport is to PHYS Eichel Act. The Kama Sutra and the Joy of Sex are two examples of manuals that aim to foster eroticism by providing suggestions and goals to help make sexual activity more varied, more interesting and challenging. Most Cultures have elaborate systems of erotic training and performance, often overlaid with religious meanings. Early fertility rites, the Dionysian Mys Teres of Greece, and the recurring connection between prostitution and female priesthood are just a few forms of this phenomenon. It is as if in the early stages of religion, cultures co-opted the obvious attraction of sexuality and used it as a basis on which to build more complex ideas and patterns of behavior. But the real cultivation of sexuality begins only when psychological dimensions are added to the purely physical. According to historians, the art of love was a recent development in the West. With rare exceptions, there was very little romance in the sexual practices of the Greeks and the Romans. The wooing, the sharing of feelings between lovers, the Mehali Csx Zent Mehali 101 Promises and the courtship rituals that now seem to be such indispensable attributes of Tsimate relations were only invented in the late Middle Ages by the troubadours who pied the castles of southern France, and then, as the sweet new style, they were adopted by the affluent classes in the rest of Europe. Romance The rituals of wooing first developed in the Romance region of southern France, provides an entire new range of challenges to lovers. For those who learn the skills necessary to meet them, it becomes not only pleasurable, but enjoyable as well. A similar refinement of sexuality took place in other civilizations, and roughly in the same not too distant past. The Japanese created extremely sophisticated professionals of love, expecting their geishas to be accomplished musicians, dancers, actresses, as well as appreciative of poetry and art. Chinese and Indian courtesans and Turkish odalisks were equally skillful. Regrettably this professionalism, while developing the potential complexity of sex to great heights, did little to improve directly the quality of experience for most people. Historically, romance seems to have been restricted to youth and to those who had the time and the money to indulge in it, the vast majority in any culture appear to have had a very humdrum sex life. Decent, people the world over do not spend too much energy on the task of sexual reproduction, or on the practices that have been built on it. Romance resembles sports in this respect as well, instead of doing it personally, most people are content to hear about it or watch a few experts perform it. A third dimension of sexuality begins to emerge when in addition to physical pleasure and the enjoyment of a romantic relationship the lover feels genuine care for his partner. There are then new challenges one discovers, to enjoy the partner as a unique person, to understand her, and to help her fulfill her goals. With the emergence of this third dimension, sexuality becomes a very complex process, one that can go on providing flow experiences all through life. At first it is very easy to obtain pleasure from sex, and even to enjoy it. Any fool can fall in love when young. The first, the first kiss, the first intercourse all present heady new challenges that keep the young person in flow for weeks on end. But for many this ecstatic state occurs only once, after the first love, all later relationships are no longer as exciting. It is especially difficult to keep enjoying sex with the same partner over a period of years. 
It is probably true that humans, like the majority of mammalian species, are not monogamous by nature. It is impossible for partners not to grow bored unless they work to discover new challenges in each other's company, and learn appropriate skills for. 102 Flow Enriching the relationship Initially physical challenges alone are enough to sustain flow, but unless romance and genuine care also develop, the relationship will grow stale. How to keep love fresh? The answer is the same as it is for any other activity. To be enjoyable, a relationship must become more complex. To become more complex, the partners must discover new potentialities in themselves and in each other. To discover these, they must invest attention in each other, so that they can learn what thoughts and feelings, what dreams reside in their partner's mind. This in itself is a never-ending process, a lifetime's task. After one begins to really know another person, then many joint adventures become possible, traveling together, reading the same books, raising children, making and realizing plans all become more enjoyable and more meaningful. The specific details are unimportant. Each person must find out which ones are relevant to his or her own seco. What is important is the general principle, that sexuality, like any other aspect of life, can be made enjoyable if we are willing to take control of it, and cultivate it in the direction of greater complicity. The Ultimate Control, Yoga and the Martial Arts When it comes to learning to control the body and its experiences, we are as children compared to the great Eastern civilizations. In many respects, what the West has accomplished in terms of harnessing material energy is matched by what India and the Far East have achieved in terms of direct control of consciousness. That neither of these approaches is, by itself, an ideal program for the conduct of life is shown by the fact that the Indian fascination with advanced techniques for self-control, at the expense of learning to cope with the material challenges of the physical environment, has conspired to let impotence and apathy spread over a great proportion of the population, defeated by scarcity of resources and by overcrowding. The Western mastery over material energy, on the other hand, runs the risk of turning everything it touches into a resource to be consumed as rapidly as possible, thus exhausting the environment. The perfect society would be able to strike a healthy balance between the spiritual and material. worlds, but short of aiming for perfection, we can look toward Eastern religions for guidance in how to achieve control over consciousness. Of the great Eastern methods for training the body, one of the oldest and most diffuse is the set of practices known as Hatha Yoga. It Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 103 is worth reviewing some of its highlights because it corresponds in several areas to what we know about the psychology of flow, and therefore provides a useful model for anyone who wishes to be in better charge of psychic energy. Nothing quite like Hatha Yoga has ever been created in the West. The early mystic routines instituted by Saint Benedict and Saint Dominic and especially the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius of Loyola probably come the closest in offering a way to control attention by developing mental and physical routines, but even these fall far short of the rigorous discipline of yoga. In Sanskrit yoga means, yuking, which refers to the method's goal of joining the individual with God, first by uniting the various parts of the body with one another, then making the body as a whole work together with consciousness as part of an ordered system. To achieve this aim, the basic text of yoga, compiled by Patanjali about 1500 years ago, prescribes eight stages of increasing skills. The first two stages of ethical preparation are intended to change a person's attitudes. We might say that they involve the straightening out of consciousness, they attempt to reduce psychic entropy as much as possible before the actual attempt mental control begin. In practice, the first step Yum, requires that one achieve, restraint, from acts and thoughts that might harm others, falsehood, eft, lust, and avarice. The second step, Nima, involves, obedience, 
or the following of ordered routines in cleanliness, study, and obedience board, all of which help to channel attention into predictable patterns, and hence make attention easier to control. The next two stages involve physical preparation, or development of habits that will enable the practitioner, or yogin, to overcome the demands of the senses, and make it possible for him to concentrate without growing tired or distracted. The third stage consists in practicing various asana, ways of sitting, or holding posture for long periods without succumbing to pain or fatigue. This is the stage of yoga that we all know in the West, exemplified by a fellow in works like diapers standing on his head with his shanks behind his neck. The fourth stage is pranayama, control, which aims to relax the body and stabilize the rhythm of breath ing. The fifth stage, the hinge between the preparatory exercises and the practice of yoga proper, is called pratyahara, withdrawal. It involves learning to withdraw attention from outward objects by directing the input of the senses, thus becoming able to see, hear, and feel only what one wishes to admit into awareness. Already at this stage we see how close the goal of yoga is to that of the flow activities described in 104 flow. This volume, to achieve control over what happens in the mind. Although the remaining three stages do not properly belong to the present chapter, they involve the control of consciousness through purely mental operations, rather than physical techniques, we shall discuss them here for the sake of continuity, also because these mental practices are, after all, solidly based on the earlier physical ones. Dhana, or, holding on, is the ability to concentrate for long periods on a single stimulus, and thus is the mirror image of the earlier stage of Pratyahara, first one learns to keep things out of the mind, then one learns to keep them in. Intense meditation, or dhyana, is the next step. Here one learns to forget the self in uninterrupted concentration that no longer needs the external stimuli of the preceding phase. Finally the yogin may achieve samadhi, the last stage of self-collectedness, when the meditator and the object of meditation become as one. Those who have achieved it describe Samadhi as the most joyful experience in their lives. The similarities between yoga and flow are extremely strong. In fact it makes sense to think of yoga as a very thoroughly planned flow activity. Both try to achieve a joyous, self-forgetful involvement through concentration, which in turn is made possible by a discipline of the body. Some critics, however, prefer to stress the differences between flow and yoga. Their main divergence is that, whereas flow attempts to fortify the self, the goal of yoga and many other eastern techniques is to abolish it. Samadhi, the last stage of yoga, is only the threshold entering nirvana, where the individual self merges with the universal force like a river blending into the ocean. Therefore, it can be argued, yoga and flow tend toward diametrically opposite outcomes. But this opposition may be more superficial than real. After all, seven of the eight stages of yoga involve building up increasingly higher levels of skill in controlling consciousness, samadhi and the liberation that is sub. To follow it may not, in the end, be that significant. They may in one sense be regarded as a justification of the activity that takes place in the previous seven stages, just as the peak of the mountain is important only because it justifies climbing, which is the real goal of the enterprise. Another argument favoring the similarity of the two processes is that, even till the final stage of liberation, the yogin must maintain control over consciousness. He could not surrender his self unless he was, even at the very moment of surrender, in complete control of it. Giving up the self with its instincts, habits, and desires is so unnatural an act that only someone supremely in control can accomplish it. Mehali CS Exent Mehali 105 Therefore it is not unreasonable to regard yoga as one of the oldest and most systematic methods of producing the flow experience. The details of how the experience is produced are unique to yoga, as they are unique to every other flow activity, 
from fly fishing to racing a Formula One car. As the product of cultural forces that occurred only once in history, Way of Yoga bears the stamp of the time and place in which it was created. Whether yoga is a better way to foster optimal experience than others cannot be decided on its own merits alone, one must consider the opportunity costs involved in the practice and compare them with alternative options. Is the control that yoga makes possible worth the investment of psychic energy that learning its discipline requires? Another set of Eastern disciplines that have become popular recently in the West are the so-called martial arts. There are many variations of these. And each year a new one seems to arrive. They include Judo, Jiu-Jitsu, Kung, Fu, Karate, Taekwondo, Aikido, Tai Chi Chuan, all forms of unarmed combat that originated in China, and Kend, Fencing, Kevayod, Archery, and Ninjutsu, which are more closely associated with Japan. These martial arts were influenced by Taoism and by Zen Buddhism, and thus they also emphasize consciousness controlling skills. Instead of focused exclusively on physical performance, as Western martial arts do, the Eastern variety is directed toward improving the mental and spiritual state of the practitioner. The warrior serves to reach the point where he can act with lightning speed against opponents, without having to think or reason about the best defensive or offensive moves to make. Those who can perform it well claim that fighting becomes a joyous artistic performance, during which the everyday experience of duality between mind and body is transformed into a harmonious one-pointedness of mind. Here. Again, it seems appropriate to think of the martial arts as a specific form of flow. Flow through the senses, the joy of seeing. It is easy to accept the fact that sports, sex, and even yoga can be enjoyable. But few people step beyond these physical activities to explore the almost unlimited capacities of the other organs of the body, even though any information that the nervous system can recognize lends itself to rich and varied flow experiences. Seeing, for instance, is most often used simply as a distant sensing. 106 Flow System, to keep from stepping on the cat, or to find the car keys. Occasion ally people stop to feast their eyes when a particularly gorgeous sight happens to appear in front of them, but they do not cultivate systematically the potential of their vision. Visual skills, however, can provide constant access to enjoyable experiences. Menander, the classical poet, well expressed the pleasure we can derive from just watching nature, the sun that lights us all, the stars, the sea, the train of clouds, the spark of fire, if you live a hundred years or only a few, you can never see anything higher than them. The visual arts are one of the best training grounds for developing these skills. Here are some descriptions by people worse in the arts about the sensation of really being able to see. The first recalls an almost zen-like encounter with the favorite painting, and emphasizes the sudden epiphany of order that seems to arise from seeing a work that embodies visual her. Moni, there is that wonderful season, bathers, in the Philadelphia Museum, which gives you in one glance that great sense of a scheme, not necessarily rational, but that thing come together. That is the way in which the work of art allows you to have a sudden appreciation of an understanding of the world. That may mean your place in it, that may mean what bathes on the side of a river on a summer day are all about, that may mean the ability to suddenly let go of ourselves and understand our connection to the world. Another viewer describes the unsettling physical dimension of the aesthetic flow experience, which resembles the shock a body feels when diving into a pool of cold water. When I see works that come close to my heart, that I think are really fine, I have the strangest reaction, which is not always exhilarating, it is sort of like being hit in the stomach. Feeling a little nauseous. It's just this sort of completely overwhelming feeling, which then I have to grope my way out of, calm myself down, and try to approach it scientifically, not with all my antennae vulnerable, open. What comes to you after looking at it calmly, 
after you have really digested every nuance and every little thread, is the total impact. When you encounter a very great work of art, you just know it and it thrills you in all your senses, not just visually, but sensually and intellectually. Not only great works of art produce such intense flow experiences, for the trained eye, even the most mundane sights can be delightful. A man who lives in one of Chicago's suburbs, and takes the elevated train to work every morning, says. Mehali CSX Zent Mehali 107 On a day like this, or days when it's crystal clear, I just sit in the train and look over the roofs of the city, because it's so fascinating to see the city, to be above it, to be there but not be a part of it, to see these forms and these shapes, these marvelous old buildings, some of which are totally ruined, and, I mean, just the fascination of the thing, the curiosity of it. I can come in and say, coming to work this morning was like coming through a Sheila Precisionist painting. Because he painted rooftops and things like that in a very crisp, clear style. It often happens that someone who's really wrapped up in a means of visual expression sees the world in those terms. Like a photographer looks at a sky and says, this is a Kodachrome sky. Way to go, God. You are almost as good as Kodak. Clearly, it takes training to be able to derive this degree of sensory delight from seeing. One must invest quite a bit of psychic energy in looking at beautiful sights and at good art before one can recognize the Sheila-like quality of the roof scale. But this is true of all flow activities, without cultivating the necessary skills, one cannot expect to take true enjoyment in a pursuit. Compared to several other activities, however, seeing is immediately accessible, although some artists contend that any people have tin eyes so it is a particular pity to let it rest undeveloped. It might seem like a contradiction that, in the previous section, we have shown how yoga induce flow by training the eyes not to see, whereas we are now advocating the use of the eyes to make flow happen. This is a contradiction only for those who believe that what is significant is the behavior, rather than the experience to which it leads. It does not matter. whether we see or we not see, as long as we are in control of what is happening to us. The same person can meditate in the morning and shut out all sensory experience, and then look at a great work of art in the afternoon, either way he may be transformed by the same sense of exhilaration. The flow of music. In every known culture, the ordering of sound in ways that please the ear has been used extensively to improve the quality of life. One of the most ancient and perhaps the most popular functions of music is to focus the listener's attention on patterns appropriate to a desired mood. So there is music for dancing, for weddings, for funerals, for religious and for patriotic occasion, music that facilitates romance, and music. 108 Flow that helps soldiers march in orderly ranks. When bad times befell the pygmies of the Ichiri forest in Central Africa, they assumed that their misfortune was due to the fact that the benevolent forest, which usually provided for all their needs, had accidentally fallen asleep. At that point the leaders of the tribe would dig up the sacred horns buried underground, and blow on them for days and nights on end, in an attempt to wake up the forest, thus restoring the good times. The way music is used in the Ichiri forest is paradigmatic of its function everywhere. The horns may not have awakened the trees, but their familiar sound must have reassured the pygmies that helped those on the way, and so they were able to confront the future with confidence. Most of the music that pours out of walkmans and stereos nowadays answers a similar need. Teenagers, who swing from one threat to their fragile evolving personhood, to another in quick succession throughout the day especially depend on the soothing patterns of sound to restore order in their consciousness. But so do many adults. One policeman told us, if after the day of making arrests and worrying about getting shot I could not turn on the radio in the car on my way home, I would probably go out of my mind. Music, which is organized auditory information, helps organize the mind that attends to it, and therefore reduces psychic entropy, 
or the disorder we experience when random information interferes with goals. Listening to music wards of boredom and anxiety, and when seriously attended to, it can induce flow experiences. Some people argue that technological advances have greatly improved the quality of life by making music so easily available. Transistor radios, laser discs, tape decks blare the latest music 24 hours a day in crystal clear recordings. This continuous access to good music is supposed to make our lives much richer. But this kind of argument suffers from the usual confusion between behavior and experience. Listening to recorded music for days on end may or may not be more enjoyable than hearing an hour-long live concert that one had been looking forward to for weeks. It is not the hearing that improves life, it is the listening. We hear Mozart, but we rarely listen to it, and few could have ever been in flow as a result of it. As with anything else, to enjoy a music one must pay attention to it. 2. The extent that recording technology makes music too accessible, and therefore taken for granted, it can reduce our ability to derive enjoyment from it. Before the advent of sound recording, a live musical performance retained some of the or that music engendered when it. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 109 was still entirely immersed in religious rituals. Even a village dance band, let alone a symphonic orchestra, was a visible reminder of the mysterious skill involved in producing harmonious sounds. One approached the event with heightened expectations, with the awareness that one had to pay close attention because the performance was unique and not to be repeated again. The audiences at today's live performances, such as rock concerts, continue to partake in some degree in these ritual elements, there are few other occasions at which large numbers of people witness the same event together, think and feel the same things, and process the information. Such joint participation produces in an audience the condition a mild domain called collective effervescence, or the sense that one belongs to a group with a concrete, real existence. This feeling, Dokane believed, was at the roots of religious experience. The very conditions of live perform. And help focus attention on the music, and therefore make it more likely. That flow will result at a concert than when one is listening to reproduced sound. But to argue that music is innately more enjoyable than recorded music would be just as invalid as arguing the opposite. Any sound can be be a source of enjoyment if attended to properly. In fact, as the Yakui Sacera taught the anthropologist Carlos Castaneda, even the intervals of silence between sounds, if listened to closely, can be exhilarating. Many people have impressive record libraries, full of the most exquisite music ever produced, yet they fail to enjoy it. They listen a few times to their recording equipment, marveling at the clarity of the sound it produces, and then forget to listen again until it is time to purchase a more advanced serum. Those who make the most of the potential for enjoyment inherent in music, on the other hand, have strategies for turning the experience into flow. They begin by setting aside specific hours for listening. When the time comes, they depend concentration by dozing the lights, by sitting in a favorite chair, or by following some other ritual that will focus attention. They plan carefully the selection to be played, and formulate specific goals for the session to come. Listening to music usually starts as a sensory experience. At this stage, one responds to the qualities of sound that induce the pleasant physical reactions that are genetically wired into our nervous system. We respond to certain chords that seem to have universal appeal, or to the plaintive cry of the flute, the rousing call of the trumpets. We are particularly sensitive to the rhythm of the drums or the bass, the beat on which rock music rests, and which some content is supposed to. 110 Flow Remind the listener of the mother's throbbing heart first heard in the womb. The next level of challenge music presence is the analogic mode of listen ing. In this stage, one develops the skill to evoke links and images based on the patterns of sound. The mournful saxophone passage recalls the sense of what one has when watching storm clouds build up over the prairie, 
the Tchaikovsky piece makes one visualize a sleigh driving through a snowbound forest, with its bells tinkling. Popular songs of course explore the analogic mode its fullest by cueing in the listener with lyrics that spell out what mood or what story the music is supposed to represent. The most complex stage of music listening is the analytic one. In this mode attention shifts to the structural elements of music, instead of the sensory or narrative ones. Listening skills at this level involve the ability to recognize the order underlying the work, and the means by which the harmony was achieved. They include the ability to evaluate critically the performance and the acoustics, to compare the piece with earlier and later pieces of the same composer, or with the work of other composers writing at the same time, and to compare the orchestra, conductor, or band with their own earlier and later performances, or with the interpretations of others. Analytic listeners often compare various versions of the same blues song, or sit down to listen with an agenda that might typically be, let's see how Juan Karajan's 1975 recording of the second movement of the same Nth Symphony differs from his 1963 recording, or, wonder if the brass section of the Chicago Symphony is really better than the Berlin Brasses. Having set such goals, a listener becomes an active experience that provides constant feedback, e.g., Juan Karajan has slowed down, the Berlin brusses are sharper but less mellow. As one develops analytic listening skills, the opportunities to enjoy a music increase geometrically. So far we have considered only how flow arises from listening, but even greater rewards are open to those who learn to make music. The civilizing power of Apollo depended on his ability to play the ayah, and drove his audiences to frenzy with his pipes and Orpheus with his music was able to restrain even death. These legends point to the connection between the ability to create harmony in sound and the more general and abstract harmony that underlies the kind of social order we call a civilization. Mindful of that connection, Plato believed that children should be taught music before anything else, in learning to pay attention to graceful rhythms and harmonies their whole consciousness would become ordered. C.S. Ixent Mehali 111 Our culture seems to have been placing a decreasing emphasis on expose ing young children to musical skills. Whenever cuts are to be made in a school's budget, courses in music, as well as art and physical education, are the first to be eliminated. It is discouraging how these three basic skills, so important for improving the quality of life, are generally considered to be superfluous in the current educational climate. Deprived of serious exposure to music, children grow into teenagers who make up for their early deprivation by investing inordinate amounts of psychic energy into their own music. They form rock groups, buy tapes and records, and generally become captives of a subculture that does not offer many opportunities for making consciousness more complex. Even when children are taught music, the usual problem arises, too much emphasis is placed on how they perform, and too little on what they experience. Parents who push their children to excel at the violin are generally not interested in whether the children are actually enjoying the playing, they want the child to perform well enough to attract attention, to win prizes, and to end up on the stage of Carnegie Hall. By doing so, they succeed in perverting music into the opposite of what it was designed to be, they turn it into a source of psychic disorder. Parental expectations for musical behavior often create great stress, and sometimes a complete breakdown. Lauren Hollander, who was a child prodigy at the piano and whose perfectionist father played first violin in Toscanini's orchestra, tells how he used to get lost in ecstasy when playing the piano alone but how he used to quake in sheer terror when his demanding adult mentors were present. When he was a teenager the fingers of his hands froze during a concert recital, and he could not open his clawed hands for many years thereafter. Some subconscious mechanism below the threshold of his awareness had decided to spare him the constant pain of parental criticism. Now Hollander recovered from the psychologically induced paralysis spends much of his time helping other gifted young instrumentalists to enjoy a music the way it is meant to be enjoyed. Although playing an instrument is best learned when young, it is really never too late to start. 
Some music teachers specialize in adult and older students, and many a successful businessman decides to learn the piano after age 50. Singing in a choir and playing in an amateur string ensemble are two of the most exhilarating ways to experience the blending of one's skills with those of others. Personal computers now come with sophisticated software that makes composition easy and allows one to listen immediately to the orchestration. Learning to produce harmon. 112 flow. Nice sounds is not only enjoyable, but like the mastery of any complex skill, it also helps strengthen the self. The joys of tasting. Gioacchino Rossini, the composer of William Tell and many other operas, had a good grasp of the relationship between music and food, what love is to the heart, appetite is to the stomach. The stomach is the conductor that leads and livens a great orchestra of our emotions. If music modulates our feelings, so does food, and all the fine cuisines of the world are based on that knowledge. The musical metaphor is echoed by Heinz Meyer Leibniz, the German physicist who has recently written several cookbooks, The Joy of Cooking at Home, he says, compared to eating in one of the best restaurants, is like playing a string quartet in the living room as compared to a great concert. For the first few hundred years of American history, food preparation was generally approached in a no-nonsense manner. Even as late as 25 years ago, general attitude was that, feeding your face, was alright, but to make too much fuss about it was somehow decadent. In the past two decades, of course, the trend has reversed itself so sharply that earlier misgivings about gastronomic excesses seem almost to have been justified. Now we have foodies and in freaks who take the pleasures of the palate as seriously as if they were rites in a brand new religion. Gourmet journals proliferate, the frozen food sections of supermarkets bulge with esoteric culinary concoctions, and all sorts of chefs run popular shows on TV. Not so long ago, Italian or Greek cuisine was considered the height of exotic fare. Now one finds excellent Vietnamese, Moroccan, or Peruvian restaurants in parts of the country where a generation earlier one couldn't find anything but steak and potatoes for a radius of a hundred miles around. Of the many lifestyle changes that have taken place in the United States in the past few decades, few have been as startling as the turnabout concerning food. Eating, like sex, is one of the basic pleasures built into our nervous system. The ESM studies done with electronic pagers have shown that even in our highly technological urban society, people still feel most happy and relaxed. At mealtimes, although while at table they lack some of the other dining science of the flow experience, such as high concentration, a sense of strength, and a feeling of self-esteem. But in every culture, the simple process of ingesting calories has been transformed with time into an art form that provides enjoyment as well as pleasure. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 113 The preparation of food has developed in history according to the same principles as all other flow activities. First, people took advantage of the opportunities for action, in the days, the various edible substances in their environment, and as a result of attending carefully they were able to make finer and finer distinctions between the properties of foodstuffs. They discovered that salt preserves meats, that eggs are good for coating and binding, and that garlic, although hard tasting by itself, has medicinal properties and if used judiciously imparts subtle flavors to a variety of dishes. Once aware of these properties, people could experiment with them and then develop rules for putting together the various substances in the most pleasing combinations. These rules became the various cuisines, their variety provides a good illustration of the almost infinite range of flow experiences that can be evoked with a relatively limited number of edible ingredients. Much of this culinary creativity was sparked by the jaded palates of Princess. Referring to Cyrus the Great, who ruled Persia about 25 centuries ago, Xenophon writes with perhaps a touch of exaggeration, men travel over the whole earth in the service of the king of Persia, looking to find out what may be pleasant for him to drink.
and 10,000 men are always contriving something nice for him to eat. But experimentation with food was by no means confined to the ruling classes. Peasant women in Eastern Europe, for instance, were not judged to be ready for marriage unless they had learned to cook a different soup each day of the year. In our culture, despite the recent spotlight on gourmet cuisine, many people still barely notice what they put in their mouths, thereby missing a potentially rich source of enjoyment. To transform the biological necessity of feeding into a flow experience, one must begin by paying attention to what one eats. It is astonishing, as well as discouraging, when guests swallow lovingly prepared food without any sign of having noticed its virtues. What a waste of rare experience is reflected in that insensitivity. Developing a discriminating palate, like any other skill, requires the instrument of psychic energy. But the energy invested is returned many times over in a more complex experience. The individuals who really enjoy eating develop with time an interest in a peculiar cuisine, and get to know its history and its peculiarities. They learn to cook in that idiom, not just single dishes, but entire meals that reproduce the culinary ambience of the region. If they specialize in Middle Eastern food, they know how to make the best hummus, where to find the best tahini or the freshest eggplant. If their predilection includes the 114 flow foods of Venice, they learn what kind of sausage goes best with polenta, and what kind of shrimp is the best substitute for scampi. Like all other sources of flow related to bodily skills, like sport, sex, and aesthetic visual experiences, the cultivation of taste only leads to enjoyment if one takes control of the activity. As long as one strives to become a gum or a connoisseur of wines because it is the in thing to do, striving to master an externally imposed challenge, then taste may easily turn sour. But a cultivated palate provides many opportunities for flow if one ap approaches eating and cooking in a spirit of adventure and curiosity, exploring the potentials of food for the sake of the experience rather than as a showcase for one's expertise. The other danger in becoming involved with culinary delights, and here again parallels with sex are obvious, is that they can become addictive. It is not by chance that gluttony and lechery were included among the seven deadly sins. The fathers of the church well understood that in fatuation with the pleasures of the flesh could easily drain psychic energy away from other goals. The Puritans' mistrust of enjoyment is grounded in the reasonable fear that given a taste of what they are genetically programmed to desire, people will want more of it, and will take time away from the necessary routines of everyday life in order to satisfy their craving. But repression is not the way to virtue. When people restrain themselves out of fear, their lives are by necessity diminished. They become rigid and defensive, and their self stops growing. Only through freely chosen discipline can life be enjoyed, and still kept within the bounds of reason. If a person learns to control his instinctual desires, not because he has to, but because he wants to, he can enjoy himself without becoming addicted. A fanatical devotee of food is just as boring to himself and to others as the ascetic who refuses to indulge his taste. Between these two extremes, there is quite a bit of room for improving the quality of life. In the metaphorical language of several religions, the body is the temple of God, or the vessel of God, imagery to which even an atheist should be able to relate. The integrated cells and organs that make up the human organism are an instrument that allows us to get in touch with the rest of the universe. The body is like a probe full of sensitive devices that tries to obtain what information it can from the awesome reaches of space. It is through the body that we are related to one another and to the rest of the world. While this connected self may be quite obvious, what we tend to forget is how enjoyable it can. Mehali CSX and Mehali 115 B. Our physical apparatus has evolved so that whenever we use its sensing devices they produce a positive sensation, and the whole organism resonates in harmony. To realize the body's potential for flow is relatively easy. 
It does not require special talents or great expenditures of money. Everyone can greatly improve the quality of life by exploring one or more previously ignored dimensions of physical abilities. Of course, it is difficult for any one person to reach high levels of complexity in more than one physical domain. The skills necessary to become good athletes, dancers, or connoisseurs of sights, sounds, or tastes are so demanding that one individual does not have enough psychic energy in his waking lifetime to master more than a few. But it is certainly possible to become a dilettante, in the finest sense of that word, in all these areas, in other words, to develop sufficient skills so as to find delight in what the body can do. 116 Flow 6 The Flow Of Thought The good things in life do not come only through the senses. Some of the most exhilarating experiences we undergo are generated inside the mind, triggered by information that challenges our ability to think, rather than from the use of sensory skills. As Sir Francis Bacon noted almost 400 years ago, wonder, which is the seed of knowledge, is the reflection of the purest form of pleasure. Just as there are flow activities corresponding to every physical potential of the body, every mental operation is able to provide its own particular form of enjoyment. Among the many intellectual pursuits available, reading is currently perhaps the most often mentioned flow activity around the world. Solving mental puzzles is one of the oldest forms of enjoyable activity, the precursor of philosophy and modern science. Some individuals have become so skilled at interpreting musical notation that they no longer need to listen to the actual notes to enjoy a piece of music, and prefer reading the score of a symphony to hearing it. The imaginary sounds dancing in their minds are more perfect than any actual performance could be. Similarly, people who spend much time with art come to appreciate increasingly the effective, historical, and cultural aspects of the work they are viewing, occasionally more than they enjoy its purely visual aspects. As one professional involved in the arts expressed it, works of art that I personally respond to have behind them a 117 lot of conceptual, political, and intellectual activity. The visual representations are really signposts to this beautiful machine that has been constructed, unique on the earth, and is not just a rehashing of visual elements, but is really a new thought machine that an artist, through visual means and combining his eyes with his perceptions, has created. What this person sees in a painting is not just a picture, but a thought machine that includes the painter's emotions, hopes, and ideas, as well as the spirit of the culture and the historical period in which he lived. With careful attention, one can discern a similar mental dimension in physically enjoyable activities like athletics, food, or sex. We might say that making a distinction between flow activities that involve functions of the body and those that involve the mind is to some extent spurious, for all physical activities must involve a mental component if they are to be enjoyable. Athletes know well that to improve performance beyond a certain point. They must learn to discipline their minds and the intrinsic rewards they get include a lot more than just physical well-being, they experience a sense of personal accomplishment, and increased feelings of self-esteem. Conversely, most mental activities also rely on the physical dimension. Chess, for instance, is one of the most cerebral game there is, yet advanced chess players train by running and swimming because they are aware that if they are physically unfit will not be able to sustain the long periods of mental concentration that chess tournaments require. In yoga, the control of consciousness is prepared for by learning to control bodily processes, and the former blends seamlessly into the latter. Thus, although flow always involves the use of muscle and nerve, on one hand, and will, thought, and feelings on the other, it does make sense to differentiate a class of activities that are enjoyable because they order the mind directly, rather than through the mediation of bodily feel. Things. These activities are primarily symbolic in nature, 
in that they depend on natural languages, mathematics, or some other abstract notation system like a computer language to achieve their ordering effects in the mind. A symbolic system is like a game in that it provides a separate reality, a world of its own where one can perform actions that are permitted to occur in that world, but that would not make much sense anywhere else. In symbolic systems, the action is usually restricted to the mental manipulation of concepts. To enjoy a mental activity, one must meet the same conditions that make physical activities enjoyable. There must be skill in a symbolic domain, there have to be rules, a goal, and a way of obtaining feedback. 118 Flow One must be able to concentrate and interact with the opportunities at a level commensurate with one's skills. In reality, to achieve such an ordered mental condition is not as easy as it sounds. Contrary to what we tend to assume, the normal state of the mind is chaos. Without training, and without an object in the external world that demands attention, people are able to focus their thoughts for more than a few minutes at a time. It is relatively easy to concentrate when attention is structured by outside stimuli, such as when a movie is playing on the screen, or when while driving heavy traffic is encountered on the road. If one is reading an exciting book, the same thing occurs, but most readers still begin to lose concentration after a few pages, and their minds wander away from the plot. At that point, if they wish to continue reading, they must make an effort to force their attention back to the page. We don't usually notice how little control we have over the mind, because habits channel psychic energy so that thoughts seem to follow each other by themselves without a hitch. After sleeping we regain consciousness in the morning when the alarm rings, and then walk to the bathroom and brush our teeth. The social rules culture prescribes then take care of shaping our minds for us, and we generally place ourselves on automatic pilot till the end of the day, when it is time again to lose consciousness in sleep. But when we are left alone, with no demands on attention, the basic disorder of the mind reveals itself. With nothing to do, it begins to follow random patterns, usually stopping to consider something painful or disturbing. Unless a person knows how to give order to his or her thoughts, attention will be attracted to whatever is most problematic at the moment, it will focus on some real or imaginary pain, on recent grudges or long-term frustrations. Entropy is the normal state of consciousness, a condition that is neither useful nor enjoyable. To avoid this condition, people are naturally eager to fill their minds with whatever information is readily available, as long as it distracts a cane shun from turning inward and dwelling on negative feelings. This explains why such a huge proportion of time is invested in watching television, despite the fact that it is very rarely enjoyed. Compared to other sources of stimulation, like reading, talking to other people, or working on a hobby, TV can provide continuous and easily accessible information that will structure the viewer's attention at a very low cost in terms of the psychic energy that needs to be invested. While people watch television, they need not fear that their drifting minds will force them to face disturbing personal problems. It is understandable. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 119 That, once one develops this strategy for overcoming psychic entropy, to give up the habit becomes almost impossible. The better route for avoiding chaos in consciousness, of course, is through habits that give control over mental processes to the individual, rather than to some external source of stimulation, such as the programs of network TV. To acquire such habits requires practice, however, and the kind of goals and rules that are inherent in flow activities. For instance, one of the simplest ways to use the mind is daydreaming, playing out some sequence of events as mental images. But even this apparently easy way to order thought is beyond the range of many people. Jerome Singer, the Yale psychologist who has studied daydreaming and mental imagery more than perhaps any other scientist, has shown that daydreaming is a skill that many children never learn to use. Yet daydreaming not only helps create emotional order by compensating in imagination for unpleasant reality, as when a person 
can reduce frustration and aggression against someone who has caused injury by visualizing a situation in which the aggressor is punished, but it also allows children and adults to rehearse imaginary situations so that the best strategy for confronting them may be adopted. Alternative options considered. Unanticipated consequences discovered. All results that help increase the complexity of consciousness. And, of course, when used with skill, daydreaming can be very enjoyable. If reviewing the conditions that help establish order in the mind, we shall first look at the extremely important role of memory, then at how words can be used to produce flow experiences. Next we shall consider three symbolic systems that are very enjoyable if one comes to know their rules, history, science, and philosophy. Many more fields of study could have been mentioned, but these three can serve as examples for the others. Each one of these mental games is accessible to anyone who wants to play them. The Mother of Science The Greeks personified memory as Lady Nemosin. Of the nine muses, she was believed to have given birth to all the arts and sciences. It is valid to consider memory the oldest mental skill, from which all others derive, for, if we weren't able to remember, we couldn't follow the rules that make other mental operations possible. Neither logic nor poetry could exist, and the rudiments of science would have to be rediscovered with each new generation. The primacy of memory is true first of all in terms of the history of the species. Before written. 120 flow. Notation systems were developed. All learned information had to be transmitted from the memory of one person to that of another. And it is true also in terms of the history of each individual human being. A person who cannot remember is cut off from the knowledge of prior experiences, unable to build patterns of consciousness that bring order to the mind. As Bunuel has said, life without memory is no life at all. Our memory is our coherence, our reason, our feeling, even our action. Without it, we are nothing. All forms of mental flow depend on memory, either directly or indirectly. History suggests that the oldest way of organizing information involved recalling one's ancestors, the line of descent that gave each person his or her identity as member of a tribe or a family. It is not by chance that the Old Testament, especially in the early books, contains so much genealogical information, e.g., Genesis 10, 26-29, the descendants of Joktan were the people of Almud, Shalef. Hazar Mavith, Jerah, Hathoram, Yuzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimil, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Oban. Knowing one's origins, and to whom one was related, was an indispensable method for creating social order when no other basis for order existed. In preliterate cultures reciting lists of ancestors' names is a very important activity even today and it is one in which the people who can do it take a great delight. Remembering is enjoyable because it entails fulfilling a goal and brings order to consciousness. We all know the little spark of satisfaction that comes when we remember where we put the car keys, or any other object that has been temporarily misplaced. To remember a long list of elders, going back a dozen generations, is particularly enjoyable in that it satisfies the need to find a place in the ongoing stream of life. To recall one's insist horse places the recaller at the link in a chain that starts in the mythical past and extends into the unfathomable future. Even though in our culture Lin, each histories have lost all practical significance, people still enjoy thinking and talking about their roots. It was not only their origins that our ancestors had to commit to memory, but all other facts bearing on their ability to control the environment. Lists of edible herbs and fruits, health tips, rules of behavior, patterns of inheritance, laws, geographical knowledge, rudiments of technology, and pearls of wisdom were all bundled into easily remembered sayings or words. Before printing became readily available in the last few hundred years, much of human knowledge was condensed in forms similar to the alphabet song, which puppets now sing on children's television shows such as Sesame Street. According to Jonah Huizinga, 
the great Dutch cultural historian. Mehali C.S.E. Zent Mehali 121 Among the most important precursors of systematic knowledge were riddling games. In the most ancient cultures, the elders of the tribe would challenge each other to contests in which one person sang a text filled with hidden references, and the other person had to interpret the meaning and code his song. A competition between expert riddlers was often the most stimulating intellectual event the local community could witness. The forms of the riddle anticipated the rules of logic, and its content was used to transmit factual knowledge our ancestors needed to preserve. Some of the riddles were fairly simple and easy, like the following rhyme sung by ancient Welsh minstrel and translated by Lady Charlotte Guest. Discover what it is, the strong creature from before the flood without flesh, without bone, without vein, without blood, without head, without feet. In field, in forest, without hand, without foot. It is also as wide as the surface of the earth, and it was not born, nor was it seen. The answer in this case is, the wind. Other riddles that the druids and minstrels committed to memory were much longer and more complex, and contained important bits of secret lore disguised in cunning verses. Robert Graves, for instance, thought that the early wise men of Ireland and Wales stored their knowledge in poems that were easy to remember. Often they used elaborate secret codes, as when the names of trees stood for letters, and a list of trees spelled out words. Lines 6770 of the Battle of the Trees, a strange, long poem sung by ancient Welsh minstrels. The elders in the front line began the affray. Willow and Robin Tree were tardy in array. Encoded the letters F, which in the secret druidic alphabet was represented by the elder tree, S, Willow, and L, Robin. In this fashion, the 122 flow. Few druids who knew how to use letters could sing a song ostensibly referring to a battle among the trees of the forest, which actually spelled out a message only initiates could interpret. Of course, the solution of riddles does not depend exclusively on memory, specialized knowledge and a great deal of imagination and problem-solving ability are also required. But without a good memory one could not be a good riddle master, nor could one become proficient at any other mental skill. As far back as there are records of human intelligence, the most prized mental gift has been a cultivated memory. My grandfather at 70 could still recall passages from the 3000 line of the Iliad he had to learn by heart in Greek to graduate from high school. Whenever he did so, a of pride settled on his features, as his unfocused eyes ranged over the horizon. With each unfolding cadence, his mind returned to the years of his youth. The words evoked experiences he had had when he first learned them, remembering poetry was for him a form of time travel. For people in his generation, knowledge was still synonymous with memorization. Only in the past century, as written records have become less expensive and more easily available, has the importance of remember ing dramatically declined. Nowadays a good memory is considered useless except for performing on some game shows or for playing Reveal Pursuit. But for a person who has nothing to remember, life can become severely impoverished. This possibility was completely overlooked by educational reformers early in this century, who, armed with research results, proved that, rote learning, was not an efficient way to store and acquire information. As a result of their efforts, rote learning was phased out of the schools. The reformers would have had justification, if the point of remembering was simply to solve practical problems. But if control of consciousness is judged to be at least as important as the ability to get things done, then learning complex paths of information by heart is by no means a waste of effort. A mind with some stable content to it is much richer than one without. It is a mistake to assume that creativity and rote learning are incompatible. Some of the most original scientists, for instance, have been known to have memorized music, poetry, or historical information extensively. Person who can remember stories, poems, lyrics of songs, 
baseball statistics, chemical formulas, mathematical operations, historical dates, biblical passages, and wise quotations has many advantages over one who has not cultivated such a skill. The consciousness of independent of the order that may or may not be provided by the environment. She can always amuse herself and find meaning in the Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 123 Contents of her mind While others need external stimulation, television, reading, conversation, or drugs to keep their minds from drifting into chaos, the person whose memory is stocked with patterns of information is autonomous and self-contained. Additionally, such a person is also a much more cherished companion because she can share the information in her mind and thus help bring order into the consciousness of those with she interacts. How can one find more value in memory? The most natural way to begin is to decide what subject one is really interested in, poetry, fine cuisine, the history of the civil war, or baseball, and then start paying attention to key facts and figures in that chosen area. With the good grasp of the subject will come the knowledge of what earth remembering and what is not. The important thing to recognize here is that you should not feel that you have to absorb a string of facts, that there is a right list you must memorize. If you decide what you would like to in memory, the information will be under your control, and the whole process of learning a heart will become a pleasant task, instead of a chore imposed from outside. A civil war buff need not feel compelled to know the sequence of dates of all major engagements, if, for instance, he is interested in the role of the artillery, then only those battles where cannons played an important part need concern him. Some people carry with them the texts of choice poems or quotations written on pieces of paper, to glance over whenever they feel bored or dispirited. It is amazing what a sense of control it gives to know that favorite facts or lyrics are always at hand. Once they are stored in memory, however, this feeling of ownership, or better, of connectedness with the content recalled, becomes even more intense. Of course there is always a danger that the person who has mastered a domain of information will use it to become overbearing bore. We all know people who cannot resist flaunting their memory. But this usually occurs when someone memorizes only in order to impress others. It is less likely that one will become a bore when one is intrinsically motivated, with a genuine interest in the material, and a desire to control consciousness, rather than in controlling the environment. The Rules of the Games of the Mind Memory is not the only tool needed to give shape to what takes place in the mind. It is useless to remember facts unless they fit into patterns, unless one finds likenesses and regularities among them. The simplest ordering system is to give names to things, the words we invent trans. 124 flow. Form discrete events into universal categories. The power of the word is immense. In Genesis 1, God names day, night, sky, earth, sea, and all the living things after he creates them, thereby completing the process of creation. The Gospel of John begins with, Before the world was created, the word already existed, and Heclitus starts his now almost completely lost volume, this word, Logos, is from everlasting, yet men understand it as little after the first hearing of it as before. All these references suggest the importance of words in controlling experience. The building blocks of most symbol systems, words make abstract thinking possible and increase the mind's capacity to store the stimuli it has attended to. Without systems for ordering information, even the clearest memory will find consciousness in a state of After names came numbers and concepts, and then the primary rules, combining them in predictable ways. By the 6th century BC Pythagoras, and his students had embarked on the immense ordering task that attempted to find common numerical laws binding together astronomy, geometry, music, and arithmetic. Not surprisingly, their work was difficult to distinguish from religion, since it tried to accomplish similar goals, 
to find a way of expressing the structure of the universe. 2000 years later, Kepler and then Newton were still on the same quest. Theoretical thinking has never completely lost the imagistic, puzzle-like qualities of the earliest riddles. For example Archytas, the 4th century B.C. philosopher and commander-in-chief of the city-state of Tarentum, now in southern Italy, proved that the universe had no limits by asking himself, supposing that I came to the outer limits of the universe. If I now thrust out a stick, what would I find? Archytas thought that the stick must have ejected out into space. But in that case there was space beyond the limits of the universe, which meant that the universe had no bounds. If Archytas's reasoning appears primitive, it is useful to recall that the intellectual experiments Einstein used to clarify to himself how relativity worked, concerning clocks seen from trains moving at different speeds, were not that different. Besides stories and riddles all civilizations gradually developed more systematic rules for combining information, in the form of geometric representations and formal proofs. With the help of such formulas it became possible to describe the movement of the stars, predict precisely seasonal cycles, and accurately map the Earth. Abstract knowledge, and finally what we know as experimental science, grew out of these rules. Mehali C.S. Ixent Mehali 125 It is important to stress here a fact that is all often lost sight of. Philosophy and science were invented and flourished because thinking is pleasurable. If thinkers did not enjoy the sense of order that the use of SIL logisms and numbers creates in consciousness, it is very unlikely that now we would have the disciplines of mathematics and physics. This claim, however, flies in the face of most current theories of cultural development. Historians imbued with variants of the precepts of material determinism hold that thought is shaped by what people must do to make a living. The evolution of arithmetic and geometry, for instance, is explained almost exclusively in terms of the need for accurate astronomical knowledge and for the irrigational technology that was indispensable in maintaining the great hydraulic civilizations located along the course of large rivers like the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Indus, the Chanjian, Yants, and the Nile. For these historians, every creative step is interpreted as the product of extrinsic forces, whether they be wars, demographic pressures, territorial ambitions, market conditions, technological necessity, or the struggle for class supremacy. External forces are very important in determining which new ideas will be selected from among the many available, but they cannot explain their production. It is perfectly true, for instance, that the development and application of the knowledge of atomic energy were expedited enormously by the life and death struggle over the bomb between Germany on the one hand, and England and the United States on the other. But the science that formed the basis of nuclear fission owed very little to the war, it was made possible through knowledge laid down in more peaceful circumstances, for example, in the friendly exchange of ideas European physicists had over the years in the beer garden turned over to Niels Bohr and his scientific colleagues by a brewery in Copenhagen. Great thinkers have always been motivated by the enjoyment of thinking, rather than by the material rewards that could be gained by it. Democritus one of the most original minds of antiquity, was highly respected by his countrymen, the Abderites. However, they had no idea what Democritus was about. Watching him sit is immersed in thought, they assumed he was acting unnaturally, and must be ill. So they sent for Hippocrates, the great doctor, to see what ailed their sage. After Hippocrates, who was not only a good medical man but also wise, discussed with Democritus the absurdities of life, he reassured the townspeople that their philosopher was, if anything, only too sane. He was not losing his mind, he was lost in the flow of thought. The surviving fragments of Democritus's writing illustrate how 126 flow 
Rewarding, he found the practice of thinking to be, it is godlike ever to think on something beautiful and on thing new. Happiness does not reside in strength or money, it lies in rightness and many-sidedness. I would rather discover one true cause than gain the kingdom of Persia. Not surprisingly, some of his more enlightened contemporaries concluded that Democritus had a cheerful disposition, and said that he, called cheerfulness, and often confidence, that is a mind devoid of fear, the highest good. In other words, he enjoyed life because he had learned to control his consciousness. Democritus was neither the first nor the last thinker to be lost in the flow of the mind. Philosophers have frequently been regarded as being absent-minded, which of course means not that their minds were lost, but that they had temporarily tuned out of everyday reality to dwell among the symbolic forms of their favorite domain of knowledge. When Kant Sup Postly placed his watch in a pot of boiling water while holding an egg in his hand to time its cooking, all his psychic energy was probably invested in bringing abstract thoughts into harmony, leaving no attention free to meet the incidental demands of the concrete world. The point is that playing with ideas is extremely exhilarating. Not only philosophy but the emergence of new scientific ideas is fueled by the enjoyment one obtains from creating a new way to describe reality. Tools that make the flow of thought possible are common property, and consist of the knowledge recorded in books available in schools and libraries. A person who becomes familiar with the conventions of poetry, or the rules of calculus, can subsequently grow independent of external stimulation. She can generate ordered trains of thought regardless of what is happening in external reality. When a person has learned a symbolic system well enough to use it, she has established a portable, self-contained world within the mind. Sometimes having control over such an internalized symbol system can save one's life. It has been claimed, for instance, that the reason there are more poets per capita in Iceland than in any other country of the world is that reciting the sagas became a way for the Icelanders to keep their consciousness ordered in an environment exceedingly hostile to human existence. For centuries the Icelanders have not only preserved in memory but also added new verses to the epics chronicling the deeds of their ancestors. Isolated in the freezing night, they used to chant their poems huddled around fires in precarious huts, while outside the winds, the interminable arctic winters howled. If the Icelanders had spent all those nights in silence listening to the mocking wind, there. Mehali C.S. Exent Mehali 127 Minds would have soon filled with dread and despair. By mastering the orderly cadence of man and rhyme, and encasing the events of their own lives in verbal images, they succeeded instead in taking control of their experiences. In the face of chaotic snowstorms they created songs with form and meaning. To what extent did the sagas help the Icelanders endure? Would they have survived without them? There is no way to answer these questions with certainty. But who would dare to try the experiment? Similar conditions hold true when individuals are suddenly wrenched from civilization, and find themselves in those extreme situations we described earlier, such as concentration camps or polar expeditions. Whenever the outside world offers no mercy, an internal symbolic system can become a salvation. And even in possession of portable rules for the mind has a great advantage. In conditions of extreme deprivation poets, mathematicians, musicians, historians, and biblical experts have stood out. as islands of sanity surrounded by the waves of chaos. To a certain extent, farmers who know the life of the fields or lumbermen who understand the forest have a similar support system, but because their knowledge is less abstractly coded, they have more need to interact with the actual environment to be in control. Let us hope none of us will be forced to call upon symbolic skills to survive concentration camps or arctic ordeals. But having a portable set of rules that the mind can work with is of great benefit even in normal life. People without an internalized symbolic system can all too easily become captives of the media. They are easily manipulated by demagogues, pacified by entertainers, and exploited by anyone who has something to sell. 
if we have become dependent on television, on drugs, and on facile calls to political or religious salvation, it is because we have so little to fall back on, so few internal rules to keep our mind from being taken over by those who claim to have the answers without the capacity to provide its own information, the mind drifts into randomness. It is within each person's power to decide whether its order will be restored from the outside, in ways over which we have no control, or whether the order will be the result of an internal pattern that grows organically from our skills and knowledge. The play of words. How does one start mastering a symbolic system? It depends, of course, on what domain of thought one is interested in exploring. We have seen that the most ancient and perhaps basic set of rules governs the usage. 128 flow of words. And today words still offer many opportunities to enter flow at various levels of complexity. A somewhat trivial but nevertheless illuminating example concerns working crossword puzzles. There is much to be said in favor of this popular pastime, which in its best form resembles the ancient riddle contests. It is inexpensive and portable, its challenges can be finely graduated so that both novices and experts can enjoy it, and its solution produces a sense of pleasing order that gives one a satisfying feeling of accomplishment. It provides opportunities to experience a mild state of flow to many people who are stranded in airport lounges, who travel on commuter trains, or who are simply whiling away Sunday mornings. But if one is confined to simply solving crosswords, one remains dependent on an external stimulus, the challenge provided by an expert in the Sunday supplement or puzzle magazine. To be really autonomous. In this domain, a better alternative is to make up one's own crosswords. Then there is no longer need for a pattern to be imposed from the outside, one is completely free. And the enjoyment is more profound. It is not very difficult to learn to write crossword puzzles. I know a child of eight who, after trying his hand at a few Sunday puzzles in the New York Times, began writing his own quite creditable crosswords. Of course, as with any skill worth developing, this one, too, requires that one invest psychic energy in it at the beginning. A more substantive potential use of words to enhance our lives is the lost art of conversation. Utilitarian ideologies in the past two centuries or so have convinced us that the main purpose of talking is to convey useful information. Thus we now value terse communication that conveys practical knowledge, and consider anything else a frivolous waste of time. As a result, people have become almost unable to talk to each other outside of narrow topics of immediate interest and specialization. Few of us can understand any longer the enthusiasm of Caliph Ali Ben Ali, who wrote A subtle conversation, that is the Garden of Eden. This is a pity, because it could be argued that the main function of conversation is not to get things accomplished, but to improve the quality of experience. Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, the influential phenomenological sociologists, have written that our sense of the universe in which we live is held together by conversation. When I say to an acquaintance whom I meet in the morning, nice day, I do not convey primarily meteorological information, which would be redundant anyway, since he has the same data as I do, but achieve a great variety of other unwashed goals. For instance, by addressing him I recognize his existence, and express my willingness to be friendly. Second, I reaffirm one. Mehali CS Exent Mehali 129 Of the basic rules for interaction in our culture, which holds that talking about the weather is a safe way to establish contact between people. Finally, by emphasizing that the weather is nice, I imply the shared value that niceness is a desirable attribute. So the offhand remark becomes a message that helps keep the content of my acquaintance's mind in its accustomed order. His answer, yeah, it's great, isn't it, will help to keep order in mind. Without such constant restatements of the obvious, Berger and Luckman claim, people would soon begin to have doubts about the reality of the world in which they live. 
the obvious phrases we exchange with each other, the trivial talk bling from radios and TV sets, reassure us that everything is all right, that the usual conditions of existence prevail. The pity is that so many conversations end right there. Yet when words are well chosen, well arranged, they generate gratifying experiences for a listener. It is not for utilitarian reasons alone that breadth of vocabulary and verbal fluency are among the most important qualifications for success as a business executive. Talking well enriches every interaction, and it is a skill that can be learned by everyone. One way to teach children the potential of words is by starting to expose them to wordplay quite early. Puns and double meanings may be the lowest form of humor for sophisticated adults, but they provide children with a good training ground in the control of language. All one has to do is pay attention during a conversation with the child, and as soon as the OP opportunity presents itself, that is, whenever an innocent word or expression can be interpreted in an alternative way, one switches frames, and pretends to understand the word in that different sense. The first time children realize that the expression, having grandma for dinner, could mean either as a guest or as a dish, it will be somewhat puzzling, as will a phrase like, a frog in the throat. In fact, breaking the ordered expectations about the meaning of words can be mildly traumatic. At first, but in no time at all children catch on and give as good as they are getting, learning to twist conversation into pretzels. By doing so they learn how to enjoy conveying words, as adults, they might help revive the lost art of conversation. The major creative use of language, already mentioned several times in earlier contexts, is poetry. Because verse enables the mind to preserve experiences in condensed and transformed form, it is ideal for giving shape to consciousness. Reading from a book of poems each night is to the mind as working out on a nautilus is to the body, a way for staying in shape. It doesn't have to be great poetry, at least not at first. And it is not necessary to read an entire poem. What's important is to 130 flow. Find at least a line or a verse that starts to sing. Sometimes even one word is enough to open a window on a new view of the world, to start a mind on an inner journey. And again, there is no reason to stop at being a passive consumer. Everyone can learn, with a little discipline and perseverance, to order personal experience in words. As Kenneth Koch, the New York poet and social reformer, has shown, even ghetto children and semi-literate elderly women in retirement homes are able to write beautifully moving poetry if they are given a minimum of training. There is no question that mastering this skill improves the quality of their lives. Not only do they enjoy the experience, but in the process they considerably increase their self-esteem as well. Writing prose provides similar benefits, and although it lacks the obvious order imposed by meter and rhyme, it is a more easily accessible skill. 2. Write great prose, however, is probably just as difficult as writing great poetry. In today's world we have come collect the habit of writing because so many other media of communication have taken its place. Telephones and tape recorders, computers and fax machines are more efficient in conveying news. If the only point to writing were to transmit information, then it would deserve to become obsolete. But the point of writing is to create information, not simply to pass it along. In the past, educated persons used journals and personal correspondence to put their experiences into words, which allowed them to reflect on what had happened during the day. The prodigiously detailed letters so many Victorians wrote are an example of how people created patterns of order out of the mainly random events impinging on their consciousness. The kind of material we write in diaries and letters does not exist before it is written down. It is the slow, organically growing process of thought involved in writing that lets the ideas emerge. In the first place, not so long ago, it was acceptable to be an amateur poet or essayist. Nowadays if one does not make some money, however pitifully little, 
out of writing, it's considered to be a waste of time. It is taken as downright shameful for a man past 20 to indulge in versification unless he receives a check to show for it. And unless one has great talent, it is indeed useless to write hoping to achieve great profit or fame. It is never a waste to write for intrinsic reasons. First of all, writing gives the mind a disciplined means of expression. It allows one to record events and experiences so that they can be easily recalled and relived in the future. It is a way to analyze and understand experiences, a self-communication that brings order to them. Mehali Sikh Zent Mehali 131 Many have hinted lately about the fact that poets and playwrights as a group show unusually severe symptoms of depression and other affective disorders. Perhaps one reason they become full-time writers is that their consciousness is beset by entropy to an unusual degree, writing becomes a therapy for shaping some order among the confusion of feelings. It is possible that the only way writers can experience flow is by creating worlds of words in which they can act with abandon, erasing from the mind the existence of a troubling reality. Like any other flow activity, however, writing that becomes addictive becomes dangerous, it forces the writer to commit himself to a limited range of experiences, and forecloses other options for dealing with events. But when writing is used to control experience, without letting it control the mind, it is a tool of infinite subtlety and rich rewards. Befriending CLIO As memory was the mother of culture, Cleo, the proclaimer, was her eldest daughter. In Greek mythology she was the patroness of history, responsible for keeping orderly accounts of past events. Although history acts the clear rules that make other mental activities like logic, poetry, or mathematics so enjoyable, it has its own unambiguous structure established by the irreversible sequence of events in time. Observing, reading, and preserving the memory of both the large and small events of life is one of the oldest and most satisfying ways to bring order to consciousness. In a sense, every individual is a historian of his or her own personal existence. Because of their emotional power, memories of childhood become crucial elements in determining the kind of adults we grow up to be, and how our minds will function. Psychoanalysis is to a large extent an attempt to bring order to people's garbled histories of their childhood. This task of making sense of the past again becomes important in old age. Eric Erickson has held that the last stage of the life cycle involves the task of achieving integrity, or bringing together what one has accomplished and what one has failed to accomplish in the course of one's life into a meaningful story that can be claimed as one's own. History, wrote Ars Khalil, is the essence of innumerable biographies. Remembering the past is not only instrumental in the creation and preservation of a personal identity, but it can also be a very enjoyable process. People keep diaries, save snapshots, make slides and home movies, and collect souvenirs and mementos to store in their houses too. 132 Flow Build what is in effect a museum of the life of the family, even though a chance visitor might be unaware of most of the historical references. He might not know that the painting on the living room wall is important because it was bought by the owners during their honeymoon in Mexico that the rug in the hall is valuable because it was the gift of a favorite grandmother, and that the scruffy sofa in the den is kept because it was where the children were fed when they were babies. Having a record of the past can make a great contribution to the quality of life. It frees us from the tyranny of the present, and makes it possible for consciousness to revisit former times. It makes it possible to select and preserve in memory events that are especially pleasant and meaningful, and so too, create, a past that will help us deal with our future. Of course such a past might not be literally true. But then the past can never be literally. True in memory, it must be continuously edited, and the question is only whether we take creative control of the editing or not. Most of us don't think of ourselves as having been amateur historians all along. But once we become aware that ordering events in time is a necessary part of being a conscious being, and moreover, that it is an enjoyable task, 
then we can do a much better job of it. There are several levels at which history as a flow activity can be practiced. The most personal involves simply keeping a journal. The next is to write a family chronicle, going as far into the past as possible. But there is no reason to stop there. Some people expand their interest to the ethnic groups to which they belong, and start collecting relevant books and memorabilia. With an extra effort, they can begin to record their own impressions of the past, thus becoming real amateur historians. Others develop an interest in the history of the community in which they live, whether it is the neighborhood or the state, by reading books, visiting museums, and joining historical associations. Or they may focus on a particular aspect of that past, for instance, a friend who lives in the wilder region of Western Canada has been fascinated by early industrial architecture in that part of the world and has gradually learned enough about it to enjoy trips to out-of-the-way sawmills, foundries, and decaying railway depots, where his knowledge enables him to evaluate and appreciate the fine points of what anyone else would dismiss as piles of weedy junk. All too often we are inclined to view history as a dreary list of dates to memorize, a chronicle established by ancient scholars for their own amusement. It is a field we might tolerate, but not love, it is a subject we learn about so as to be considered educated, but it will be learned. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 133. Unwillingly. If this is the case, can do little to improve the quality of life. Knowledge that is seen to be controlled from the outside is acquired with reluctance, and it brings no joy. But as soon as a person decides which aspects of the past are compelling, and decides to pursue them, Focusing on the sources and the details that are personally meaningful, and recording findings in a person's style, then learning history can become a full-fledged flow experience. The Delights of Science After reading the preceding section, you may find it barely plausible that anyone could become an amateur historian. But if we take the argument to another field, can we really conceive of a layperson's becoming an amateur scientist? After all, we have been told many times that in this century science has become a highly institutionalized activity, with the main action confined to the big leagues. It takes extravagantly equipped laboratories, huge budgets, and large teams of investigators to survive on the frontiers of biology, chemistry, or physics. It is true that the goal of science is to win Nobel Prizes, or to attract the recognition of professional colleagues in the highly competitive arena of a given discipline, then the extremely specialized and expensive ways of doing science may be the only alternatives. In fact, this highly capital-intensive scenario, based on the model of the assembly line, happens to be an inaccurate description of what leads to success in professional science. It is not true, despite what the advocates of technocracy would like us to believe that breakthroughs in science arise exclusively from teams in which each researcher is trained in a very narrow field and where the most sophisticated state-of-the-art equipment is available to test out new ideas. Neither is it true that great discoveries are made only by centers with highest levels of funding. These conditions may help in testing novel theories, but they are largely irrelevant to whether creative ideas will flourish. New discoveries still come to people as they did to Democritus, sitting lost in thought in the market square of his city. They come to people who so enjoy playing with ideas that eventually they stray beyond the limits of what is known, and find themselves exploring an uncharted territory. Even the pursuit of normal, as opposed to revolutionary, or creative, science would be next to possible if it did not provide enjoyment to the scientist. In his book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Cohen suggests several reasons why science is fascinating. First, by focusing attention upon a small range of related 134 flow esoteric problems, the paradigm, or theoretical approach, forces scientists to investigate some part of nature in a detail and depth that would otherwise be unimaginable. 
This concentration is made possible by rules that limit both the nature of acceptable solutions and the steps by which they are obtained. And, Cohen claims, a scientist engaged in normal science is not motivated by the hope of transforming knowledge, or finding truth, or improving the conditions of life. Instead, what then challenges him is the conviction that, if only he is skillful enough, he will succeed in solving a puzzle that no one before has solved or solved so well. He also states, the fascination of the normal research paradigm, is that, though its outcome can be anticipated, the way to achieve that outcome remains very much in doubt. The man who succeeds proves himself an expert puzzle solver, and the challenge of the puzzle is an important part of what usually drives him on. It is no wonder that scientists often feel like P.A. Dirac, the physicist who described the development of quantum mechanics in the 1920s by saying, it was a game, a very interesting game one play. Cohen's description of the appeal of science clearly resembles reports describing why riddling, or rock climbing, or sailing, or chess, or any other flow activity is rewarding. If normal scientists are motivated in their work by the challenging intellectual puzzles they confront in their work, revolutionary scientists, the ones who break away from existing theoretical paradigms to forge new ones, are even more driven by enjoyment. A lovely example concerns Subrahmanyan Chandrasekhar, the astrophysicist whose life has already acquired mythical dimensions. When he left India as a young man in 1933, on a slow boat from Calcutta to England, he wrote out a model of stellar evolution that with time became the basis of the theory of black holes. But his ideas were so strange that for a long time they were not accepted by the scientific community. He eventually was hired by the University of Chicago, where he continued his studies in relative obscurity. There is one anecdote told about him that best typifies his commitment to his work. In the 1950s Chandrasekhar was staying in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, where the main astronomical observatory of the university is located, about 80 miles away from the main campus. That winter he was scheduled to teach one advanced seminar in astrophysics. Only two students signed up for it, and Chandrasekhar was expected to cancel the seminar, rather than go through the inconvenience of commuting. But he did not, and instead drove back to Chicago twice a week, along backcountry roads, to teach the class. A few years later first one, then the other of those two former students. Mehali C.S. Ikzent Mehali 135 won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Whenever this story used to be told, the narrator concluded with sympathetic regrets that it was shame the professor himself never won the prize. That regret is no longer necessary, because in 1983 Chandrasekhar himself was awarded the Nobel for Physics. It is often under such unassuming circumstances, with people dedicated to playing with ideas, that breakthroughs in the way we think occur. One of the most glamorous discoveries of the last few years involves the theory of superconductivity. Two of the protagonists, K. Alex Muller and J. George Bednors, worked out the principles and the first experiments in the IBM laboratory in Zurich, Switzerland, not exactly a scientific backwater, but not one of its hot spots, either. For several years the researchers did not let anyone else in on their work, not because they were afraid it would be stolen, but because they were afraid that their colleagues would laugh at their seemingly crazy ideas. They received the Nobel Prizes for Physics. In 1987, Susumoto Negawa, who that same year received the Nobel Prize for Biology, was described by his wife as a going-his-own-way kind of a person, who likes sumo wrestling because it takes individual effort and not team performance to win in that sport, just as in his own work. Clearly the necessity of sophisticated laboratories and enormous research teams has been somewhat exaggerated. Breakthroughs in science still depend primarily on the resources of a single mind. But we should not be concerned primarily with what happens in the professional world of scientists. Big science can take care of itself, or at least it should, 
given all the support it has been given since the experiments with splitting the atomic nucleus turned out to be such a hit. What concerns us here is amateur science. The delight that ordinary people can take in observing and recording laws of natural phenomena. It is important to realize that for centuries great scientists did their work as a hobby, because they were fascinated with the methods they had invented, rather than because they had jobs to do and for government grants to spend. Nikolaus Copernicus perfected his epochal description of planetary motions while he was a canon at the Cathedral of Frauenberg, in Poland. Astronomical work certainly didn't help his career in the church, and for much of his life the main rewards he had were aesthetic, derived from the simple beauty of his system compared to the more cumbersome Ptolemaic model. Galileo had been trained in medicine, and what drove him into increasingly dangerous experimentation was the delight he took in figuring out such things as the location of the center of gravity of various solid objects. Isaac Newton formulated his 136 flow. Major discoveries soon after he received his BA at Cambridge, in 1665, when the university was closed because of the plague. Newton had to spend two years in the safety and boredom of a country retreat, and he filled the time playing with his ideas about a universal theory of gravitation. Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, held to be the founder of modern chemistry, was a public servant working for the firm General, the equivalent of the IRS in pre-revolutionary France. He was also involved in agricultural reform and social planning, but his elegant and classic experiments are what he enjoyed doing most. Luigi Galvani, who did the basic research on how muscles and nerves conduct electricity, which in turn led to the invention of the electric battery, was a practicing physician until the end of his life. Gregor Mendel was another clergyman, and his experiments that set the foundations of genetics were the results of a gardening hobby. When Albert A. Mitchelson, the first person in the United States to win a Nobel Prize in science, was asked at the end of his life why he had devoted so much of his time to measuring the velocity of light, he is said to have replied, it was so much fun. And, lest we forget, Einstein wrote his most influential papers while working as a clerk in the Swiss patent office. These and the many other great scientists one could easily mention were not handicapped in their thinking because they were not professionals in their field, recognized figures with sources of legitimate support. They simply did what they enjoyed doing. Is the situation really that different these days? Is it really true that a person without a PhD, who is not working at one of the major research centers, no longer has any chance of contributing to the advancement of science? Or is this just one of those largely unconscious efforts at mystification to which all successful institutions inevitably succumb? It is difficult to answer these questions, partly because what constitutes science is of course defined by those very institutions that are in line to benefit from their monopoly. There is no doubt that a layman cannot contribute, as a hobby, to the kind of research that depends on multi-billion dollar super colliders, or on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. But then, such fields do not represent the only science there is. The mental framework that makes science enjoyable is accessible to everyone. It involves curiosity, careful observation, a disciplined way of recording events, and finding ways to tease out the underlying regularities in what one learns. It also requires the humility to be willing to learn from the results of past investigators, coupled with enough skepticism and openness of mind to reject beliefs that are not supported by facts. Defined in this broad sense, there are more practicing amateur. Mehali CSE Xent Mehali 137 Scientists than one would think. Some focus their interest on health, and try to find out everything they can about a disease that threatens them or their families. Following in Mendel's footsteps, some learn whatever they can about breeding domestic animals, or creating new hybrid flowers. Others diligently replicate the observations of early astronomers with their backyard telescopes. There are closet geologists who roam the wilderness in search of minerals, cactus collectors who scour the desert mesas for new specimens, 
and probably hundreds of thousands of individuals who have pushed their mechanical skills to the point that they are verging on true scientific understanding. What keeps many of these people from developing their skills further is the belief that they will never be able to become genuine, professional, scientists, and therefore that their hobby should not be taken seriously. There is no better reason for doing science than the sense of order it brings to the mind of the seeker. If flow, rather than success and recognition, is a measure by which to judge its value, science can contribute immensely to the quality of life. Loving Wisdom Philosophy, used to mean, love of wisdom, and people devoted their lives to it for that reason. Nowadays professional philosophers would be embarrassed to acknowledge so naive a conception of their craft. Today a philosopher may be a specialist in deconstructionism or logical positivism, an expert in early Kant or late Hegel, an epistemologist or an existentialist, but don't bother him with wisdom. It is a common fate of many human institutions to begin as a response to some universal problem until, after many generations, the problems peculiar to the institutions themselves would take precedence over the original goal. For example, modern nations create armed forces as a defense against enemies. Soon, however, an army develops its own needs, its own politics, to the point that the most successful soldier is not necessarily the one who defends the country best, but the one who obtains the most money for the army. Amateur philosophers, unlike their professional counterparts at Univer. Cities, need not worry about historical struggles for prominence among competing schools, the politics of journals, and the personal jealousies of scholars. They can keep their minds on the basic questions. What these are is the first task for the actual philosopher to decide. Is he interested in what the best thinkers of the past have believed about what it means to be? Or is he more interested in what constitutes the good or the beautiful? 138 Flow As in all other branches of learning, the first step after deciding what area one wants to pursue is to learn what others have thought about the matter. By reading, talking, and listening selectively one can form an idea of what the state of the art in the field is. Again. The importance of personally taking control of the direction of learning from the very first steps cannot be stressed enough. If a person feels coerced to read a certain book, to follow a given course because that is supposed to be the way to do it, learning will go against the grain. But if the decision is to take that same route because of an inner feeling of rightness, the learning will be relatively effortless and enjoyable. When his predilections in philosophy become clear, even the amateur may feel compelled to specialize. Someone interested in the basic characteristics of reality may drift toward ontology and read Wolf, Kant, Husserl, and Heidegger. Another person more puzzled by questions of right and wrong would take up ethics and learn about the moral philosophy of Aristotle, Aquinas, Spinoza, and Nietzsche. An interest in what is beautiful may lead to reviewing the ideas of aesthetic philosophers like Bugartin, Kroos, Santana, and Collingwood. While specialization is necessary to develop the complexity of any pattern of thought, the goal sense relationship must always be kept clear. Specialization is for the sake of thinking better, and not an end in itself. Unfortunately many serious thinkers devote all their mental effort to becoming well-known scholars, but in the meantime they forget their initial purpose in scholarship. In philosophy as in other disciplines there comes a point where a person is ready to pass from the status of passive consumer to that of active producer. To write down one's insights expecting that someday they will be read with or by posterity would be in most cases an act of hubris, that overweening presumption, that has caused so much mischief in human affairs. But if one records ideas in response to an inner challenge to express clearly the major questions by which one feels confronted, and tries to sketch out answers that will help make sense of one's experiences, then the amateur philosopher will have learned to derive enjoyment from one of the most difficult and rewarding tasks of life. Amateurs and Professionals Some individuals prefer to specialize and devote all their energy to one activity, 
aiming to reach almost professional levels of performance in it. They tend to look down on anyone who is not as skillful and devoted to their specialty as they themselves are. Others prefer to dabble in a Mehali CSX Zent Mehali 139 Variety of activities, taking as much enjoyment as possible from each without necessarily becoming an expert in any one. There are two words whose meanings reflect our somewhat warped attitudes toward levels of commitment to physical or mental activities. These are the terms amateur and dilettante. Nowadays these labels are slightly derogatory. An amateur or a dilettante is someone not quite up to par, a person not to be taken very seriously, one whose performance falls short of professional standards. But originally, amateur, from the Latin verb amar, to love, referred to a person who loved what he was doing. Similarly, a dilettante, from the Latin delecta, to find delight in, was someone who enjoyed a given activity. The earliest meanings of these words therefore drew attention to experiences rather than accomplishments. They described the subjective rewards individuals gained from doing things, instead of focusing on how well they were achieving. Nothing illustrates as clearly our changing attitudes toward the value of experience as the fate of these two words. There was a time when it was admirable to be an amateur poet or a dilettante scientist, because it meant that the quality of life could be improved by engaging in such activities. But increasingly the emphasis has been to value behavior over subjective states, what is admired is success, achievement, the quality of performance rather than the quality of experience. Consequently it has become embarrassing to be called a dilettante, even though to be a dilettante is to achieve what counts most, the enjoyment one's actions provide. It is true that the sort of dilettante learning encouraged hip can be undermined even more readily than professional scholarship, if the learners lose sight of the goal that motivates them. Lay persons with an axe to grind sometimes turn to pseudoscience to advance their interests, and often their efforts are almost indistinguishable from those of intrinsically motivated amateurs. An interest in the history of ethnic origins, for instance, can become easily perverted into a search for proofs of one's own superiority over members of other groups. The Nazi movement in Germany turned to anthropology, history, anatomy, language, biology, and philosophy and concocted from them its theory of Aryan racial supremacy. Professional scholars were also caught up in this dubious enterprise, but it was inspired by amateurs, and the rules by which it was played belonged to politics, not science. Soviet biology was set back a generation when the authorities decided to apply the rules of communist ideology to growing corn, instead of following experimental evidence. Lysenko's ideas about how 140 flow grains planted in a cold climate would grow more hardy, and produce even hardier progeny, sounded good to the layperson, especially within the context of Leninist dogma. Unfortunately the ways of politics and the ways of corn are not always the same, and Lysenko's efforts culminated in decades of hunger. The bad connotations that the terms amateur and dilettante have earned for themselves over the years are due largely to the blurring of the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic goals. An amateur who pretends to know as much as a professional is probably ruin, and up to some mischief. The point of becoming an amateur scientist is not to compete with professionals on their own turf, but to use symbolic discipline to extend mental skills, and to create order in consciousness. On that level, amateur scholarship can hold its own, and can be even more effective than its professional counterpart. But the moment that amateurs lose sight of this goal, and use knowledge mainly to bolster their egos or to achieve a material advantage. Then they become caricatures of the scholar. Without training in the discipline of skepticism and reciprocal criticism that underlies the scientific method, lay persons who venture into the fields of knowledge with prejudiced goals can become more ruthless, more egregiously unconcerned with truth, than even the most corrupt scholar. The Challenge of Lifelong Learning the aim of this chapter has been to review the ways in which mental activity can produce enjoyment. We have seen that the mind offers at least as many and as intense opportunities for action as does the body. 
just as the use of the limbs and of the senses is available to everyone without regard to sex, race, education, or social class, so too the uses of memory, of language, of logic, of the rules of causation are also accessible to anyone who desires to take control of the mind. Many people give up on learning after they leave school because 13 or 20 years of extrinsically motivated education is still a source of unpleasant memories. Their attention has been manipulated long enough from the outside by textbooks and teachers, and they have counted graduation as the first day of freedom. But a person who forgoes the use of his symbolic skills is never really free. His thinking will be directed by the opinions of his neighbors, by the editorials in the papers, and by the appeals of television. He will be at the mercy of experts. Ideally, the end of extrinsically applied education should be the start of an education that is motivated intrinsic. Mehali C.S. Ikzent Mehali 141. Koli. At that point the goal of studying is no longer to make the grade, earn a diploma, and find a good job. Rather, it is to understand what is happening around one, to develop a personally meaningful sense of what one's experience is all about. From that will come the profound joy of the Thakka, like that experienced by the disciples of Socrates that Plato describes in Philebus, the young man who has drunk for the first time from that spring is as happy as if he had found a treasure of wisdom, he is positively enraptured. He will pick up any discourse, draw all its ideas together to make them into one, then take them apart and pull them to pieces. He will puzzle first himself, then also others, Badger whoever comes near him, young and old, sparing not even his parents, nor anyone who is willing to listen. The quotation is about 24th centuries old, but a contemporary observer could not describe more vividly what happens when a person first discovers the flow of the mind. 142 Flow Step Work as flow Like other animals, we must spend a large part of our existence making a living, calories needed to fuel the body don't appear magically on the table, and houses and cars don't assemble themselves spontaneously. There are no strict formulas, however, for how much time people actually have to work. It seems, for instance, that the early hunter-gatherers, like their present-day descendants living in the inhospitable deserts of Africa and Australia, spent only three to five hours each day on what we would call working, providing for food, shelter, clothing, and tools. They spent the rest of the day in conversation, resting, or dancing. At the opposite extreme were the industrial workers of the 19th century, who were often forced to spend 12 hour days, six days a week, toiling in grim factories or dangerous mines. Not only the quantity of work, but its quality has been highly variable. There is an old Italian saying, Il lavoro nobilita i omo, e lo rend simili alle. Bisi, or, work gives man nobility, and turns him into an animal. This ironic trope may be a comment on the nature of all work, but it can also be interpreted to mean that work requiring great skills and that is done freely refines the complexity of the self, and, on the other hand, that there are few things as entropic as unskilled work done under compulsion. The brain surgeon operating in a shining hospital and the slave laborer who staggers under a heavy load as he wades through the mud are both working. But the surgeon has a chance to 143. Learn new things every day, and every day he learns that he is in control and that he can perform difficult tasks. The laborer is forced to repeat the same exhausting motions, and what he learns is mostly about his own helplessness. Because work is so universal, yet so varied, it makes tremendous difference to one's overall contentment whether what one does for living is enjoyable or not. Thomas Carlyle was not far wrong when he wrote, Blessed is he who has found his work, let him ask no other blessedness. Sigmund Freud amplified somewhat on this simple advice. When asked for his recipe for happiness, he gave a very short but sensible answer, work and love. It is true that if one finds flow in work, and in relations with other people, one is well on the way toward improving the quality of life as a whole. 
In this chapter we shall explore how jobs can provide flow, and in the following one we shall take up Freud's other main theme, enjoying the company of others. Autotelic Workers As punishment for his ambition, Adam was sentenced by the Lord to work the earth with the sweat of his bro. The passage of Genesis 3.17 that relates this event reflects the way most cultures, and especially those that have reached the complexity of civilization, conceive of work as a curse to be avoided at all costs. It is true that, because of the inefficient way the universe operates, it requires a lot of energy to realize our basic needs and aspirations. As long as we didn't care how much we ate, whether or not we lived in solid and well-decorated homes, or whether we could afford the latest fruits of technology, the necessity of working would rest lightly on our shoulders, as it does for the nomads of the Kalhari Desert. But the more psychic energy we invest in material goals, and the more improbable the goals grow to be, the more difficult it becomes to make them come true. Then we need increasingly high inputs of labor, mental and physical, as well as inputs of natural resources, to satisfy escalating expectations. For much of history, the great majority of people who lived at the periphery of civilized societies had to give up any hope of enjoying life in order to make the dreams of the few who had found a way of exploiting them come true. The achievements that set civilized nations apart from the more primitive, such as the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, and the temples, palaces, and dams of antiquity, were usually built with the energy of slaves forced to realize their rulers' ambitions. Not surprisingly, work acquired a rather poor reputation. 144 Flow With all due respect to the Bible, however, it does not seem to be true that work necessarily needs to be unpleasant. It may always have to be hard, or at least harder than doing nothing at all. But there is ample evidence that work can be enjoyable, and that indeed, it is often the most enjoyable part of life. Occasionally cultures evolve in such a way as to make everyday product I've chores as close to flow activities as possible. There are groups in which both work and family life are challenging yet harmoniously integrated. In the high mountain valleys of Europe, Alpine villages spared by the industrial revolution, communities of this type still exist. Curious to see how work is experienced in a traditional setting representative of farming lifestyles that were prevalent everywhere up to a few generations ago, a team of Italian psychologists led by Professor Fausto Massimini and Dr. Antonella Del Fave recently interviewed some of their inhabitants and have generously shared their exhaustive transcripts. The most striking feature of such places is that those who live there can seldom distinguish work from free time. It could be said that they work 16 hours a day each day, but then it could also be argued that they never work. One of the inhabitants, Serafina Wynan, a 76-year-old woman from the tiny hamlet of Pont Trentas, in the Val di Aosta region of the Italian Alps, still gets up at 5 in the morning to milk her cows. Afterward she cooks a huge breakfast, cleans the house, and, depending on the weather and time of year, either takes the herd to the meadows just below the glaciers, tends the orchard, or guards some wool. In summer she spends weeks on the high pastures cutting hay, and then carries huge bales of it on her head the several miles down to the barn. She could reach the barn in half the time if she took a direct route, but she prefers following invisible winding trails to save the slopes from erosion. In the evening she may read, or tell stories to her great-grandchildren, or play the accordion for one of the parties of friends and relatives that assemble at her house a few times a week. Serafina knows every tree, every boulder, every feature of the mountains as if they were old friends. Family legends going back many centuries are linked to the landscape, on this old stone bridge, when the plague of 1473 had exhausted itself, one night the last surviving woman of Serafina's village with a torch in her hand, met the last surviving man of the village further down the valley. They helped each other, got married, and became the ancestors of her family. 
It was in that field of raspberries that her grandmother was lost when she was a little girl. On this rock, standing with the pitchfork in his hand, the devil. Mehali C.S. Zent Mehali 145 Threatened Uncle Andrew during the freak snowstorm of 24. When Serafina was asked what she enjoys doing most in life, she had no trouble answering, milking the cows, taking them to the pasture, pruning the orchard, guarding wool. In effect, what she enjoys most is what she has been doing for a living all along. In her own words, it gives me a great satisfaction. To be outdoors, to talk with people, to be with my animals, I talk to everybody, plants, birds, flowers, and animals. Everything in nature keeps you company, you see nature progress every day. You feel clean and happy, too bad that you get tired and have to go home. Even when you have to work a lot it is very beautiful. When she was asked what she would do if she had all the time and money in the world, Serafina laughed, and repeated the same list of activities, she would milk the cows, take them to pasture, tend the orchard, card wool. It is not that Serafina is ignorant of the alternatives offered by urban life, she watches television occasionally and reads news magazines. And many of her younger relatives live in large cities and have comfortable lifestyles, with cars, appliances, and exotic vacations. But their more fashionable and modern way of life does not attract Serafina, she is perfectly content and serene with the role she plays in the universe. Ten of the oldest residents of Pont Trentas, ranging from 66 to 82 years of age, were interviewed, all of them gave responses similar to Serafina's. None of them drew a sharp distinction between work and free time, all mentioned work as the major source of optimal experience, and none would want to work less if given a chance. Most of their children, who were also interviewed, expressed the same attitude toward life. However, among the grandchildren, aged between 20 and 33 years, more typical attitudes to work prevailed, given a chance they would have worked less, and spent more time. Instead in leisure, reading, sports, traveling, seeing the latest shows. Partly. This difference between the generations is a matter of age. Young people are usually less contented with their lot, more eager for change, and more intolerant of the constraints of routine. But in this case the divergence also reflects the erosion of a traditional way of life, in which work was meaningfully related to people's identities and to their ultimate goals. Some of the young people of Pont Trentas might in their old age come to feel about their work as Serafina does, probably the majority will not. Instead, they will keep widening the gap between jobs that are necessary but unpleasant, and leisure pursuits that are enjoyable but have little complexity. 146 Flow Life in this alpine village has never been easy. To survive from day to day each person had to master a very broad range of difficult challenges ranging from plain hard work, to skillful crafts, to the preservation and elaboration of a distinctive language, of songs, of artworks, of complex traditions. Yet somehow the culture has evolved in such a way that the people living in it find these tasks enjoyable. Instead of feeling oppressed by the necessity to work hard, they share the opinion of Juliana B. A 74-year-old lady, I am free, free in my work, because I do whatever I want. If I don't do something today I will do it tomorrow. I don't have a boss, I am the boss of my own life. I have kept my freedom and I have fought for my freedom. Certainly, not all pre-industrial cultures were this idyllic. In many hunting or farming societies life was harsh, brutish, and short. In fact, some of the Alpine communities not far from Pont Trentas were described by foreign travelers of the last century as riddled with hunger, disease, and ignorance. To perfect a lifestyle capable of balancing harmoniously human goals with the resources of the environment is as rare a feat as building one of the great cathedrals that all visitors with awe. We can't generalize from one successful example to all pre-industrial cultures. 
but by the same token even one exception is sufficient to disprove the notion that work must always be less enjoyable than freely chosen leisure. But what about the case of an urban laborer, whose work is not so clearly tied to his subsistence? Serafina's attitude, as it happens, is not unique to traditional farming villages. We can occasionally find it around us in the midst of the turmoils of the industrial age. A good example is the case of Joe Crummer, a man we interviewed in one of our early studies of the flow experience. Joe was in his early 60s, a welder in a South Chicago plant, where railroad cars are assembled. About 200 people worked. With Joe, three huge, dark, hangar-like structures where steel plates weighing several tons move around suspended from overhead tracks, and are welded amid showers of sparks to the wheelbases of freight cars. In summer it is an oven, in winter the icy winds of the prairie howl through. The clanging of metal is always so intense that one must shout into a person's ear to make oneself understood. Joe came to the United States when he was five years old, and he left school after fourth grade. He had been working at this aunt for over 30 years, but never wanted to become a foreman. He declined several promotions, claiming that he liked being a simple welder, and felt uncomfortable being anyone's boss. Although he stood on the lowest run. Mehali CS Xent Mehali 147 Of the hierarchy in the plant, everyone knew Joe, and everyone agreed that he was the most important person in the entire factory. The manager stated that if he had five more people like Joe, his plant would be the most efficient in the business. His fellow workers said that without Joe they might as well shut down the shop right now. The reason for his fame was simple, Joe had apparently mastered every phase of the plant's operation, and he was now able to take any one's place if the necessity arose. Moreover, he could fix any broken down piece of machinery, ranging from huge mechanical cranes to tiny electronic monitors. But what astounded people most was that Joe not only could perform these tasks, but actually enjoyed it when he was called upon to do them. Wen asked how he had learned to deal with complex engines and instruments without having had any formal training, Joe gave a very disarming answer. Since childhood he had been fascinated with machinery of every kind. He was especially drawn to anything that wasn't working properly, like when my mother's toaster went on the fritz, I asked myself, if I were that toaster and I didn't work, what would be wrong with me? Then he disassembled the toaster, found the defect, and fixed it. Ever since, he has used this method of empathic identification to learn about and restore increasingly complex mechanical systems. And the fascination of discovery has never left him, now close to retirement, Joe still enjoys work every day. Joe has never been a workaholic completely dependent on the challenges of the factory to feel good about himself. What he did at home was perhaps even more remarkable than his transformation of a mindless, routine job into a complex, flow-producing activity. Joe and his wife live in a modest bungalow on the outskirts of the city. Over the years they bought up the two vacant lots on either side of their house. On these lots Joe built an inn. Cricket rock garden, with terraces, paths, and several hundred flowers and shrubs. While he was installing underground sprinklers, Joe had an idea, what if he had them make rainbows? He looked for sprinkler heads that would produce a fine enough mist for this purse, but none satisfied him, so he designed one himself, and built it on his basement lathe. Now after work he could sit on the back porch and by touching one switch he could activate a dozen sprays that turned into as many small rainbows. But there was one problem with Joe's little garden of Eden. Since he worked most days, by the time he got home the sun was usually too far down the horizon to help paint the water with strong colors. So Joe went back to the drawing board, and came back with an admirable solution. He found floodlights that contained enough of the sun's speck. 148 flow. Trump formed rainbows, and installed them inconspicuously around the sprinklers. Now he was really ready. Even in the middle of the night, just by touching two switches, he could surround his house with fans of water, light, and color. 
Joe is a rare example of what it means to have an autotelic personality or the ability to create flow experiences even in the most barren environment, an almost inhumane workplace, a weed-infested urban neighborhood. In the entire railroad plant, Joe appeared to be the only man who had the vision to perceive challenging opportunities for action. The rest of the welders we interviewed regarded their jobs as burdens to be escaped as promptly as possible, and each evening as soon as work stopped they fanned out for the saloons that were strategically placed on every third corner of the grid of streets surrounding the factory, there to forget the dullness of the day with beer and camaraderie. Then home for more beer. In front of the TV, a brief skirmish with the wife, and the day, in all respects, similar to each previous one, was over. One might argue here that endorsing Joe's lifestyle over that of his fellow workers is reprehensibly elitist. After all, the guys in the saloon are having a good time, and who is to say that grubbing away in the backyard making rainbows is a better way to spend one's time? By the tenets of cultural relativism, the criticism would be justifiable, of course. But when one understands that enjoyment depends on increasing complexity, it is no longer possible to take such radical relativism seriously. The quality of experience of people who play with and transform the opportunities in their surroundings, as Joe did, is clearly more developed as well as more enjoyable than that of people who resign themselves to live within the constraints of the barren reality they feel they cannot alter. The view that work undertaken as a flow activity is the best way to fulfill. Human potentialities has been proposed often enough in the past, by various religious and philosophical systems. To people imbued with the Christian worldview of the Middle Ages it made sense to say that peeling potatoes was just as important as building a cathedral, provided they were both done for the great glory of God. For Karl Marx, men and women constructed their being through productive activities, there is no human nature 